This is Audible. Thunder from Fenris by Nick Kine. Performed by Toby Longworth. No son of Russ should die like this. Afghar Ironmane was crouched in the snow. He regarded the mangled corpse lying next to him forlornly. It was Barak Thunderborn, a fellow space wolf, his brother. Steam was rising from the carcass of Barak's beloved wolf mount, Garrick. The monstrous beast had been torn apart. The drifts had lessened in the last hour and rolled slowly across the tundra. Even so, they had begun to settle over Barak's corpse. The space wolf's blood, still warm from his recent slaying, created dark red blossoms in the veiling snow. It did little to hide the lacerations in his battle plate, nor did it smother his grievous wounds. Cooling intestines were heaped just below Barak's groin and trailed a half metre from the murder site. Slain by one of his own. Afka bit back his anger, but his gauntleted fist was clenched. Snow dappled his armour, turning blue-grey into dirty white. It piled on his poltrons, only to loosen and cascade off as he got up. Clods of snow clung to his beard, too. The black and iron-grey streaks powdered white. We don't know that for sure, brother. Skeln Icefang was standing farther away. His voice was deep, like the rumble of slow-moving icebergs. He patted his giant wolf mount Fenrir as it bristled at the stench of blood. Like his battle brother, Skelm wore the blue-grey power armour of the Space Wolves. And also like his brother, it was adorned with fetishes and totems honouring their liege lord, Leman Russ, and the fierce warrior pride of the wolf guard of Fenris. A fanged necklace hung around Skelm's gorget, and a pelt of thick fur draped down his armoured back. Runic talismans dangled off leather thongs attached to his breastplate, which carried the gilt sigil of a winged lupine skull. Skelm's blonde beard was less wild than Afka's and wreathed by snow. He carried a scar across his forehead and above his left eye, a relic of an earlier battle. Both warriors had a feral cast to their features, the echo of their namesake, and went unhooded, preferring to feel the icy caress of the weather. It was Hagni! What else could tear Barak Thunderborn apart like this? Afka gestured to the butchered remains. With Barak's power armor split like paper, his flesh torn and organs ripped from his body, Skelm found an argument difficult to come by. Instead, he snarled, showing long canines. His massive wolf mount bared its own fangs in empathy. Afka and Skelm held from a rarefied, some say mythical brotherhood within the Space Wolves. They rode Thunder Wolves, the greatest of all the Fenrisian wolves, as a man would ride a horse. Such creatures were massive, more monster than wolf, easily twice as large as a Terran bear and many times more ferocious. Their thick fur was as strong as steel wire and their long fangs were sharp and broad like swords. Thanks to the ministrations of the Space Wolves' Iron Priests, cybernetic enhancements augmented the beast's already formidable strength and combat abilities. Few could master such beasts as those that stalk the mountains of the Maelstrom, and even then, they were not wholly tamed. The scions of pestilence are dead! Our mission is ended! Hagni must be found and captured! He is Wolfen! He must be killed! No, Afka! The wolf priests will judge him. It is not for us to decide. Barak Thunderborn lies dead and it is not for us to decide? Hackney is our brother no longer. He slew a Thunderwolf, Skelm. I won't condemn him, Afka. What if it was you we hunted? Afka thumped his breastplate. Nearby, his wolf mount, Skull, growled and pawed the ground. Then I would welcome death as release from dishonor. Fenrir snarled, hackles rising on its muscled neck. A sharp word from Skelm quelled his mount's ire to a low growl. Any retort would have to wait, 
as the sound of an approaching vehicle interrupted them. Both space wolves turned and saw a chimera armoured troop carrier rumbling towards them across a snow choked road. Several kilometres behind it, south of the Space Wolves position, loomed a dark bastion. It was the Imperial command post of the Cadian 154th, the Fusiliers, and the slab sided Chimera tank that ground to a halt before the Wolves belonged to the regiment's commanding officer, Colonel Vorin Eckhart. The rear hatch squealed open on half frozen hinges, and a jowly man in the olive drab of the Cadians stepped out. Colonel Eckhart rubbed his gloved hands together, his breath ghosting the air as he tried to ward off the cold. Neither the storm coat he wore nor the thick moustache framing his upper lip could keep him from shivering. Your men are as grey as the weather, Colonel, remarked Skelm, appraising the bedraggled state of the Kasakin stormtroopers accompanying him. Eckhart looked skyward to a blanket of oppressive platinum and shrugged. Skelm's shadow eclipsed the officer. The space wolf, half again as tall and almost twice as wide. To his credit, Eckhart didn't look intimidated. The long campaign and this damnable cold, he uttered by way of explanation. A few weeks for you, my lord, has been the best part of a year on score bad for my men and I. The colonel stole a furtive glance at Fenrir, who laid the air with its long pink tongue and tried not to show his disquiet. He was dwarfed by the monstrous wolf. Eckhart would barely be a morsel to a beast like that. Even faced with it now, the colonel couldn't quite believe his eyes. He hadn't known such creatures even existed until he'd seen one. Thunderwolf. The name was mythic, almost otherworldly. Yet, here two of them stood, like monsters from some elder age, their masters no less impressive and godlike. Skelm bared his fangs grinning, though the gesture failed to reach his eyes. Fenrir, he warned in a low growl, before the beast backed down and stopped trying to taste the human meat. The scions of pestilence are all dead, Colonel. You'll be leaving this rock soon enough, bound for fresh fields and greater glories in the name of the All Father. Scorbad had been in the clutch of a deadly chaos plague when the Space Wolves had arrived. A cult of Nurgle, one of the ruinous powers and the entity that reveled in disease and despoliation, had arisen in one of Scorbad's monolithic cities. Infection spread quickly, the plague's victims sickening and dying before stirring into horrific unlife as mindless flesh eaters. The Cadians had done their best to staunch its spread, but had been unable to locate and destroy the plague's propagators, a war band of Death Guard Chaos renegades called the Scions of Pestilence. In truth, bloated monstrosities swelled by Father Nurgle's corruption. In three short weeks, the Wolf Guard had trawled the cities of Scorbad, found the renegades and dispatched them one by one. Hordes of zombies still haunted the deepest ruins, but were waning and aimless without their chaos packmasters. The Space Wolves' role in the conflict was over until Hagni had turned. So far, only the Space Wolves knew of it. As for the Cadians, they were to consolidate their position and then hand over control to Scorbad's defence forces, who would mop up what was left of the zombie hordes. The less enviable task of putting back together the shattered world's infrastructure was the job of its governor and his bureaucratic staff. Eckhart made the sign of the Achilla at the utterance of the name the Sons of Rus used for the immortal Emperor of Mankind. Indeed. And I'll not be sorry to leave this place either. We caught your coded vox echo over our instruments, and I wanted to come out personally to express my gratitude for... The colonel stopped abruptly for a sharp intake of breath. Throne of Earth! Is that... Eckhart had noticed the visceral remains of Barak, just visible beneath the fawning snow. Aye, it is, Skelm uttered solemnly, not turning to follow the colonel's gaze. Eckhart was shaking his head. Somewhere behind him, a Kasakin threw up. How could... To witness one of the Emperor's Astartes, a fearsome space wolf at that, killed in such a way, was disturbing. Something that could do that, something that could kill one of the mythical wolves must be... A beast! Afka locked eyes with Skelm. One that must be hunted and slain in turn. 
Eckhart averted his gaze to focus on Skelm. I thought you said the Scions of Pestilence were dead. They are. Skelm turned away, not deigning to elaborate. I have heard tales. The colonel licked his lips nervously. Of space wolves becoming beasts. The curse of the Wolfen was the secret burden of the space wolves. A genetic flaw handed down by their progenitor that could manifest at any time. Rumors abound, as they always did, but this was one ugly truth to be kept by the chapter, and the chapter alone. Go back to your bastion and lock the gates, snarled Afka, losing patience. Mounting up, he reined Skull towards the open tundra. In the distance, the black silhouette of Hellspire, one of the largest of Scorbad cities, blighted the horizon. Hagni would be seeking refuge after his kill. We have lingered here long enough, brother. Skelm nodded. What if you... Eckhart took an involuntary step back. His stormtroopers leveled their las guns as they imagined monsters in the warriors before them. You'd be dead before you could pull the trigger. A Kazakin put up his hands as he felt the sharp caress of metal at his neck. A third space wolf emerged out of the snowstorm that had grown more belligerent as they'd been talking, having crept up on Colonel Eckhart's party. Skelm scowled, but was inwardly impressed at his brother's stealth. For God, the space wolf lowered his wolf claw and laughed. He hadn't ignited the blades. At such close proximity, the electrical charge alone would have sheared the Kasakin's head off. Thorgard had a closely cropped beard with a long mane of ruddy hair, plaited with rune stones and bound by bronze rings. His humor was booming and showed his perfect white fangs. Your men were sleeping, Colonel. Perhaps you should find some better bodyguards, he said, tramping past them with a feral glint in his eyes. Brother. Thorgard grinned at Skelm as he walked on. His face saddened, though, as he regarded Barak, but was quickly impassive. The old father will judge him now. It's out of our hands. Afka growled something under his breath, unimpressed at his brother's antics. Skelm ignored their bickering, his attention on Eckhard, who had yet to lower his guard. Our will is strong, Colonel. You need have no fear of us. Can you be certain of that? Eckhart craned his neck as Skelm mounted Fenrir. Skelm noticed Thorgard's beast pad over to him from where he'd left it hiding among the snow so he could play his trick. Its name was Magnin, and it bowed its head to allow Thorgard to straddle it. Facing the colonel, Skelm's eyes were dark hollows. Do as Avka said. Go back to your bastion. Lock the gates. He urged Fenrir with a firm command and went to join his brothers, leaving Eckhart no less uneasy. They had tarried long enough. Barak's slayer must be found and stopped one way or another. Skelm only hoped there was some of Hagni left to bring back. Colonel Eckhart shuddered as he watched the Thunderwolves lope away. It wasn't from the cold either. A terrible, <laughs> racking cough gripped him. It felt like burning acid in his lungs. When Eckhart took his hand away from his mouth, there were traces of blood on his glove. Sir, said the sergeant of the Kasakin, about to go to his colonel's aid before being waved away. It's nothing, Eckhart lied, before about facing. Enter the Chimera. We'll wait for the landers at the bastion and lock our gates. They're surrounded. Afka slid up his bolter to sight down its barrel. I count 16 left. Estimate, 30 dead. Enemies? Skelm inquired from below. At least 60, maybe more. Following Hagni's trail, the Wolfguard had entered Hellspire without incident. On the way, Thorgard had told them of his discovery of Warg, Hagni's Thunderwolf, ripped apart like Barak and half buried by a forlorn roadside. Skelm hoped shame had compelled Hagni to try and conceal the carcass, that some of the warrior yet remained within the flesh of the beast. Shreds of armor had littered the trail too, discarded by Hagni as he outgrew it, shed like old skin as he metamorphosed beneath. 
As it had eclipsed the space wolves, the long shadow of Hellspire had been a blanket over Skelm's thoughts. Entering the darkness of the city, he became alert and set his troubles aside. The sprawling cityscape was ghost-like and silent. Shadowed avenues held potential threats at every turn. Huge towers loomed forbiddingly, watching, waiting. Ruins filled the broken streets and plazas, stark evidence of the brutal fight that had unfolded here. It proved little impediment to the monstrous beasts rode by the wolf guard. None challenged them. Most of Hellspire's populace was either dead, in hiding, or had already fled elsewhere. It made hearing the crack of Lazfire and the frantic shouts of Cadians easy to discern. The battle din echoed loudly in the empty city. Tracking it to its source had been even easier. What might once have been a public auditorium stretched out below Avka. One of its columns, no longer supporting the vaulted ceiling, had half collapsed. Crashed into the wall and held fast, it offered a high vantage point. Skoll had crawled stealthily up the column and lay on its belly as Avka leaned over to survey the scene beneath him. There was only room for one Thunderwolf at the column's broken summit, so Skelm waited some 15 meters or so below with Thorgard and their mounts, hidden by the ruins. Afka saw a ring of battered-looking Cadian guardsmen pulling ever tighter, snapping off sporadic bursts with whatever was left in their weapons power packs. Converging on them, a shambling horde of flesh eaters, their bodies rank with decomposition. The whiff of decay made the Space Wolf's olfactory senses rankle. The wretched plague victims shuffled on broken limbs, old wounds ragged and dark in their dirty uniforms. Some clutched las guns like clubs in parody of their former lives and compelled by degrading muscle memory. Others merely reached with talon fingers, their sharpened nails piercing their gloves, dried blood masking their grotesque and hungering faces. To be killed by your former comrades in arms. Afgar shook his head, then realized what he was saying. He held his tongue as another Cadian was dragged screaming into the mob and slowly devoured. The rest were fighting hard. They wanted to live. Skelm, high and low! Turning to Thorgard, Skelm found his brother was already gone. On my way! Thorgard's voice came through the comm bead in Skelm's ear. Always a step ahead was Thorgard. Skelm mentally traced a route for Fenrir through the ruins that would bring them to the auditorium floor. We are ready, Afka. No! Skull got to its haunches and leapt off the column, a howling battle cry on the lips of man and monster. They fell amongst the zombie horde and laid about them with fury. Skull crushed three of the plague creatures as it landed, dashing out their putrid brains with sweeps of its claws. It seized another in iron-hard jaws, biting it in two and casting aside the remains like unwanted meat. The legs stayed inert, but the zombie's torso began to crawl along the ground, driven by keening hunger. Afgar paid it no heed. Unleashing his bolter, he gunned down a slavering zombie pack, their bodies exploding as the mass reactive shells blasted them apart. Gore spattered his armor and Skull's brawny half-cybernetic flanks. Man and beast reveled in it, this baptism of blood howling for more carnage. As the creatures moved on Afka, this new prey taking the pressure off the still-firing Cadians, Skelm roared into view. He drove Fenrir headlong into the diseased masses, the Thunderwolf using its bulk and power to batter through them. Rotting corpses were tossed aside, smashed like kindling against pounding surf, before Fenrir slowed and the real slaughter began. A zombie leapt at Skelm, having launched itself from a high pile of rubble, only for the Space Wolf to arrest its flight with a blazing retort of fire from his bolt pistol. The creature was held in mid-air, caught in the explosive web from Skelm's weapon. The muzzle flare lit its gruesome features in monochrome before it disintegrated against the bolt pistol's power. A half second and Skelm swung his pistol around to dispatch another zombie trying to rake Fenrir's exposed flanks. 
decaying talons met adamantium skin and shattered before Skelm killed it. The monstrous wolf had just torn the head of another plague creature and was spitting out the saliva-drenched skull when Thorgard appeared on the far side of the auditorium, wolf claws crackling. He sheared through a half dozen zombies as Magnin carried him low across the floor. Heads, limbs and torsos fell like macabre rain in his wake. The space wolves were three points of a triangle, herding the diminishing zombie horde together, what was left of the Cadians standing at the edge of the corral's bloody perimeter. Each time the Thunderwolves drove into the zombie horde, they tore out again, wreaking carnage, slaying any stragglers and tightening the noose before charging back in. It was savage and furious, but not an iota of rage was wasted. Every shot was a kill, every blade stroke left a dismembered corpse behind it. Sixty soon became thirty, then twenty, as the space wolves butchered with controlled ferocity. For the old father! Afka's snarling face was framed by the flare of his bolter's thunder. Thorgard echoed him, then leapt up onto his beast's back, balancing on its broad shoulders for a moment like an acrobat before catapulting into the zombies. Lightning arcs tore strips in the half-darkness, describing the deadly passage of Thorgard's wolf claws. Magnus peeled off, loping around the edge of the plague-ridden masses, biting off heads and shredding bodies with its claws. Skelm had drawn his rune-etched power axe and stormed in, straddling Fenrir's back. He howled savagely, hacking down to bifurcate a zombie skull before decapitating another with the upswing. Cutting the last of the creatures down, he reined Fenrir in. Even then, the Thunderwolf worried at the ruined corpses of the twice dead. It had lasted only minutes, yet the desolation of dismembered bodies swathed the auditorium floor. Avka was breathing hard, not from exertion, but from the feral rage still fueling him. He eyed the eight Cadian survivors and motioned to Skelm. What should we do about them? The humans were cowering, awestruck and fearful at the same time, faced with the monstrous Thunderwolves and their riders. Several were injured, already showing signs of infection. A space wolf's biology was engineered to withstand such contagions. Acadians was not. Skelm's body language was resigned as he dropped down from Fenrir and stalked over to the guardsmen. We can take no chances. To succumb to such a flesh plague was horrendous. Skelm could scarcely imagine the dishonor should his brothers be susceptible to it, should they ever turn. At least the Wolfen curse was pure. At least it embraced the unfettered feral rage that lurked at every space wolf's core. But this, it was ignoble, debased. Grace of Russ that they should be spared such a fate. Some of the Cadians pleaded for death. Some got to their knees. The Space Wolf leveled his bolt pistol. A few of the men closed their eyes, their lips moving silently. Receive the Emperor's peace. The bark of fire silenced any screams and eclipsed the guardsmen's lives forever. It had to be done, brother, Thorgard said to Skelm as he was tramping back again. Skelm mounted up. Aye. Afka turned his back on the carnage of the dead Cadians. It was a pity they could not save them, but many more would die if they did not find Hagni soon. The plague worsens. A burst from Afka's bolter tore apart the zombie torso, laboring to claw across the floor towards them. Eerie silence followed for a moment after. Eckhart's soldiers, I wonder how many more have fallen, Afka sneered, evidently unimpressed. It is a small matter. Infected or fully turned, we have to dispatch any we come across until Hagni is found. Though the Skyans are slain, the plague must not be allowed to spread. Skelm fixed Afka with an icy glare. Mercy guides our hand in this, not revenge. You'd do well to remember that, brother. Afka snarled and turned away. Lead on, Thorgard! 
Scalm regarded the dead Cadians again, the ones he had been forced to kill. How many did you butcher, Hagni? Thorgard had the Wolfen's trail again. The hunt was back on. Thorgard sat alone in the lee of a ruined outhouse. It was towards the heart of Hellspire and had been badly damaged in the fighting, little more than a broken corner of prefabricated rockcrete with the skeletons of other structures and the shells of destroyed chimeras half buried in the snow nearby. Acadian platoon had come this way, but had got no further. The drifts had worsened in the last few hours. An almost total whiteout smothered the horizon. Visibility was abysmally poor, even for the space wolves' acute senses. Thorgard's head was bowed, as if in contemplation, oblivious to the snow flurries dancing around his head and clinging to his beard like arctic limpets. He'd built a fire, using his body and the ruin to shield it from the ice winds rolling across the urban tundra and flens the meat from some shaggy-haired bovine, indigenous to Scorbad, and somehow missed in the evacuation. It was messy work. Blood painted the ground around him and gave off a coppery stink. A hundred meters away, his fellow marines were watching. Hagni may be a beast, but he hasn't lost his instincts. The wolfen won't take the bait. Why do you insist on trying to snare him, Skeln? The other space wolf crouched alongside him in a ruined warehouse. Skelm was staring intently at the perimeter Thorgard had made, at the traps and foils he had set, well hidden in the snow and rubble. They kept low and to the shadows, Fenrir and Skull lurking just behind their masters. Of Magnin there was no sign. Like its rider, the Thunderwolf was adept at stealth. An uncanny feat for a monstrous beast that was nearly two and a half meters from claw to shoulder. His fate is not ours to decide. I've told you this already, brother. I won't give up on Hagni. Not yet. Due to the escalating drifts, the trail had grown cold in more ways than one. Hagni's wolfen scent was no longer redolent on the breeze. His tracks had disappeared, as well as any other signs of his passing. You must be prepared to kill him, Skelm. If Thorgard or I fail, you must do it. Skelm grunted and went back to surveying Thorgard's concealed deterrence. Only if there's no other choice. Something niggled at the back of Skelm's mind. Hagni was leading them farther into disputed territory, where the punitive influence of the Imperial Guard had not yet reached. On the way, they'd seen entire platoons frozen solid, grimaces etched permanently on the troopers' faces under the ice. Convoys of vehicles, chimeras, and even battle tanks were left by the roadside, empty and abandoned. Was Hagni even fleeing from them? Or was it the Wolfen that even now laid the trap and not the Wolfguard? Skelm had no more time to ponder. Shadows smeared the snowy fog, grey against the drifts. They were heading for Thorgard. Avka bared his fangs and scowled. Even in the snowstorm, he was close enough to detect the stench of putrefaction. The wind rose abruptly, intensifying to a shrieking gale. Thorgard huddled over the fire, but made no move as the shadows approached. A spurt of crimson laced the ground as he sheared away another scrap of raw meat. The shadows jerked and quickened. They were just a few meters away now, drawn by the blood. A form emerged, its crooked fingers reaching, shuffling close to Thorgard on bent, misshapen limbs. It was not alone, not nearly alone. A hundred meters away, Afgar reached for his bolter. What if he cannot hear them? The wind had built to a scream. It buffeted Thorgard's plats, tossing them around like vipers. Still, he flensed, occasionally devouring a strip of the raw meat. He'll move. Skelm's tone was reassuring, but he reached for his bolt pistol anyway. Just a meter away, 
Still, Thorgard seemed oblivious. Could he not scent the creatures? He'll move. The confidence in Skelm's voice was waning rapidly. The zombie was almost within touching distance. Ass of Russ, he swore, powering to his feet and wrenching his bolt pistol free. Just as Thorgard leapt up, a backhand slash with his wolf claw, cutting first through the reaching zombie's wrist, then driving on into its upper torso and scything through its neck. Its head bounced onto the ground and Thorgard kicked it into the face of another assailant before launching forward, claws wide, to cleave the plague creature in two. Thorgard decapitated four more in as many seconds, grinning wildly at the shredded corpses at his feet, and it was over before it had begun. The zombie's lighter body mass had evidently failed to set off the snares meant for Hagni, but had not been so silent as to fool Thorgard. Skelm sighed with relief. He and Avka were about to relax when the grey shadows returned. As the zombies appeared in their droves, it became clear by their uniforms what had happened to the crews of the vehicle convoy. Skelm roared. Now we go! Together, they plunged into the drifts, weapons booming. Thorgard rushed forward and bisected a creature from groin to stern, using his momentum to push through it and leaving the two ragged body hugs flapping impotently, a meter of gore-slicked snow between them. To his left, a zombie stuttered, its advance halted by the staccato fire of Afka's bolter. A second burst spun it on its broken ankle and pitched the creature back. An exploding cranium painted Thorgard's power armor in thick dead blood and brain matter. The zombie collapsed to its knees like a puppet without its strings and slumped headless in the slushed snow. The muzzle flash had barely died from Skelm's bolt pistol as he drew his power axe and went hand to hand. Still a few meters from Thorgard, the other space wolf found it hard to maintain his brother's frenetic pace. Afka sensibly kept his distance, using his bolter's range to protect his battle brother's flanks. Fenrir and Skull barreled past him on either side as he took up a ready stance and switched to rapid fire. As the pair of snarling thunderwolves hit, Magnin rose out of a snow mound, shawled white and growling for blood. The creatures tore into the undead tank crews, ripping off limbs and raking bodies. Any normal enemy would have fled before such carnage, but the plague zombies had long since forgotten fear. They knew nothing now but the urge to feed, the maddening hunger for flesh that was never slaked. Skelm hacked through a zombie's spinal column, just as three more of the creatures rammed into him. He was rocked on his heels but kept his footing, splitting the skull of one with his elbow and shredding the other two with a close-range burst of his bolt pistol. Uh, now, this is sport! Thorgard bellowed, surrounded by plague creatures. He drove a wolf claw into the torso of one, tearing the blades upwards and shattering its clavicle. With the other hand, he swiped off a zombie's head before crushing it to the ground with a heavy boot. One leapt onto his back, scratching at his neck and gorget. Thorgard reached around to seize it and throw it off when another zombie fired a shot into his torso, an old memory triggering the lasgun in its grasp. Grimacing, the space wolf was about to slash it when he found his arm pinned by another creature. A fourth had mounted his right poltron and was gnawing at the ceramite. Not like this, Thorgard raged. Teeth of Russ! My end will be worthy of a saga! Heat singed his face as Afka's bolter shells tore into the zombies clambering over him. The one clinging to his poltron was torn off, claws still embedded in the ceramite, whilst the creature pinning Thorgard's arm was struck in the back. The ammo storm rolled up its spine to burst open its head like a rotten fruit. As Thorgard yanked the zombie off his back and then punched his fist through the las gunner, Magnin leapt to its master's defense, crushing another two. We cannot slay them all! Afka's voice was tinny and cracked with static as it came through on the comm bead in Skelm's ear. Agreed. Slow up and break through. Afka cut the link when Skelm had finally caught up to Thorgard. It seems your lure was too effective, brother. Some of the other Space Wolf's eagerness had diminished. I had hoped for larger prey. Skelm howled and Fenrir bounded to his side, after finishing a zombie with a savage twist of his jaws. We're done here. He climbed atop the monstrous Thunderwolf's back. They'd cleared a bloody gap in the horde, but had only seconds until the next wave of plague creatures were upon them. 
Thorgard nodded reluctantly. He was summoning Magnin when Afka's voice crashed in on the combead. There, I see the beast. Hagni is abroad and in my sight. Afka was pointing, even as he slung himself across Skull's shoulders and urged the Thunderwolf to charge. Skeln and Thorgard followed his outstretched finger to a dark silhouette crouched on the horizon. Though distant, the wolf guard made out hulking shoulders and a broad back, pursuit with fur. Skeln thought he caught a shimmer from a pauldron hanging loosely off the beast's shoulder. There could be no doubt. It was Hagni, now more beast than man. Howling a battle cry, Afka hammered past the other two space wolves, intent on his prey. Skull used its muscled bulk to heave zombies out of its way, crushing bodies beneath it as it drove inexorably forwards. By the time Skeln and Thorgard had spurred their mounts, Afka was well ahead of them. They too battered their way through the plague mob, cutting a bloody path to the open ground ahead. Soon, the horde was floundering behind them and an arctic waste beckoned where the chase was on for Hagni. Damn you, Afka! Skeln's eyes locked onto his brother, now even farther in front of them. Hagni's silhouette had not yet moved. The wolfen watched its brother's approach. At this rate, Afka would reach it well before Skelm and Thorgard. He seemed hell-bent on facing it alone. And despite the fact he rode Skull, Skelm recalled all too well the butchered remains of Barak and his Thunderwolf. Alone, Afka faced a very uncertain victory. A sudden cracking arrested Skelm's thoughts, and a chill ended his spine. Skelm, the ice! Thorgard was looking downward, already snowing. The snowy tundra they traversed was not solid ground at all. It was a lake, frozen stiff by the cold weather, but now breaking up with the heavy footfalls of the Thunderwolves. Skelm saw the ground webbing beneath Fenrir's massive paws. Hold! Skelm reined in the monstrous beast, stalling the pursuit. Opening up a channel, he shouted into the combi. Afka, slow down! The ice is cracking! I have him! The beast won't escape again! Afka! wasn't listening. He severed the link and rode on harder. I'm sorry, Skelm. Barak must be avenged. He peered down the end of his bolter, bringing Hagni into his sights. You are mine, Wolfen. When the beast slipped away and was gone. No! That was when the ground fell away and icy water rose up around him. Weighed down by armor and augmetics, Man and beast were dragged down into Stygian gloom. Darkness surrounded him, together with a sense of lightness that Afka had not felt for some time. The rage, the grief at Barak's death, the burning desire for vengeance, all of it seemed muted by the cold. And for a moment, just the briefest of moments, Afka almost gave in. Something strong and vice-like seized his wrist. He was traveling upwards again. He saw the vague suggestion of light. Air rushed his lungs and raucous noise clamored into being as Afka breached the freezing surface of the water. Hold on, snarled Skelm, beard dripping icy wet from where he'd plunged in to grab him. Oh God, I have him! The other wolf guard came into view. He'd removed his wolf claw gauntlets. They lay on the ice nearby and leaned over to grasp Avka's power generator. No! Avka roared, thrashing. Leave me! Follow Hagni! Avenge Barak! Skelm wasn't listening. Together, he and Thorgard hauled Avka up and onto the fragile ice bank. Skull had not been so fortunate. The Thunderwolf's sheer bulk, its cybernetic body fashioned by the Iron Priests, had sunk it like an anchor. With nothing to cling to, the great beast had drowned in the black depths of the lake. It was a poor end for such a noble creature. Afka's expression told Skelm that Skull's former master thought so too. For a short while they sat on the ice, not daring to move should it crack again and swallow them all this time. The zombie hordes were far enough away not to trouble them. Skelm glared at Afka, his gaze murderous. Thorgard tentatively retrieved his gauntlets. Afka merely lay on his back and stared into the sky. Cold and pitiless, it echoed the feeling in his hollow heart.
Afka had not spoken for over an hour after the incident on the lake. He felt the loss of Skull keenly, so strong was their bond. A separation of a limb would have been easier to take. When he did finally give voice, now running alongside Skelm, it was clear his mood had not improved. You should have let me sink and gone after the Wolfen yourself. You've lost your mount, and we are two brothers down already, Afka. I will not lose another in a vain and foolish sacrifice. Skelm's retort was biting. I would not have drowned. Skelm looked down at him. No, brother, but you would have given up. Afka's shadowed expression betrayed his shame. Thorgard had found Hagni's trail again soon after leaving the ice lake, now far behind them, and was leading the Wolfguard down into the catacombs of Hellspire, the urbanization of the city growing around them suddenly like a virus. Here, the city was at its darkest. These were its sinks, its bowels, the very bones of its construction. Streets and avenues became tunnels, Towers morphed into the sweating columns of foundation stones. The platinum sky was replaced by the rock-crete underbelly of the roads above. A sewer stink pervaded, sullying the icy crispness of the air. Stagnant heat lingered, emanating from the buried fusion generators that ran the benighted city's power grid. Thorgard sniffed the air, finding the wolf and scent. There was something else, too. Something he couldn't place. It's strange, he muttered, oblivious to his brother's arguing. What is? Since killing Barak, Hackney has had many days to get ahead of us. I expected to track him to a lair, not to see him out in the open, especially so blatantly. It's as if he wants to get caught. Afka bristled. He begs for death. Skelm's eyes became cold, hard bergs. No wolf would ever desire that. No wolf would ever die without a fight. Chastened, Afka realized he had spoken out of turn. Sorry, brother, I am not myself. But what other explanation is there? It doesn't feel like he's begging for death. There's no sport in this. I've seen whelping aspirants harder to track. Hackney allows us to catch up only to then flee. He's getting careless then, that's all. And hungry. There's only dead flesh here, no fresh meat to sate the beast. Skelm was silent and stern. He had noticed the sigils daubed on the walls and the rank, pervading stench growing stronger. They were deep into the heart of Hellspire now and reaching the end of a long, broad sewer conduit. A chamber loomed ahead, a sickly oval of light announcing it. There's something else here, very large, very strong. Its scent mingles with the wolfens. Thorgard brought Magnin to a halt and turned to face his brothers. Hackney wasn't trying to flee, or merely running wild. He was leading us. There may be some of Hackney left after all. But leading us to what? Thorgard ignited his wolf claws. Their electrical glow framed his face in an eerie light. Brothers. Misshapen forms were shuffling into the light. In the chamber beyond, Skell knew in his core they would find Hagni and whatever it was he had been leading them to. He had drawn his weapons. Afka too. Thunderwolves! he roared, glaring at the approaching zombies. For Fenris and Lehman Russ! Howling, the space wolves charged down the tunnel, making for the opening and whatever waited for them beyond it. Skelm's uppercut smashed a plague creature aside, tearing open its torso and spilling diseased innards. He hung down along Fenrir's flank like a trick rider from the old clan gatherings of his former life before he became a space wolf. Another was flung into the tunnel wall, its bones shattered by the force of Fenrir's swipe. Afka raked three more with controlled bursts from his bolter. The explosive rounds turned the creatures into little more than a visceral mist. Thorgard cut down the rest. By the end of it, his scything wolf claws were slick and red. A vanguard, nothing more. The actinic glare from his blades pooled deep shadows around his wild eyes. He was ready for more. Skelm snarled at the miasma of pestilence coming from the chamber entrance, howling, and the deep bellowing of something large and unnatural emanated from it. It was a wolf fighting a monster. 
Steal yourselves, brothers, Skelm growled, and, astride Fenrir, moved to face whatever lay beyond. The chamber was a confluence of sewer pipes. Rusted openings in the walls disgorged filth. It pooled in a deep basin in the middle of the room. Wallowing in the dark morass was a pustulant giant. Sloth-like and disgusting, burgeoning rolls of putrescent yellow flab ruptured the creature's armor. The fragments of ceramite that still clung to its grotesque bulk were adhered by rivulets of pus, bursting from the boils and sores infesting its blubbery flesh. Horrid and distended, the beast's mouth was a gaping maw. Several tongues lolled from one encrusted corner. They licked and probed at the sores lasciviously, tendril-like and sentient. Filled with ranks of needle-like teeth, its mouth was like that of a bloated shark. Skelm saw the potential in those fangs to inflict the wounds that had killed Barak Thunderborn. Perhaps Hagni had not slain his battle brother after all, and hope flared that he could still be saved. He wrinkled his nose at the noisome stench emanating from the thing's corpulent body. Fat flies buzzed around it in a swarm. Facing it, across a river of pestilence, was Hagni. He was not as Skelm remembered him. Hackney's armor hung off his body in scraps. His lupine form, now covered in thick fur, had simply outgrown it. Fangs were like daggers in his long mouth, stitched around a slightly protruding snout. Sinew throbbed like cords of steel across a brawny body, stretched and made more muscular by the changes wrought by the wolfen curse. Horrific as it was, it was as nothing compared to the other monster in the room. It was one of the scions of pestilence, now swelled by plague and decay, favoured by its dark lord and mutated into a hideous plague spawn, unrecognisable from the traitors the space wolves had hunted previously. Even now, before their eyes, it seemed to be growing, absorbing the filth from the tainted sewer pipes, it had not always been this size, and that explained how the creature had managed to kill Barak Thunderborn and slip away undetected, almost undetected. The space wolves had somehow missed it, but Hagni, turned to Wolfen and his preternatural senses enhanced, had not. He could not defeat it alone. There was enough of the space wolf remaining to realize this, or perhaps it was merely instinct that had compelled Hagni to seek out allies and draw them to this fight. Skelm hoped for the former. Skelm processed this in a half second before baring his fangs and howling, Slay it! A ripple of explosive fire stitched the plague spawn's bloated body and a burble of what might have been pain bubbled from its swollen lips. A stream of corruption belched from the creature's jaws by way of repost, but Fenrir was already moving. An acid hiss erupted behind Skelm, head down as his thunder wolf bounded away from the deadly spray. Afka stormed forwards at the same time, working his way through the mire to the left of the plague spawn. Zombies stirred in the wretched muck, animated by the plague spawn's presence. Afka shot them down as he moved, shredding them to pieces as he kept an eye on Hagni. The wolfen ignored him and launched itself upon the creature, raking its rancid flanks. Flesh tore away, wretched and thin with decomposition. Black. Sap-like blood started to mat Hagni's fur as he clawed at it. Like a geezer exploding from the earth, the wolfen was struck in the face by a plume of bile. The force of it pitched Hagni off the plague spawn's body and sent him careening into the chamber wall. Thorgard rode Magnin down the creature's right flank. Its tongues lashed out like serpents, jabbing at the thunderbolt. The fleshy muscle was laced with barbs and tiny mouths fang-filled and drooling pus. Despite its bulk, Magnin turned and weaved to evade the probing tongues. One nicked Thorgard's pauldron, leaving an acidic scar as his thunderwolf jinked to the side. He followed its course as it seized a zombie shambling behind them, ripping the creature off its feet and hauling it forwards with a predatory jerk. 
Swept up in an eye blink into the plague spawn's mouth, the zombie's rotten bones crunched as it was devoured. Head down, Thorgard urged Magnum on. Skelm ducked another putrid stream from the plague spawn's mouth. He had torn out his bolt pistol and the muzzle burned white hot with the flare of his weapon's fire. The mass reactive shells bit deep, sinking as if in rubber below the creature's flesh. Explosions rippled beneath the sickly skin, bulging like tumors. But the plague spawn's epidermis just stretched to compensate. Any damage that had been inflicted regenerated instantly. Frenzied bolter fire from Afka's position suggested Skelm's battle brother was similarly frustrated. He unsheathed his power axe and fed a ripple of energy across the rune-etched blade. It was time to get in close. For Hackney, getting in close was now the only way he knew how to fight. Dazed but unbowed, he shook away the wretched bile gumming his fur and drove at the creature again. As Wolfen, Hagney was even larger than his Wolfgard brethren. At over three meters tall, he was a monster. Yet, even Hagney was small compared to the Chaos Marine, so grotesquely swollen as it was by Nurgle's tape. Leaping onto the creature's back, Hagney slashed and gored, searching for vital organs amidst the blubbery mass. The Wolfen was elbow deep in putrid blood and viscera, but the folds of flab, like fleshy armor, were too thick for him to inflict any serious harm. Below, Thorgard raced along the plague spawn's flank, wolf claws spitting lightning. The stink of burning flesh was redolent in the air, but the long grooves he carved in the creature's side merely oozed and closed up again, a roll of fat melting down over them. Skelm was getting dizzy. The vile stench emanating off the creature made the air thick with its contagion. Fat flies buzzed around his face, trying to infest his mouth, ears and nostrils as he sought to get him close. As he hacked away at a tendril-like tongue, he heard a deep yell of agony from across the chamber. Though his view was occluded by the spawn's bulk, Skelm recognized the cry of Thorgard's Thunderwolf. Magnin was wounded, possibly even dead. Thorgard! He bellowed down the comm feed. Crackling static and a half-heard roar of anguish returned to him. Skelm was pinned by the lashing tongues. Oozing fronds assailed him like stingers. He couldn't get to Thorgard. He couldn't help his brother. Another channel opened up in his ear. This isn't working. We need to burn it. With what? We have no flavor, no incendiaries. We... Skelm had detected something. A distinctive tang in the mire of sewage. He fended off a probing tongue, the plague spawn burbling with laughter. A moment's respite allowed him to cast about the chamber. Pipes. Everywhere pipes. Skelm allowed himself a grim smile as he found what he was looking for. A shadow eclipsed him as the plague spawn leaned down, the shifting of its mass releasing noxious gases trapped within the flabby rolls of flesh. Skelm fought not to gag and hauled Fenrir back. The tongue tendrils recoiled and Skelm urged his mount away. Fenrir turned and leapt, narrowly avoiding the burst of corruption vomited from the spawn's distended mouth. It was still drooling acid as its burbled laughter came again. But now, Skelm was no longer penned in. He used this freedom of movement to ride Fenrir around the plague spawn's side, searching for Thorgard, following a pipe kept at the periphery of his vision. Magnin was dead. The noble beast lay on its side, a brackish liquid trickling from its lips and pooling around its snout. Three deep puncture wounds were visible in its flank. They were dark and infected from where the plague spawn's tongues had raked it. Whatever poison was harbored by the plague spawn, it was more deadly and virulent than that carried by the zombies. If it could kill a Thunderwolf, it could kill Skelm and his brothers too. A desperate roar seized Skelm's attention, and his gaze was drawn upwards to where Thorgard and Hagni had mounted the plague spawn's back and were tearing at it with their claws. Lost to grief and vengeance, Thorgard was no further use to Skelm right now. A loud crack, followed by a shallow crump and the tang of explosive, came from the opposite end of the chamber. Afka! Skelm hoped at least one of his battle brothers still had something left. Altars drive! Switching to grenades! came the fragmented response. 
Is it working? Fenrir had slowed so Skelm could reload his bolt pistol. Last clip. Thorgard and Hagni were keeping the creature occupied, eliciting bellows of pain as they tore into its blubbery hide. Several seconds elapsed before Avka answered. Another explosion rocked the chamber. He sounded annoyed. What do you think? Skelm turned Fenrir around, tracing the pipe he had seen earlier to the source of its rupture. He let rip a desultory burst, downing a pair of zombies shambling towards him, before fixing his attention back on the broken pipe. Hang on to whatever grenades you've got left. We're going to need a spark for our accelerant. What are you talking about, Skelm? Afka spoke between thrusts. He'd drawn his combat blade. Can't you smell it, brother? The tainted water, just below the reek of decay. Promethean. Skelm reached the ruptured pipe. It was one of Scorbad's main fuel lines, fed from its major pumping station. Volatile liquid exuded from it in a slow but steady trickle. They'd need more. Much more. Skelm jumped down off Fenrir's back. The Thunderwolf turned, guarding its master's blind side as Skelm sheathed his weapons. He'd have to tear a wider opening in the broken pipe. He couldn't risk a spark before the tainted water was saturated. Digging his gauntleted fingers around the ragged hole, he heaved and pulled. The metal screeched, but gave instantly. Corruption had ravaged it, degrading the tough housing of the pipe. Prometheum was gushing freely now. It lapped onto the floor and spilled eagerly into the morass where the plague spawn was languishing. Skelm turned, leaping onto Fenrir's back again. He unclipped a grenade from his belt. The Thunderwolf was barreling towards a sewer-slicked column at the edge of the room. Find cover! Reaching the column, Skelm swiveled his torso and pressed the detonator stud on the grenade. Its parabola took it across the chamber where, a second before it splashed down, it exploded, igniting the Prometheum that had spilled into the tainted pool. A burst of incendiary lit up the room, fire sweeping through the water in a purging wave. Through the inferno's glare, Skelm thought he saw two figures leap free, obscured by smoke and rising flame. The plague spawn bucked and thrashed, powerless to heave its monstrous girth away from the burning pool, its efforts only splashing fiery Prometheum over its waxy skin. It burned, and as it burned, seemed to shrink. Like a diseased candle against the attentions of a blowtorch, the Death Guard melted away, shrieking rage and denial. A curtain of fire was left flickering across the surface of the pool. The roaring Prometheum flames had died quickly. A dark green sludge, polluting the already tainted water, was all that remained of the plague spawn. Cleansing fire had destroyed it. Relieved to see Afka alive and well across the other side of the chamber, Skelm then looked for Thorgard. Another tunnel lay across from them, opposite where the space wolves had entered. Diminishing bootsteps echoed from the shadows there. Thorgard was alive, but he had gone after Hagni. Skelm met Afka's gaze and the two of them raced towards the tunnel mouth. Fenrir slowed, keeping pace with the other wolf guard, then charged into the gloom of the tunnel. He is a fool. Alone, he is no match for it. He is blinded by grief. Magnin is dead. Thorgar wants to finish the mission to honor his mount's sacrifice. Besides, I remember you were determined on facing the beast alone too. Afka sniffed his contempt. So, you now acknowledge it is a beast. Skelm's reply was prevented by a scream up ahead. It was Thorgard. Fenrir rode on faster, but it was too late. Thorgard's half-eviscerated body was lying in the center of the tunnel, wet and bloody. His torn throat hung open like a second mouth, fixed in a dark red screen. Afka snarled, walking over to take up one of his fallen brother's wolf claw gauntlets. He winced as he stooped down, gingerly touching his chest. Uh, brother, it's nothing. Before Skelm could say a word, Afka swiftly changed the subject back to the wolfen. It's of the killing mind now. Hackney is lost to us. He removed his old gauntlet and pulled the weapon onto his fist. Skelm was silent, but didn't linger with Fenrir. This was no time for remorse. The wolfen must be stopped. The trail was easy to follow. 
Fenrir tracked the wolfen by the scent of Thorgard's blood still on the beast. The tunnel took them back up into the snowdrifts and arctic tundra of Skorbad. Crimson droplets dotted the landscape at long, loping intervals. Skalm knew this road and realized where the wolfen was headed. It returns to its old hunting ground. Skelm urged Fenrir on and allowed the howling ice winds to smother his thoughts. In less than an hour, the bastion loomed on the horizon. Something is wrong. The Imperial command post was dark, as if it had lost all power. Smoke trailed from unseen fires behind the walls and there were no visible sentries. As the Space Wolves drew nearer, they saw the gate was wide open and streaked with bloodstains. A chimera had slewed to a stop a few meters away, the vehicle's exit ramps yawning. There was more blood here, too. Two hundred meters of open ground lay between the Space Wolves and the Bastion. Afka was incredulous. Not even the Wolfen could have got so far ahead and done all of this. Skelm eyed the silent battlements. His gaze narrowed. It didn't. Shambling into view from where they had laid crumpled and inert, figures appeared wearing the olive drab of the Cadian 154th and cradling las guns in crooked fingers. Old memories compelled them. The plague had come here, and now the bastion had an undead garrison. In his last act, before the feral aspect of the Wolfen had claimed his mind, Hagni had led them here. Afka grimaced, gripping his chest again. In the sewer chamber, there hadn't been enough time to reach cover. A spark of melancholy flickered suddenly within him. The end of the road was near. I wish Barak and Thorgard were with us. So do I. The solemnity in Skelm's voice turned to anger. We finished this. He stretched out his hand, beckoning to his brother. Afka seemed reluctant. He'd lost Skull through blind fury. Honor would not allow him to ride with Skelm. The Bastion's too far. You'd be gunned down before you even reach the walls. And I need your bolter and blade with me, brother. Skelm gestured again. After a moment, Afka relented. Duty outweighed honor. He took Skelm by the wrist and swung up onto Fenrir's broad back. Skelm spurred his mount on just as the zombie Cadians were leveling their guns. The last charge of the Thunderwolves, brother. Let it be a worthy end, then. I'll see you in the halls of Russ, Afka. For the first time in weeks, Afka smiled. Aye, that you may. Skelm kicked Fenrir's flanks, and the beast began to charge. If there had been anyone alive to see it, the deed would have been worthy of a saga. Skelm and Afka howled together as las bolts filled the air around them. Fenrir died just before they reached the wall. An auto cannon burst had opened up its torso in a red mist, and the great beast collapsed in the snow, leaving a crimson smear behind it. Their armor punctured and torn by las blasts, the wolf guard burst into the bastion and commenced slaying everything inside. A ragged firing line, a crippled mockery of order, opposed them as they barreled through the gates. The space wolves swept the zombies aside and then split up, intent on destruction. Skelm took the stairway to the battlements. Zombies fell like suicides, heaved from his path as he rose up the steps. He savaged with his fangs, tearing open throats and split torsos with his power axe to reach the summit. The battlements became a field of slaughter, a reaping of cleaved limbs and staved-in skulls. Russ's name bellowed loud above the carnage, piercing the blood-red night. Fires began below. Promethean storage sheds were set ablaze by Afka's last grenades. Explosions cracked, billowing black smoke. Bodies were heaped onto conflagrations like heretics onto a pyre. He went to his fists, snapping spines across his knee, wrenching bones from decaying sockets. Afka carved a red ruin with Thorgard's wolf claw, anointing it in old blood to honor its fallen keeper. 
Skelm's power axe was already dark with blood when he noticed the Wolfen amongst the horde, clawing and shredding with abandon, reuniting with his former brothers for one last fight. He'd lost sight of Hagni after that, the need for killing preventing any pursuit. The Space Wolves were gored and burned, but in less than 20 bloody minutes, the entire Cadian garrison was destroyed. Skelm had not seen Eckhart in the mob, but could have missed him easily. A haze had fallen upon the wolf, blood red and frenzied. There was no way to identify any individual amongst the heaped body parts. Heaving air into his lungs, Skelm was standing in the bastion's perimeter as it burned. After they'd vanquished the undead Cadians, he and Afka had spread the fires. The roaring flames cast a sombre light on the mound where Skelm had buried Fenrir. He'd wept as he'd done it, Afka looking on, honouring them with stoic silence. In the aftermath, there was no sign of Hagni. Skelm assumed the beast had loped away once the killing was done, but it was not ended. There was no monster to lead them to, no fight save the one that was left between former brothers. Hagni knew it as well as Skelm did. A reckoning was near. Time to move, brother. The Wolfen was still loose. Stopping it was all they had left. Brother? Skelm repeated when there was no answer. He turned. Afka was slumped against the hull of the abandoned Chimera. His arms hung limp by his sides and his cold eyes were glassy. Skelm noticed the severity of the wound in his battle brother's torso. It was deep, mortal. Afka had held on long enough to finish the fight and see his foes burn. He was with the old father now, feasting in the halls of Rus. Be at peace, brother, Skelm whispered, closing Afka's eyes. All dead now, except for him. A lone wolf with but one duty left. Skelm took off his left pauldron, stripped away the arm greave and vambrace of his power armor to leave his skin bare. With a tooth from his fang necklace, Skelm carved the runes of Barek, Thorgard, and Afka in his flesh. At the end, he added Hagni. He dumped his empty bolt pistol along with his gun belt. Hefting his power axe, he ignited the blade and trudged into the icy wastes. Somewhere in the drifts, Hagni was waiting. Wolfen! His challenge echoed across the tundra. A few moments later, a feral howl answered. The Art of Provocation by Josh Reynolds. Performed by John Banks, Jonathan Keeble, and Toby Longworth. <laughs> there was a certain sound the wolf claw made when it pierced armor and flesh. A fat, wet crackle as rune-edged metal talons entered the target and the matter-disruptive energies took swift effect. It was almost like laughter. <laughs> Lucas joined in, adding his own chuckle to the wolf claw's pop sizzle. The orc spasmed, grunting obscenities in its own rude tongue as it tried to throttle him. Greenskins never knew when they were beaten, or so the grey pelts said when they were in their cups. <laughs> Uh, I've never found that to be the case myself. Just conventional wisdom taken as hard fact. You can know when you're beaten. You just don't like to admit it. Lucas stared into the orc's glazing eyes. <laughs> but then, who 
fooled us. <laughs> what was left of the Xenos crashed in the grating of the central control chamber to join the remains of its fellows. Lucas had left a trail of broken green bodies stretching back to his entry point into the Vox Relay Station after being deposited on the outer hull by Stormfang gunship. The wailing of a structural alarm echoed through the chamber and he could hear emergency bulkheads grinding into place as the station's autonomous systems acted to seal the breach. The vibrations resonated with the rhythmic pulse of the stasis bomb grafted in place of one of his hearts. He didn't know which. He'd never had occasion to find out. The station sat high in the atmosphere, far above the industrial world of Pollux Tertius, an atmospheric photon tether tended by a crew of servitors and transmechanics, held it aloft at the center of an invisible web of communication signals. The orcs had a fascination for technology. Their mechs had intended to loot it for their own purposes, hijacking the planetary Voxnet, even as Pollux Tertius burned. And Lucas the Trickster, Lucas the Laughing One, the Bane Wolf, had come to teach those greenskins the error of their ways. There were two orcs left. They squinted at him in the flickering haze. The chameleonic doppelgangrel pelt he wore over his power armor bent the light in odd ways, making his form indistinct and hard to focus on. To the greenskins, there might appear to be three of him, or something even more confusing. Lucas chuckled again. Who's first? The orcs eyed him warily. They glanced at one another. Then one gave a roar and barreled towards him, its crude axe raised. Decisive. I like that. Lucas slid forwards and caught the heart of the axe, his powered talons piercing the orc's chest. The green skin slumped, and Lucas swept it aside. And then there was one. The last orc thudded towards him, snarling in fury. He couldn't fault the creature's courage. No lack of bravery, but a distinct absence of brains. He didn't rush to meet this one. No point when it was coming to him. He shot it in the head, vaporizing the skull with a liquid hiss. The orc's body kept coming, and Lucas stepped aside to let it stumble past, calling after. Mind how you go! It tripped over the remains of the others and tumbled to the deck. Lucas tutted, looking around. <laughs> I warned you. The wall panels were daubed with crude glyphs and bloodstains. The air stank of cooked orc and other worse things. But then the greenskins had held the station for weeks now. It was bound to reek a little. Lucas didn't have much time. His arrival had not gone unnoticed. Between the trail of corpses and the alarm, he wouldn't be hard to find when reinforcements came looking. He was almost looking forward to that. Orcs weren't good for much, but killing them was an excellent way of relieving frustration. He studied the cogitator panels. Are you still alive, Streisen? Ah, his current, if begrudging, master's voice, growling across the comm frequencies. Lucas smirked. Did you doubt me, Lord Grimblad? Always, and at length. Have you succeeded? Kjarl Grimblad, the Firewolf, Lord and Commander of one of the twelve great companies of the Space Wolves chapter. Last cycle, Bran Redmore had been the unlucky recipient of the Jackal Wolf's leash. Lucas's services were passed from company to company on an almost insultingly regular basis, as if he were equal parts burden and responsibility. It was not his fault that the Wolf Lords were more Lord than Wolf, and inclined to their dignity overmuch, just as it was not his fault that they took his harmless jests so seriously. Has your famed foresight deserted you, Grimblood? Would we be speaking now if I hadn't succeeded? Grimblood snarled with impatience, and Lucas grinned. The firewolf burned hot, and it took only the littlest bit of fuel to renew the blaze. A jest here, a bit of bloat toad venom there, it all added up. His brothers thought him a fool, an annoyance at best, a threat to their sanity at worst. But provocation was an art, and Lucas an artist. 
Like all artists, he took pride in his work. That they did not understand only proved the validity of it. He counted the seconds, letting Grimblood's impatience build. Then, just as the Wolf Lord was about to speak, he replied. Yes, Grimblood, I've reached the central control chamber. But I won't be able to hold it, not by myself. You don't have to! Destroy it and the communications grid with it! I want that planet dark when we arrive, Strifeson! Lucas removed his helmet and set it aside, eager to taste something other than recycled air. His senses stretched. He could smell burnt metal and spoiled meat, and he could hear more than just alarms. Grimblood's pack was loping across the void towards Pollux Tertius, even now. They would arrive in three hours, by his estimate. Already, the company's gunships were dueling with orc vessels in the upper stratosphere to ensure a safe insertion window for the ground assault. Oh. That doesn't seem very entertaining. But that is probably the point, yes? What was that? Nothing. It will take some time. Lucas had been sent ahead of the great company, ostensibly to take the Vox Relay and prevent the Orcs from organizing any sort of unified defense. In reality, his mission was a punishment. The Stormfangs could have easily destroyed the station from a safe distance. But this way, Lucas would remain on the station until someone bothered to retrieve him. Most likely after all of the glory was won and the fighting ended. Grimblood certainly knew how to hold a grudge, and a baseless one at that. Dosing the Wolf Lord's Mjod with Grinweed had been a harmless prank, nothing more. But, as his name implied, Grimblood lacked even the barest micron of a sense of humor. Lucas sealed the control chamber. The bulkhead locked into place with a grinding hiss. He gave it a knock and, satisfied, turned back to the Vox systems. You have a plasma pistol. Use it. As you say, my lord, but my pistol is still recharging. He ran his hands over the cogitator panels, tweaking the frequencies rising up from the planet's surface. A squall of feedback caused him to wince. Orc voices snapped into focus, accompanied by a distortion echo. Their voices were like rocks in a steel drum, or hot mud poured over broken glass. Nasty, but distinctive. He was familiar with the orc tongue, enough to understand their insults and reply in kind. That was all their language was, really. Insults. It was crude and unsubtle, but potent. One, two, three... He twisted the controls, isolating the voices. There were as many dialects as there were clans. He didn't recognize these, though it made little difference. The root logographic system was the same, whatever the permutation. A fourth signal intruded. And you make four. Interesting. He activated the hololith set above the box system and studied it. The flickering image showed that Pollux Tertius was divided into four quadrants, and the orc warg had splintered accordingly. He listened to the relayed frequencies, scanning back and forth, noting the corresponding areas on the map. The orcs were using the Vox Relay Station to bounce their own primitive signals. They would already be spoiling for a fight. They were always spoiling for a fight. Lucas took note of the names that cropped up with something approaching regularity. Those would be the ones in charge. An idea began to take shape. And he chuckled. I heard that! Stop wasting time and do as I ordered, Strifeson! I fully intend to fulfill my mission objectives. He began to isolate and modulate certain signals. While his understanding of such technologies was limited, he'd picked up a few tricks from obliging the engine seers and Lex mechanics in his time. He smiled, remembering one lass and the way she had paled he bared his fangs at her. The mission is... Wait... Are you smiling? <laughs> no. You're smiling. I can hear you smiling. 
I am merely pleased at the thought of slaughtering Xenos Filth. Grimblood growled. Ah, you laughing at me, Chuckle Wolf. I laugh with you, Wolf Lord, at the thought of the carnage we shall unleash upon these creatures. We shall rip and tear them and leave not one intact. You are laughing at me. Those are my words you spit back at me like poison. Are they? Perhaps. You use so many words, it's impossible not to borrow a few. You know damn well those were my exact words to you. What are you up to? Lucas didn't answer. He was opening a general communications channel to broadcast across all frequencies. He cleared his throat. It was best to start small and build on the response. <coughs> the art of provocation was one of layers. Go sneak tooth, says Og Orts Snot Zog Scab. He racked his brain for the words as he went. It didn't have to be right, just close. Orc language was a thing of approximation more than precision. What did you call me? Not you. Lucas winced as the channel crackled with a blistering response. Queries, mostly. A few insults. Quicker than he'd expected, but that was good. He cycled through the channels and picked another name at random. An isolated frequency this time. Nifska says, Sneak Tooth Og Naf Grot Og Naf Boss. The insults were childish, but those were the best kind. He cycled again. Another general broadcast. Bonkia Og Gutsgrim Zod. That one got the best reaction. So he repeated it several times across several isolated frequencies to ensure maximum reach. Bonkia Og Gutsgrim Zod. Bonkia Og Gutsgrim Zod. What are you up to? This isn't the time for your usual mischief, not cool. Lucas's smile bent into a frown as the Wolf Lord emphasized his rank. Grimblood liked to remind Lucas of his lack of advancement. He thought of it as a punishment, and perhaps it was. Lucas, however, had found freedom of a sort. Little was expected of him, and he made the most of it. What more could any true son of Russ ask for than the freedom to run as he wished? But that didn't stop the constant reminders of his status from being irksome. You sound just like your mother, Wolf Lord. What? Or was it your sister? I get them confused. It was dangerous to prod in such a fashion, but he couldn't help himself. There was an element of truth in the jibe however small. He'd shared many beds and had many acquaintances prior to enduring the procedures and rituals of becoming a space marine. It was entirely possible that he'd known Grimblood's kin in his past life. Even better, the Wolf Lord knew it. Repeat yourself. I must have misheard you. Do you even have a sister? Am I thinking of someone else? So pleased was Lucas with this game, he almost missed the sound of the not-quite-dead orc rising up behind him. The smell of Xenos' blood washed over him, and he turned at the last moment. A wide blade with a jagged edge slashed down, shearing away one of his braids. He snatched up his helmet and smashed the orc across the jaw with it. Quite a trick. It will be your last. He thought he'd killed the creature. But orcs were nothing if not durable. The greenskin had recovered its wits after Lucas had felled it, while he had been distracted. Dark blood stained its torso and arms. Its skull was cracked, but it had plenty of fight left in it. It hacked at him, and he was forced to roll aside. He slugged it, rocking it on its heels. <coughs> Is that all you've got? The orc grunted, trying to focus on him. What was that? What's happening? The blade came down again, splitting a panel as Lucas stepped aside. Sparks sprayed up to cascade across the floor. Lucas drove the creature back with a sweep of his wolf claw. You seem to be having a bit of trouble, my green-skinned adversary. Perhaps I should just wait here until you keel over. 
The wounded orc reeled, eyes bulging in rage. He wondered if it could understand him. He hoped so. It bellowed again and lunged. Its momentum drove him back against the cogitator bank. He swatted its blade aside, embedding it in the hololith projector, which gave a whine of protest and fizzled into darkness. Time, son! Report! What are you playing at? The orc's bloodied head came down against his with a solid crack. Lucas slumped, dazed. It was like being punched in the skull by an ice bear. Stunned, he couldn't stop it from catching him in a powerful grapple. His lightning claw was pinned to his side, and he couldn't draw his plasma pistol. The orc roared at him, spattering his hair and beard with reeking saliva and blood. He heard the ceramite plates of his armor creak. Well, what now? Going to yell me to death? Shackle, wolf! Answer me, damn you! Lucas struggled to free himself, but lacked the leverage. The orc was big and strong. Strong enough to lift a power-armored warrior up off the ground and hold him there. Strife, sir! What's going on? Report! Nothing. It's all fine. Just give me a moment. Lucas's head snapped down, meeting the orc's rounded cranium. There was a sound like two stones colliding, and Lucas's world spun. He blinked blood out of his eyes and did it again. Two could play this game. The orc staggered back, gurgling. A third time, and its weakened skull gave way completely with a wet crack. Still, it refused to release him, but its grip had slackened noticeably. Lucas activated the lightning claw and twisted, driving the talons up into the orc's side. The greenskin screamed in pain, and suddenly Lucas was free. He swept the claw out and silenced the Xenos for good. What's going on? I demand you answer me! Lucas swayed and shook his head. He kicked the orc. That's for having such a hard head. He stumbled back to the comm panel. Despite the blade embedded in it, the Voxcaster was still functioning. He leaned over it, broadcasting across all frequencies. Look up with the drag door of scum. The Vox crackled with orcish voices, bellowing contradicting orders. He recognized the words for attack and kill among them. The entire relay station shuddered. Proximity alarms sounded. Lucas laughed, but it sounded more like a snarl. As he'd hoped, he'd set something in motion. He tapped at the shattered holomyth, trying to get it to work as Grimblood raged on the other end of the link. What have you done? The Stormfangs are reporting that the Greenskins <laughs> are turning against one another. <laughs> I interrupted enemy communications prior to an assault. Fairly standard. Frequencies crackled. A channel went dead, abruptly. Then another. He heard the boom of a weapon somewhere close by. Some of the orcs aboard the relay station had obviously heard his last broadcast and taken it to heart. Greenskins were always spoiling for a fight, and he'd given them an excuse. It was happening quicker than he'd expected, but then that was orcs for you always full of surprises. He kicked the body of the orc he'd just killed again, just to make sure. You've set them at each other's throats! I wanted them blind and deaf, not at war! Grimblood sounded angry. Good. Consider it my gift to you. If they exterminate each other before we arrive, I'm holding you personally responsible, trickster! All credit for the victory goes to you, my lord. It's not a victory if they kill each other before I can do it! Lucas smiled. Oh no. Better hurry then. This is not a worthy deed, Stripeson, you... You're the one who can see the future, Grimblood. It's not my fault if your flames of portent didn't warn you of this. <laughs> Grimblood roared, causing the signal to crackle with static. I can hear you smiling! Never. <laughs> Lucas closed the link. 
He could almost hear Grimblood's howl of rage, and his smile widened in satisfaction. He looked down at one of the dead orcs. Not that he'll learn. They never do. I suppose it wouldn't be as much fun if they did. He stepped back and fired his pistol, melting the cogitators to slag. He heard the thud of hobnailed boots and the bellicose cries of greenskins closing in on the control chamber. He scraped the air with his wolf claw, leaving contrails of hazy energy in its wake. He wondered how many of them he could kill before Grimblood arrived. Enough to feed the fires of the Wolf Lord's wrath, but not so many as to make it blaze out of control. That would come later, when Lucas reminded him of the glories lost and victory snatched from his grasp by his own hand. In a song, perhaps. It would take time to compose it, but he had plenty of that. What with the orcs mostly busy killing each other. Provocation was an art, and all great art took time. Parting of the Ways by Chris Raitt Performed by Gareth Armstrong, Robin Bowerman, Ian Brooker, Steve Conlin and Jonathan Keeble He stalked past heaps of the slain 20, 30, 40 corpses Every pain-filled stride brought another into view they were crushed, their battle plate rent and twisted. The markers of the wolf scored with blood and grime, the bodies hammered into the yielding soils of Morellion. As he went, his claws snarled with blue-white energies, marking out the bolter he clasped in his right hand. His armor was thick with the scars of battle, webbed with impact cracks, scorched by plasma burns. Behind him, the ash plains yawned under a vermilion sky. Slag towers reared up to cloud level, twisting in mockery of mortal architecture, vast beyond vast. Cathedrals to dark gods, whose greatest ambitions for oblivion had been checked only in living memory. The towers, spewed with fumes, vomited up from furnaces under the earth, monuments to industrial sorcery. Bjorn, called the fell-handed, great wolf of the space wolves chapter of the Adeptus Astartes, advanced through it all, ignoring the pursuit of the lesser creatures that plagued the Ash World, seeking out the beast that had slain so many of his battle brothers. He did not have to hunt far. It squatted amid the towers of piled filth, waiting for him just as it had done for the others, a beast of chaos. Immense, bloated with power, stinking from warp essence that bled from every inflamed pore and dribbled from every fanged orifice. Its hide shimmered like oil under sunlight, changing with dizzying speed, mutating and warping in a liquid procession of realignments. Its body was morbidly obese, spilling across a grime-blown stairwell, slipping slug-like on rolls of mirror-faceted flesh. For us! Bjorn made the cry before every fresh combat. The Primarch had been gone now for 300 years, consigned to legend along with his brothers, but the name still carried the wolves into war, just as it had ever done, and just as it would for eternity. The beast reared above him, many times Bjorn's height, breaking open a dozen moors across its hide, then hundreds, then thousands. Warp-spun jaws snapped and gaped, sprouting lashing tongues between serried incisors, vomiting clouds of ether vapor that sunk like spittle onto the dust. 
Bjorn ploughed into its flanks, slashing out with his claws, punching bolt rounds at close range, aiming for the wounds his brothers had already given it before it had killed them. He was stronger than any of them had been, though, and faster too, darting back, driving forward and hacking out, propelled by a fury of such purity that it made his power armor to blur and his weapon arm fly. The creature reeled, screaming as chunks of its body were sliced free. Yawn headed for the heart, powering inward, working as furiously as a smith of the anvil, going for whatever unnatural organs pulsated within its chameleonic hive. The tang of demons that fizzed in the acrid air, carried like flames across Prometheus, and the beast rallied, drawing deep on the corruption in its heart. Lightning cracked along the horizon, red as wine stains, and the ground shivered. New tentacles, each barbed with meter-long spikes, shot out, wrapping around Bjorn's limbs. Poison spores splashed over, dousing his armor in iridescent sludge. New flesh growths swelled into life, reaching cumescence with obscene speed, every one crowned with hooks, mauls, and flails. Bjorn fought on even as the spikes punched deep into his greaves. He cut down the tentacles as more curled around him. Soon he was enveloped, a mortal warrior battling a living wall of ever mutating demon flesh. He tried to choke him, to throttle him, to swamp him and crush him. But he kept cutting it back, slashing it down, cleaving it open. The beast's movements became frantic. Its talons raked across Bjorn's torso, tearing up the armor plates and driving deep under them. Side-like growths gashed across his limbs, breaking the ceramite. He roared, not in pain, but through the renewed kill urge, and his efforts redoubled. Blood? His own and the creatures mingled in speckle throne rivulets. Every blow was delivered with mortal strength, smashing the stairway around them, sending the walls shuddering. There could be no prolonging. The delivery of force was too complete, too unbounded, too elemental. Bjorn laughed as he felt his body torn apart, knowing that he was dealing yet more damage to his prey. He laughed as his breastplate was cracked and his right arm was ripped from its wrist joint, for by then the creature had been eviscerated. Stripped out from the center, its glowing innards exposed to his claws. Foras! There was no pain, only ferocity. His legs gave out from under him, poisoned and broken, but he still swung out with his lightning claw, cutting out the warp matter rearing over him. The talons drove deep twisting into the pustules and ganglia within. It screamed, shaking the spires of ash and sending it toppling down around the two of them. It thrashed and flayed, twisting on pins of disruptor charge. What remained of its flesh carbonized, curling ink black, and the lolling tongues crisped and fell apart. When its body gave out at last, and the warp soul at its heart was blown apart and sent tumbling back into the ether, Bjorn collapsed amid the crater of its destruction and for the first time felt the true scale of his agony. He had destroyed it, but it had destroyed him too. At last, after centuries of ceaseless battle, he had met a foe that had the measure of him. He could no longer feel his limbs. His lightning claw clattered uselessly to the ash. His vision swam with blood and the last of his armor systems failed in a hail of static. With what meager strength remained, he managed to roll onto his back. Above him, the skies were streaked with crimson and scored by fresh trails of smog. The screams and cracks of battle became muffled as the world sunk into a blurred fog. He heard what might have been landers coming in, reinforcements perhaps, sent to bolster the strike force he had taken to Morellion to slay the beast. He managed a dry smile at that. Too late now, he had rushed into combat, just as he had always chosen to, and this time, it had undone him. That he had died as a warrior ought to die, in combat with nightmares, standing up to them, sending them back to hell. It was a worthy end, one that would find a place in the sagas, even set against all else he had accomplished. In truth, he had never asked for more, not even when the whole galaxy had been in flames and all allegiances had been torn up. And so, 
as he felt the cold claws of Morkai reach for him and the pain slip into numbness and his awareness cloud and fade. Bjorn managed a final smile with broken fangs. The tracked isolation unit crawled over the rock plates, its armor-grade flanks blinking with life sign markers. Two lords of Fenris accompanied it, power armored, heads bowed. Ahead and behind them, three dozen warriors of the rout marched amid the smoke and sulfur. An honor guard assembled to take the fallen great wolf from the world of ash and bear him back to the world of ice. Does he live? Wolf priest Thrain Winterclaw was war grizzled, clad in night black plate, his helm daubed the white of skull bones. He swung a crackling crozier from his right clenched fist, still activated from combat. Anger animated his every word that he had been too late, that he had seen the great wolf fall but had not been swift enough to intervene. By the law of the chapter, he should have been extracting the progenoids of the dead now, for there were many of them. But all that paled beside the need to keep the fell-handed from further harm. He walks the path between the worlds. It had been Rune Priest Cargrim who had first felt the tremble in the web of fate, who had demanded a force to follow the Great Wolf to Morellion, who had sent down the landers and deployed the extraction squads. Even now, the battle brothers he had brought with him were fanning out from the drop sites, torching and slaughtering. Their hammer blows were even heavier than normal propelled by grief and fury. The fell-handed had fallen. Though none of them believed that quite yet, Bjorn had guided them for the three centuries since the disappearance of the Primarch, holding the chapter together during the years of rebuilding, guarding the rout's ferocious independence from the dead hand of Terra's administrators, reforging the warrior's way. The brothers whispered that he could not die. He was the soul of the chapter. He could not die. Winterclaw reached over to the isolation unit's armor glass canopy and smeared bloodied ash away from the surface. Underneath, Bjorn's face stared up blindly, twitching, his eyes open but unseeing. They had taken his helm off, and now his mouth, nostrils and neck veins were all infiltrated with feeder tubes. Further down, metal wires punched deep into his hearts and lungs, keeping blood circulating, keeping oxygen entering, keeping the shock from seizing up his organs. Antitoxins fizzed in his veins, battling the poisons riddling his ravaged body. Crude sutures had been used to knit the worst of his great wounds together, but they did little more than keep the ragged edges of his flesh from coming away completely. He's in the dream. Winterclaw monitored the life signs blinking along the edge of the savior unit. The machine was like a great tracked coffin, a bulky contraption that clunked and choked and wheeled its way towards the waiting lander. It stank of the Adeptus Mechanicus, of the primacy of iron over flesh. Targrim looked up. Morellian's sky was shot with spirals of bloody cloud. The wind shrieked across it as if laughing. You saw the body. The dream will not save him. Winterclaw growled with a snarl of animal frustration. The great wolf should never have been on Morellian, not with such a paltry retinue around him. But then there never had been any persuasion with the fell-handed. He hunted where he wished, with whom he wished, and that had always been the way of it. Why do his eyes not close? He sees something. The mind is not yet gone. Ahead of them, the squat outline of a fleet lander steamed on Morellian's hateful rock plates, its atmospheric engines whining to take off. The rear ramp was lowered, poised for the surge that would take the craft hurtling up to the orbital cruiser. What is he seeing? Winterclaw scrutinized the face under the armor glass, desperate for some sign of life, of vitality, that the fell-handed would rise again. What is he seeing?
The hall of warriors in the heights of the Valgard rang with noise. Vats of steaming yod had been dragged up from the refectorium by Kells, each one slopping with dark, thick liquor. Laughter rose up into the smoke-clouded vaults, raucous and hard, the sound of post-human lungs opening up, celebrating victories, remembering fallen brothers. For those who were gone, the rout did not bow their heads in commemoration. They called out the names, raising their drinking horns, roaring out the deeds, counting the numbers of warriors' sleigh tallies in gangs. Bjorn hung back, leaning against the cold stone, remaining far from the circles of fire. A part of him wanted to join them, to chant the names of the fallen and raise a clenched fist to their memory. It should have been a time of universal celebration. The fortress of the Fang was complete at last. The great scouring was accomplished. The wounds of heresy were beginning to scab over, if not heal. The Sixth Legion was now the chapter of the Space Wolves, though that had scarce altered the manner of war on Fenris. They still fought the same way, laughed the same way, and savoured the same pattern of the hunt. All except Bjorn. Even elevation to the Primarch's own wolf guard had not changed that. He clung to the shadows, just as he had ever done. His long black hair matted, his mutilated left arm stump itching for the armor that made him whole. You are not drinking. He didn't need to turn in order to see who the speaker was. No warrior of a chapter spoke like that. The voice was too deep, too resonant, too suffused with the ancient majesty of the depleted order of Primarchs. Bjorn watched as Russ strolled into the open, his blonde hair lit red by the fire pits. The Wolf King had changed since the days of the Crusade. All those who had survived the final inferno on terror had changed. When they smiled, it was forced, and when they laughed, there was a hollowness to it. I find my thirst is like so it ever was with you. The Primarch folded his burly arms and leaned against a pillar. We must do this every year. My sons fight and die across a thousand worlds. For one day, one day, they may be allowed to revel in what they have done. Hmm. The feast of the Emperor's Ascension. Ascended to what, exactly? Russ gave him a warning look. Have a care. But Bjorn was in no mood to take part in the pretense. You and I know better, my lord, than to fear the agents of terror, nor to listen to them. It has been more than two hundred years since the Great Siege. The Emperor does not speak. He is not seen outside the palace. And Orn built him a prison, not a throne. Bjorn knew the danger in those words, but the euphoria of the victory that still pumped through the veins of the Imperium disgusted him. Some of those that now spoke for the burgeoning administratum of mankind seemed to genuinely believe that the darkness had been banished for good, that the victory was complete, and that there would never again be a time when humanity would stare extinction in the face. Russ shot him a weary look. So serious. You never change. Just for once, though, could you not raise a tankard? Bjorn looked out over the hall, filled with ranks of the warrior born. They were singing now, reciting the great sagas, remembering Gunnar Gunhild and the great Jarls of the Ages. If he joined them, they would welcome it. They would call out his name and tell of the great deeds that were attached to the fell-handed, the shield-bearer of the Primarch, the chosen son of the Wolf King. It would be good to share in that. The other members of the retinue were already there, standing at the tables, roaring out the words until the hammerbeam roof rang with them. You will tell them the same tales? Bjorn looked back at his Primarch, the one who had sponsored him from the very start, elevating him to second in command of the entire chapter in the face of the older Jarl's disapproval. <laughs> they will love it, and so will you. Russ nodded, a smile flitting across his scarred face. Aye, it does the heart good. <laughs> but what then, Lord? We are few. 
There are beasts left to slay, and while we tarry, they are spawning in the dark. We should be out there. The brood of Horus lingers, and one day, it will return. Russ's expression changed, and the smile dissolved. These were things they both knew, though to speak of them out loud, even in the fastness of the eight, felt like sacrilege. Come! The Primarch clapped his hand onto Bjorn's shoulder. The feast is prepared. You will take your place at the table. You will eat, you will drink, and just for a moment, if you are not careful, you might crack a grin. <laughs> the beasts will still be there when we are done. And then he walked off. Lehman Russ of Fenris, his rolling gait taking him down the center of the Great Hall. As he passed among them, his warriors cheered and banged their blades against the long tables. A slayer king among his people, who loved him with all the fierce, brutal love that Fenris could cultivate for the savage soul. Bjorn watched him go. Was he more hunched than he had once been? Was the old swagger a little less fluent? But then he had been imagining that for centuries, ever since Alaxis and the aftermath of Prospero. And he had been wrong then. He needed to stop dwelling on the darkening future. Russ was with them when so many of his brothers were not. And, as it had been, it would always be. And so, wincing, Bjorn moved off, ready to join his brothers in the light of the fires. He died twice on the passage from Morellion to Fenris. They had all seen the monitors go flat, reporting that both hearts had given out and that the soul had left the body, fleeing to the halls of the slain, apt to take his rightful place by the side of the routes most lethal. But Winterclaw was a proud fleshmaker and did not give in easily. He and Cargrim labored over the slab, cutting muscle, threading tubes into arteries, altering the mix of coagulants and anticoagulants, suppressants and stimulants. So the hearts kicked back into life twice, as if dragged into the universe on a chain. Bjorn's great chest shuddered, and he drew breath again. The strike cruiser burst from the warp dangerously close to Fenris, so desperate were they for speed. The hangars of the Valgard had already been prepared for the lander, which dropped into the atmosphere like a falling star. Bjorn, or what remained of him, was hurried into the Fleshmaker's laboratories, chambers that had seen a thousand fallen warriors go under the deep-plunged knife. They laid him out in the central chamber, spare with white tiles, glimmering with green-edged lumens and reeking of antiseptic and engine oils. Necodendrites clattered down from the ceiling, held in place by great iron bracings. Servitors scurried silently to Winterclaw's side, proffering rows of scalpels and saws, and leather-masked thralls hung back, poised to fetch whatever salves and potions their master demanded. Cargrim knew better than to interfere. His task had been to lay the wards against Maleficarum to protect the fragile soul from the snares of the warp as they plied the void depths. Now the struggle was one of flesh and blood, and in the caverns of the demon warded Eat, there was no longer danger from the howling terrors of the Underverse. Cargrim watched Winterclaw work. Tell me. Winterclaw had removed his helm, and his face was shiny with sweat. He operated deftly, casting glances at Picta lenses before adding another line. He ought to be gone. The wolf priest yanked on a nutrient tube and threaded a metal pin underneath. He will lose his legs, his right arm, and his stomach. The bleeding does not stop. He is on the edge. Cargrim watched grimly. The lower half of Bjorn's body, now sawn free of its armor, was little more than a pulpy, gory mass, flecked with the white of broken bone. His lower torso was ripped to ribbons, and the entrails glistened within, pulsing as his heart's labored. Winterclaw's machines now breathed for him wheezing mechanically down segmented tubes. The wolf priest reached for a circular saw. I will open the chest. He is bleeding to death and the wound is within. 
Cargrim watched the fine-toothed blades rev up. That will end him. He is already ended. What do you think we can accomplish here? He will never bear a blade again. It would be a mercy to slit his throat. Cargrim knew where the anger came from. The wolves did not keep their warriors alive at all costs. Those who could fight again were saved. Those who could not were given the Allfather's mercy. There is another choice. Winterclaw paused, perfectly aware of what the options were. Has Blademaker answered? He stands ready. Give the word and they will prepare the vessel. Still, Winterclaw did not move. It was a grim fate for any warrior of the route, but for the Great Wolf it would be unprecedented. There was in any case no guarantee of success. The knowledge needed for insertion was already faltering, and those who had created the machines were long since dead. Would the route serve a leader in a tomb? If he lived and his soul were preserved, they would follow him into the eye itself. But what if his mind is changed? Half of those placed in the vessel go mad. Do you wish to go down in the annals as the one who gave the chapter a demented great wolf? Down on the slab, Bjorn's head shifted, and a fresh line of blood ran down from his lips. Warning runes flashed red along the whole bank of Medikai units, and more stims were automatically pumped down the feeder tubes. Cargrim leaned over the body, a heap of tangled bone and sinew now, barely held together by the pins and vices of Winterclaw's art. The progenoids could be extracted if he gave the command. There was a kind of immortality in the sacred gene seed, one that would be of benefit to the chapter for eternity. Perhaps that would be enough. Perhaps they had already done more than loyalty demanded. Winterclaw revved the circular saw again, aiming the cutting edge along the center line of Bjorn's fused ribcage. That was the only substantial part of the skeletal frame that remained intact. Once the cut was made, the only outcomes could be death, a wretched augmetic half-life, or interment as one of the fallen. Do this, and there can be no return. You say it as if there were a choice. Winterclaw guided the sword to the bone. As the blades bit, the sound was like the shriek of banshees. With a crack, the structure broke, and Bjorn's chest lay open in a swimming mire of blood and muscle, the swollen organs shivering within. Winterclaw gazed down at the mess of tissue. For a moment he said nothing, his mind working furiously. Cargrim let him make the judgment. This was his realm. Now readings streaked across the pictures, all of them marked in red, none of them comforting. Finally, the wolf priest's shoulders sagged and Cargrim knew what the course must be. Then we are decided. Winterclaw nodded. Summon Blade Maker. The great wolf will be interred. Hours passed in the Hall of Warriors. More was drunk and the mood became febrile. The chanting of the sagas became erratic. Brawls broke out at the far end of the massive chamber and the smoke churned up from the braziers, making the air thick and acrid. For a time, Russ had whipped up the fervor himself, standing at the head of the high table, bellowing along with the recited sagas. He swore and spat, grinning at the memory of those great souls who had gone, and raised a curved horn to their memory. His retinue sat with him, tearing into slabs of fire-blackened meat, slamming their fists on the wooden board in drumbeat unison. Blood ran down their beards and sweat glistened on their scarred faces. Bjorn had made an attempt. He had taken his station at the far end of the table and meat had been thrown before him. He knew the sagas just as well as his brothers, and he raised his drinking horn to those who had gone, he listened to the long screeds of praise to the Allfather and the ritual denunciation of the serpent, Horus. As time went on, though, his dark mood returned. The drink tasted sour in his mouth. Something had changed. Even as the flames leapt higher, a chill wind ran through the hall. The brawls became surly. Blades were drawn and not replaced in scabbards. 
Shadows pooled at the base of the pillars, darkening, creeping like tar around the old stone. Soon, even Russ noticed it. He withdrew from the recitations and supped in silence. The Wolf King presided over a growing storm, sitting like one of the gods of legend as the tempest swirled around him. His blue eyes went dull, his weapon-blistered hands pressed into the board before him as if he would squeeze the grain apart. Bjorn watched, chewing on the strands of meat, ignoring the roar of his brothers as the hall descended into a massed churn of acrimony. He has sensed it now, a fell wind from beyond the mountain, bleeding into the cracks of the fang. He cannot ignore it forever. No more! Russ clambered to his feet, scattering the iron salvers before him. His voice rose above all others, swelling into the smoke-choked heights and making the flags of the hall floor tremble. They were stilled. The warriors of the rout, more than 2,000 of them in defiance of the Codex, turned to face the high table. A faint hiss sighed from somewhere, like the whisper of something hidden, something subtle. The blood had gone from Russ's face. Where he had been ruddy, flushed with mjod, now he looked like an ice spectre. All noticed it. We come here to celebrate the All-Father. We come to remember his sacrifice and his ascension from the world of the senses and his victory over my brother, the traitor. The words echoed dully from the vaults like a blade being hammered against the stone and there was no celebration in them. Bjorn pushed his meat away. We remember the dead, who even now gather in the Oververse, their blades sharp, their aim keen. They are better than we are, for they perished in the war to end all wars, and their souls have been purified. What of us, those who remain, wallowing in the dregs that fallen gods have left us? There was a dangerous look in the Primarch's eyes, just as he had once worn when fighting the Alpha Legion in the aftermath of Prospero. We have grown fat. We have the beasts within us, but it has never yet been mastered. His warriors became uneasy. Their Primarch had never spoken to them in this way. Russ grabbed his drinking horn, and the Mjord slopped from its bronze rim as he held it aloft. So, let us celebrate my father's ascension. Let us remember what he was able to accomplish. Let us remember what he built and what he foresaw, and then what he lost and how he failed. Do not mourn the fact that he no longer walks among us, for the galaxy is too small to accommodate such souls. He was of an age of gods, and we are slumped in an age of mortals. Bjorn looked out at his brothers and saw the uncertainty etched on their faces. The light of the stars will fade. This place will grow old, and the ice will crack it. We will forget, no matter how much the skulls tell the old tales. What battles are left for us like the ones before? My fallen brothers are gone. Malkador is gone. The liches cluster around the Golden Throne and whisper of deeds done before they were born, as if it were they who achieved them. The Primarch looked unsteady on his feet and his eyes went glassy. A doubt of all this, one thing remains true. We were not on Terra. We were not there when the palace fell. And that shame will pursue us for eternity. The drinking horn fell from his fingers, rolling across the board, its contents spilling. It remains unfinished. He was no longer looking at his warriors. He spoke to himself, or to some presence that was unseen. 
I have waited too long building this mountain, squabbling with Gilliman. I will not grow old, feeble, limping around a crumbling inheritance. I have an oath to keep. There are beasts left to slay. Bjorn felt a cold sweat break out across his skin, recognizing the words he had used. Russ's grizzled head lifted, seized by premonition. His gaze ran across the hall, inscrutable, wry, and a smile danced on his fanged face. It was as if he were seeing things from long ago, or perhaps yet to come. Listen but closely, brothers. There shall come a time, far from now, when the chapter itself is dying and our foes shall gather to destroy us. Then, my sons, I shall listen for your call in whatever realm holds me. And come, I shall, no matter what the laws of life and death forbid. At the end, I will be there. For the final battle, for the wolf time! A ripple ran through the entire chamber, a thrill like the kill urge. Russ's retinue got to their feet, their predator eyes shining. Russ gave the battle signal for muster, began to move, and they followed him down from the high table. Bjorn made to join them to take his place at the head of the company. Once he was back at Russ's side again, he could ask the questions that now clamoured inside him. He could demand to know what Russ had seen and why his mood had changed so violently. And what came next, and who they were hunting. But Russ turned, just as the last of his guard joined him, leaving Bjorn exposed on the dais. Not you! Bjorn stopped in his tracks. For a moment he thought he must have misheard. The entire chapter was assembled, waiting, watching, their curiosity running like startled deer. Lord, uh, I do not... Bjorn felt a sudden sickness. Russ did not falter, even though his face was grey. Not you. There were no more words. The Primarch turned away and strode down the length of the hall. His retinue, his wolf guard, fell into line behind him, and the ranks of the space wolves parted again to let him pass. Bjorn remained on the high dais, alone now, frozen by the command. He watched Russ go, striding again, his huge frame animated. All weariness seemed to have dropped from him, and his shoulders rolled, his spine was straight. Even then, Bjorn considered disobeying. He considered racing after his Primarch, demanding to know why he was left behind, alone of the retinue, and what new vision had seized the Primarch's impulsive mind. The two of them had quarrelled before, and there had always been reconciliation. If he was at fault, if there was some way in which he had erred, there would be a path back from it. Russ had always been a hard master, but not a cruel one. In time, there would be a reckoning. Russ would return after his own good measure, and then all would be explained. The Primarch had made impulsive decisions before, and this would be no different. So Bjorn did not force the issue. Trusting that the vision would be revealed, he let his master leave without asking why. But as he watched Russ duck under the archway and pass from the hall, the nausea did not shift, and the cold wind scraped across the stone. They took him down through the winding ways of the Fang, his body escorted at all times by warriors of the great companies. The need for haste was paramount, so his suspenser beer was taken down through the thoroughfares, the great vertical shafts running from the summit of the mountain down to its ice-gripped roots. As the beer made its passage, mortal thralls gathered in murmuring crowds, their faces drawn with a mix of hope and trepidation. Some cried out of fate for his deliverance, or made clenched fist salutes, or fell to their knees in grief. The beer plunged further, and the ways became hotter, 
the stone tinged red, the air thick with Promethean fumes. The emblems changed from sigils of hunting packs to those of the gods of iron, from the axe to the hammer. By the time they reached the deep forges, the ancient Sledgek blade maker was waiting for them. His armor was just as it always had been, dark as pitch, crusted with a residue of a hundred campaigns, crowned with servo arms that clasped and clanged like war trophies. Cargrim and Winterclaw brought Bjorn before the Iron Priest, treading along a wide causeway that jutted from a frothing sea of magma. The interment hall at the causeway's end was vast, its roof soaring away up into the heart of the mountain. Deep shafts around the rock shelf glowed with primordial fire, flaring and spitting up the bare stone. Heavy machinery from the dawn of the Imperial Age studied the platform's boundary, red-lined, huge, growling with coiled power. Ranks of iron thralls, their faces hidden behind thick metal masks, lined the radial gantries spanning the fire lake. As Bjorn's suspensor casket drew up before him, the blade maker bowed, his hands already clasping the tools that would reshape and reform the broken corpse. What do you say? Can it be done? Sledjek studied the bloodied mass for a long time, his helm lenses clicking as ocular instruments made measurements. I remember the first time I laid eyes on him. Just another hot blood, eyes bright from killing, swaggering around my forge, hunting for weapons. He was one-handed then, bereft of a claw. I sent him away. <laughs> he took one anyway. Sledgek leaned over, gently pulling at the flesh on the beard, his armor's oculi whirring the whole time. I thought he'd be dead within days. I thought I'd outlive him, just as I outlived all the others. Even now, I would prefer to be wrong about that. His servo arms got to work. Iron thralls pushed forward, inserting metal spurs into the suspensor beer. The flames in the shafts below swelled, splashing heat against the chamber walls. From behind Blade Maker, where nine columns of stone loomed in close ranks, chains clanked, then pulled taut. A chasm yawned open, gouting steam as pistons slid to full extension. His hearts are beating. His spirit clings on. You have worked wonders here, Flesh Maker. Winterclaw said nothing, but withdrew with Cargrim to let the Iron Thralls get in close. Sledgek looked like some massive iron spider, hunched over its prone prey, servo arms extended, ready to pick the remains apart. His servants began to drone, to intone archaic rites of appeasement to the gods of the machine, of the anvil, of the angry world's heart. Once the chasm had opened fully, more chains clanked tight, each one the width of a man's wrist. Crimson effluent spilled out from the void below, seething across blackened stone. Engines thrummed into gear, and something began to rise, hoard up from the uttermost depths, out of the silent vaults from where no light or heat ever came. The finest tool, nothing else. Sledjek, now engrossed in his preparatory work, hacked up a scornful laugh. <laughs> All my tools are the finest. A drill extended from his leading servo arm. But fear not, there has never been one like this. As his words echoed around the forge chamber, the empty outline of a dreadnought chassis emerged from the shaft, gripped by eight chain lines. It was massive, a hunk of adamantium and ceramite, blocky, angular, doggedly indestructible. As Sledgek had promised, it was superlative. Its front panels were studded with gold images, a rearing wolf, a fork of lightning, all in fine knotwork tracery, the equal of any ancient Slayer King's barrow. Everything about it was exquisite, the pinnacle of the ironworker's art, hewn with a heavy hammer, but finished with the artisan's eye. Winterclaw knew enough of the Iron Priest's craft to see that nothing of the like would ever be made again. This was the last of the machines laid down before the lore of Mars had begun to fade, and when Sledgek died, there would be none built to ride it. As the empty chassis was swung over on its chain harness, the interment machines throttled up into life, 
and the army of robed thralls bore up their sacred vessels. Lines of incense-tinged steam coiled up into the firelit heights, and Winterclaw and Cargrim pulled back to the causeway, knowing that Bjorn had now passed out of their power to preserve. He would either return as one of the entombed, or this would be his final battle, surrounded by the angry glow of the forges. Winterclaw was about to turn away when more machinery was hauled up by the chains, twisting and clanking in the ash-flecked air. He paused, gazing up at what Blademaker had chosen to drill onto the Dreadnought's outer skin. Ah, then. That is fitting. Cargrim watched the weapon arm sway over the platform, guided now by a dozen augmentic hands. Even deactivated, the long talons glinted eerily, as if itching to flex. That is no ordinary claw. How long has he kept that down here? It is the Great Wolf's weapon. Perhaps he knew the day would come. The two of them turned and went back the way they had come, pursued by the echoing noise of metal being sheared, beaten and cut. Somewhere, amid all the chanting and welding and hammering, the mortal remains of Bjorn lay in all their bloody vulnerability. Before the day was done, those fluids and organs would be decanted into new harnesses, fused to the reactor power heart of a dreadnought. I cannot imagine it yet. I would not know how to address it. Winterclaw snorted. The same as we ever did, if we do at all. The fell-handed. The great wolf. The hunt for Russ went on for years. One by one, the great companies left the Fang, pushing deeper into the void with every new attempt, spending longer out in the emptiness, taking more risks, following up less promising leads. The mood of them changed. In the early days, the Yars had laughed about the honor of finding the Primarch, thinking of the moment when they would return in triumph, Russ at their side, and bearing the spoils of whatever quest he had accomplished. It took a long time for those laughs to die away, and for the thought, the terrible thought, to take root. But he wasn't coming back. Bjorn had not been on those first missions. He had remained in the towers on the mountain, telling himself that he would hear the news of the Primarch's return at any stage. Whenever he closed his eyes, all he saw was the grey face of his master on that final night. And all he heard were the words, Not you! The chapter had not only lost its gene sire, it had lost his entire retinue, the Primarch's Wolfguard, the finest and the best of Fenris. No decisive mark of their void trajectory ever leaked back, and so all they had were distorted stories from unreliable sources, leads that soon went cold or sent them on fruitless quests into the obscure reaches of the Imperium. It was a time of change, the last of the traitors had been harried back to the Eye, and a hundred thousand worlds were being resettled. Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator fleets were forging new paths into the dark, searching obsessively for knowledge lost in the years of fire. The new Imperial Guard was raising garrison after garrison, marching out in battle groups almost as huge as those of the Great Crusade. The old legions had their own rebuilding to do. Gilliman's sons in the remnants of their brutalized star empire, the lions pursuing their own occluded purposes, the angels taking out their rage on new enemies, the Xenos, the witch. All of those armies had already lost their masters and so had little sympathy for the barbarians of Fenris who had once thought themselves watchers over the faithfulness of them all. In the end, Bjorn had not been able to resist. He had taken a ship half believing that he alone would be worthy to track down the Primarch's spoor. He had travelled further than any other, skirting the edge of known space, plumbing the insanity where the abyss met the ether, taking his ships beyond the light of the Astronomicon to where the stars themselves burned with strange fires. In his hearts, of course, he guessed the truth. Russ had known he was not coming back. Why else would he have said what he had said? 
Already, those words were being engraved on tablets in the dusty vaults of imperial scriveners, ossifying into legend with terrifying speed. For all the imperial populace venerated the memory of the Primarchs, in truth, many were glad to see them slip into the past, to become something they could worship in the abstract without fearing that they would once again rise up to unleash a tangible terror. By the time he returned to the Hearthworld, Bjorn had heard all the stories. He had heard that Russ sought out the Lion to make amends for their old feuding, that he fought in eternal combat with a resurrected cadaver of Horus, that he searched for the Tree of Life to heal the Emperor's soul, that he was imprisoned in the heart of a hollow sun and tormented by his old adversary Magnus, that he had passed beyond the boundaries of space and time and now roamed among the gods, ready to return when needed, accompanied by the fallen of his legion, sundered in a paradise of warriors. Bjorn came back to Fenris in the depths of Hellwinter, when the world shivered in the iron grasp of kilometre-thick ice, and the flanks of the mountain creaked and snapped like old bones. He strode up through the empty halls of the Valgard, the torches burning low and drear, and entered the Primarch's old chambers at the very summit. Though he had done it a hundred times before, he paced and rummaged through what had been left behind, kicking through the dust. By then, there was nothing to retrieve. Russ had left no books, no records, no vid captures of his final thoughts. The chambers were spare, ringing with emptiness, the air tasting of burned-out embers. For many hours he was undisturbed. In the end, only one came to disturb his torpor, a warrior as young as Bjorn had been at the outbreak of the heresy, inducted into the chapter with no memory of the old legion, only a zeal for the new order, a burning desire to prosper in a new imperium of high lords and inquisitors. So it was that Thrain, the one they called Winterclaw, stood under the open archway leading into Russ's empty rooms, glaring openly at the fell-handed. What do you want? Bjorn flexed the lightning claw that had become his totem. They say you are back for good, Lord. I came to see if they spoke right. Bjorn shook his head dismissively and resumed his trawl through what little remained of Russ's belongings. He barely knew the name of the wolf before him, only that he had been marked for the priesthood and would take his training under the eyes of the fleshmakers. That does not concern you, whelp. Go back to your slabs. Winterclaw remained where he was. And I came to speak sense to you, since no others will. Bjorn's head snapped up and his talons twitched. Go now. Or do you wish me to give you a lesson in pain? You could not harm me more than you harm yourself. It cannot go on. For a moment, disbelief stopped Bjorn replying. Then he took a lone stride towards Winterclaw, bringing his claw into range. If you seek to goad me, you have picked a bad moment. Winterclaw gazed fearlessly at the rending spikes. You have been away for a long time. While your ships have been tearing the void, we have been rotting in the cold. End it now, for the love of Russ. Do not mention that name. Why not? Winterclaw's young face was disdainful. Your heart's pine. <laughs> Almost before he knew it, Bjorn punched out, catching the younger warrior and cracking him back against the wall. The movement was superb, a shocking display of casual power summoned up from nowhere. No one left alive in the chapter could move like that, and the gap had yawned further since Russ's retinue had gone. Bjorn had always been alone. Now the isolation was aching. Dare not to make me truly angry. Bjorn loomed over the reeling outline of Winterclaw. I would gut you in a heartbeat. Winterclaw smiled dryly and pushed the claws from his face. I do not doubt it. This is not about me. You know who gnaws at your soul. Of course I know! I have known it ever since he chose me. He shoved Winterclaw away, making the priest's acolyte stagger into a weapon rack, bereft of blades. Bjorn whirled around, hurling the detritus of his old master's belongings across the room, smashing the empty scabbards against the walls, lashing out with both fists. I know what he was doing. 
He has left his chapter a nursemate. One to watch over them in his absence. Just one link to the past. To the age that he and his brothers so majestically turn to skidduck. He smashed up another piece of the past. Ah! And of all the many treacheries, that is now the deepest. For I would have followed him into the maw of hell. And he knew it. And he knew that I would not question the order. Not until it was too late. Winterclaw got back to his feet, watching soundlessly as Bjorn destroyed what was left of his Primarch's possessions. Bjorn reached for a bag of knuckle bones, the kind used to scry the runes. For a moment he stared at them, remembering a time he had seen them cast across the ritual circle. Then he crushed them in his gauntlet. And what is this inheritance? Nothing! We have no book of laws. We have no empire. We have no respect. We are feared and we are hated. And that is the legacy of Lehman Rust to his people. The galaxy is being reborn around us. And he is nowhere in it. Winterclaw picked his way closer. Carefully. They are saying the Wolf Lords will go their own way now. There is nothing to hold them together. Bjorn stopped, his breathing heavy. Who says this? <laughs> it has been whispered in the Fang for years, but you are not here to listen. And now they do not even bother to whisper. He drew closer, looking at the disarray. They would listen to you. All know that Russ chose you. We can still follow an order if we know who is giving it. <laughs> Lead yourselves. Why do you think he said nothing to you? Ask yourself, did he ever do anything without reason? Bjorn paused. The question had haunted him for years. Anything would have been better than that sheer absence. If he had given just one reason, one that he could have understood. Maybe he did not know where he was going. That got the sneer it deserved. <sighs> they still talk of that night. They say his face was like a spectre's. Whatever he had to do, it made him sick. Bjorn remembered. He remembered his own sickness as complete as black fever. The hall had been swimming with a dark energy, summoned from some well of fear the wolves had never suspected they had, or had buried or had given birth to in the arrogance of their great triumph. Bjorn slumped against the wall, his fury spent. He had been angry for years, and it had driven him nowhere but the hollow void. Now, surrounded by the ghosts of a half-empty fortress, all that remained was knowledge. Dreadful knowledge. He was always trying to draw me in. I was content in the shadow. But the summons would always come. He said he sensed a strange fate for me, the end of which he could not see. So he kept me close, as if he might be able to understand it, if only the firelight was strong about me. As he spoke, the days of the Great War came back to him, whispering around the gloom of the chamber. He saw the faces of Godsmote, of Two-Blade, of Gunhild. He remembered Prospero burning, its crystal cities shattered, its libraries a haunt of demon avatars. Despite all that had happened afterwards, that had been their greatest battle, the one that would define the chapter thereafter, a victory that was both their glory and their damnation. I told him we had been deceived. He would not believe it at first, but... He could not evade the truth forever. And I changed him. The way he killed was different after that. Winterclaw nudged his boot through the wreckage. He did not look awed by being in the Wolf King's old chamber. He did not look as if he would be awed by anything. So you say. For me, I cannot. I cannot with a 
Russ went into battle with a song in his heart, or whether he wept as he slew. Yorn <laughs> rounded on him, the anger returning so quickly. Wintercraw shouted, preempting the attack, standing defiant. For he is gone, brother! All of you are gone now, who ran and scampered at the whim of the Sigilite. Who brawled with your brothers. Who missed the reckoning on terror. Do I mourn that? Why should I? There are more battles now, and if we fight them, free of old men with their minds in the past, then that sits well with me. Not all of us are gone yet. Yes, that is right. Just one remains, who skulks around the void, hunting for his old master, begging to have the leash put back on. Bjorn drew his fist back clenched for the strike, knowing that killing the whelp would be trivial. Winterclaw made no move. He stared back, provoking, taunting. Slowly Bjorn lowered his gauntlet. He was being played so easily. Why was that? Had he lost his guile, along with so much else? You only say this because you were not there. The new breed. The warriors who had flocked to Azaheim in the rebuilding, how could they know? They had not seen the race of gods turn in on itself. They had not seen the Imperium torn asunder by the literal forces of hell and the glory of the Crusade dissolve into the nightmare of mutual hatred. And that is why you fight this. That age is over, Jarl. Let it go. You, though... He fought for the words. You are one of us. You are Fenrika. You have taken the trials. In that, believe me, you are better than him. The idea was so stark, so blasphemous, that Bjorn almost laughed out loud. But the whelp was being serious. Winterclaw stood before him, fearless, earnest, his amber eyes steady. You must be Wolf King now. They will follow no other. Yet again, they were dragging him into the center. A dozen other Jarls would have taken the honor with both hands, rushing to the annulus, eager for the glory of it. For him, though, the process had been slow, gradual, tectonic, pulling him from the edge, making him stand before the gathered chapter, their eyes on him, waiting, expectant. Had there ever been a time when he could have stopped it? There was only one Wolf King. There cannot be another. <laughs> then, then take another title! Think of something new! Bjorn looked around him. He could feel the force of the arguments hemming him in, trapping him. The chapter would fracture without him. They had looked for Russ for long enough. Something new would have to be found. An accommodation. An evolution. These would be his chambers soon. The dust would be driven out, his own weapons brought in. They would carve his pack markers on the stone. In time, it would be forgotten that the Primarch had ever dwelt there. He sensed the footfalls of fate overtaking him again. My titles were always given to me. Give it time. I'm sure the Skarls will come up with something. The interment took five days. During that time, Blademaker did not sleep. His thralls attended him the whole time, approaching with vials of sacred oils and leaving with slopping pans of blood. The forge machines thundered, powering the vast energy banks that kept Bjorn's life intact while his body was disassembled, rearranged, remade. Cargrim and Winterclaw were the only souls from outside Sledgeek's own retinue the Iron Priest suffered to remain in the chamber. The three lords met at the close of each arduous day when Sledgeek would give them his assessment of the work. Each time, Winterclaw would ask the same thing. He lives yet. Each time, Sledgeek's reply was the same, though there was never confidence in it. I, he lives. On the final day, the thralls were banished. The lake of magma burned sullenly, robbed of the fury that had accompanied Bjorn's arrival. Cables were withdrawn from blood cycler engines. Forges shuddered into silence. 
the three priests strode across the causeway deeper into the chamber of fire and iron under the shadow of the lifting machines and the metal shapers. Blade Maker's summons had come in the deep of the night during the hours reserved for meditation. Targrim had been engaged in attempts to scry Bjorn's fate, Winterclaw in his gene labs poring over the law of the Canis Helix. They had both responded instantly, recognizing the finality, knowing what it meant. They assembled among the stone columns. Bjorn's sarcophagus stood before them, complete, rid of the tubes and unguents that had surrounded it. The weapon arms had been attached, bolted onto the housings during placatory ceremonies. The hatches had been sealed, the faceplate drilled closed, the generator linked to the motive systems. For all that, it was still inert. No lights flickered along its flanks, no smoke coughed from the twin stacks. The slab of metal and gold was as inanimate as the columns that overshadowed it. He lives yet? Sledgek's reply was grating from exhaustion. I know not. Not yet. This is the moment. The mind impulse unit is dormant. I guessed you would wish to be here when I gave the command. Cargrim ran his eyes carefully over the dreadnought shell. Any sign? None. And there is only one way of knowing. Will you give me leave? Winterclaw looked up at the mighty face of the machine, the rearing wolf, the heavy lightning claw arm, and remembered how it had been with them 300 years ago in a dusty chamber at the summit of the Fang. You must be Wolf King now. They will follow no other. Do it. Sledgek raised his gauntlet and made a gesture in the air. It wasn't clear what his link to the machine was, but as soon as his armored fingers moved, something changed. The dreadnought systems growled into life. The hiss of pistons gave way to the grind of servos, followed by the throaty judder of the power coils keying up. Winterclaw watched carefully, his croziers clutched tight. Both his hearts beat hard. Nothing else happened. The machine was activated, ready for movement, but it remained stationary. A gilt screen of blank metal gazed back at them, giving no clue as to the state of the occupant within. Blade Maker, I sense nothing. Is he? Wait. Winterclaw felt the hairs on his arms suddenly prickling. The chamber seemed to swell with energy, and the magma in the shafts began to move. Wait. The dreams had been long and terrible. Everything had been cold, and for so long. It had not been the cold of Fenris, which for all its terror was a physical thing, but a deeper cold, one that pushed down through the bones and into the mind, cloying it, making it listless and freezing it into nothingness. In those dreams, he relived the deeds of the past in succession, the images marching past him as he remained motionless, cast adrift on a sea of pain. He saw the bad star falling from the skies of Fenris long ago and felt the wind on his face as he raced to meet it. He saw the demon creature on Prospero as the spires burned around them and heard it call out his wrong name. He saw the claw from Heraphnicle's forge and saw himself using it against Alpharius' snakes. He saw the final run to terror, the dark warships of the First Legion alongside them, and the first sight of the throne world wreathed in flames like ribbons of heart's blood. He saw Russ in the ruins of the Imperial Palace, the debates, the arguments, then the long journey back to Fenris and the dawning of the New Age. And then, last of all, he heard the words again, and they still have the power to kindle the fury the bewilderment, the grief. Not you! He reached out to Russ to haul him back, to stop him leaving the hall, but his grip fell short. He stumbled, he hit the stone floor, blood in his mouth. There was a lurch like the world falling away from him, tumbling into the abyss over and over. 
pain came back, rushing, hammering. He felt his eyes open again, the lids scraping over the whites. Except there were no eyes. He opened his mouth to scream, but there was no mouth. Just the agony, boiling through the few veins he still possessed. He clenched his fist, and something that was not his fist moved, heavy as bars of adamantium, massive, disconnected. A veil was lifted. Colors, sensations, stinks and sounds all came rushing back at him, bulging through nerve ends, spilling across his psyche in starbursts. He screamed again, and the sound shocked him, a machine roar, amplified, echoing, resounding as if he were buried alive within it. He tried to move, to lift an arm, to take a stride, and felt the world reel around him, heavy with inertia. He heard shouts in a language he knew and wondered if he had died indeed, and this was now the underverse where the ghosts sighed. Then the colours resolved themselves. Deep blacks, reds. Three lords of Fenris stood before him, clad in the battle plate of warriors. For a moment, he thought they were his judges, the choosers of the slain, come to take him back to Russ's side. But then they bowed all of them, sinking to their knees and offering obeisance. He wanted to shout at them, to demand to know what was happening. But then the full horror began to assert itself, and he remembered the beast, the moors, the ash plates of Morelion. One of the bowing figures stood up again. Bjorn knew him, Winterclaw, the priest's whelp. Though no longer a whelp, and now wearing the sacred rune marks of the chapter's elect. You are returned to us, Lord. And then Bjorn knew truly what had taken place. He flexed his muscles and felt fiber bundles twitch. He turned his head and felt the weight of slabbed shoulders shift. His vision was a multi-hued riot of false color mediated by targeting systems for weapons that were now as much a part of himself as his hearts, his lungs, his residual flesh. The chamber around him rang with fire and noise. They were saying more things, trying to get close to him. He heard summons. There would soon be more of them, crowding the chamber, ready to offer fealty, laying their weapons before him, just as the barbarians of the ice did for their chiefs. In that instant, he understood the lesson of the Hall of Warriors. It was the grief that had kept his spirit shackled to his corpse. It was the fury, burning star-hot over so many years, that made him cling to life with such tenacity. It was resentment that meant he could never leave the mortal earth as a warrior should, never take his place in the halls of the slain. They had used it. They had brought him back. Russ had told him once that he could not see Bjorn's fate. So, stubborn to the end, the Primarch had fashioned it for him, locking Bjorn into guardianship of the chapter that he himself had abandoned. This is eternal. He felt the raw, unmatchable power of the Dreadnought flood through him. I can never leave. I can never follow him. More of his brothers were arriving now, offering their salutes, crying out his titles. The Fell Handy, the Great Wolf. They were there in ranks, their weapons held high, a sea of steel grey amid the furnaces, devoted to him in a way that they had never been devoted to anyone before, not even the Primarch, who had not been born on Fenris, and who had been more god to them than Jarl. This. It is eternal. And so, as they cheered, as their joy spilled out into the vaults of Blademaker's kingdom, Bjorn lifted his new head, opened his new Vox amplified throat, threw wide the new lightning claw, and howled.
Ice Claw by Ben Counter, performed by Toby Longworth and Peter Noble. So, fully Ice Claw, I hear you gave a good day's battle. I wish I had witnessed it myself. The fight for Alaric Prime will demand many such days from all of us. Mm, my thanks, Wolf Priest. But you did not call me forth to congratulate me. Ulrich the Slayer does not give his time to such small talk. I do not. And you know why I must speak with you. About Lord Ragnar. You were at his side. You saw it all. It is my duty as senior wolf priest to examine the conduct of all space wolves, even the wolf lords. Or rune priests like yourself. Of course. And yet, the consequences of what I witnessed do not sit easy with me. I will deal with the consequences. Think only of the truth. Very well. The Greenskins had come at us not just on the ground, but from the air. Beheld the ridge of ruins and shell craters. A whole tribe of greenskins was arrayed against us. Tens of thousands of them seethed towards us in waves, as if the foothills had become an ocean of greenskin flesh. The Cadians held our flank and fended them off with last fire, as we did the same with our boulders. And at the heart of our line stood Wolflord Ragnar Blackmane. Space wolves! The orc is cunning! and without number, but he is still an animal. He has but one tactic in this battle, to spend the lives of his fellow Greenskins to find a weak point in our line. But he will not find it where the sons of Fenris hold their ground. And you, men of Cadia, they will not find it where you stand either, for there walks the Scorched Knight. Dyros Commander, the Scorched Knight. He alone had stood proud of the Knightly House's politic and pledged himself and his war machine to the fight when the first orcs landed. Ragnar Blackmane saw in Kamata a fellow hunter and asked that the Scorched Knight fight alongside him in person. Alongside space wolves and guardsmen of Cadia, and none of us are used to being the prey. For every Imperial loss, Baron Kamata, I will take ten orcish heads. Can you keep up with that? I have never turned down a hunter's wager yet, Blackmane. There is much scorn I could pour on the knightly houses, for their politics slowed the response to the Greenskin invasion and cost many lives. But they produced a warrior of the Scorched Knight's caliber, and so. I cannot show them too much this day. It was then that I received the Vox report from our Stormwolf wings in the air. Lord Backman, Thunderfall Squadron is pursuing a wing of orc aircraft. It's a bombing run. We have accounted for half their number, but they will still hit us hard. Then the green skin attacks were to keep us in place while they hit us from the air. It passes for a plan by their standards, but it will not work. Space Wolves! Cadians! Take cover! There were more aircraft than the Orcs should ever have been able to feel on Alaric Pratt. The Greenskin technology was possessed of some kind of mad genius that made those rusting crates airworthy. Dozens of bombs bore down on us. Hundreds of bombs fell. They hit the Cadians. They lost hundreds in moments. Good men. Brave men. I saw Lord Ragnar silhouetted by the firestorm as the worst of it came down. And then the box neck opened up. And I heard the voice of a scorched knight. Lord Blackman, my power plant is ruptured. Plasma is leaking into the thorax and the hatch is jammed. 
not looking too good from where I'm sitting. Hold fast! I shall be with you soon! My blood claws can make it! We will get you out of there! Everything around me is burning! My life is not worth the space wolves who will be lost if the plant goes critical! We had a fine hunt, Ragnar! Lord Blackman does not abandon his brothers! Hold fast and survive! We will be there! Damn it! Fetch me a jump pack! It was always going to end this way, Ragnar! This fight has served me well, but she does make for a tempting target. I'm amazed! When the smoke blew off the ridge, the destruction was terrible. Hundreds of Cadians had not reached shelter in time. They lay dead or dying in burning craters. But the most awful sight was the scorched night. It still stood, but the upper half of its chest was a melted ruin. The cockpit was gone. Dairos Kamata was dead. When I think back, I still cannot read what I saw on Lord Blackmane's face. It was as if his eyes were flecks of ice and his skin was of cold iron. For a moment, there was just silence. Then, he turned to me. Rune Priest, place the mark upon my blade. Frost Fang hungers. What rune should I strike, my lord? Vengeance. Greenskins are massing for another charge. Then be quick about it. It seemed I had placed a thousand runes on the weapons of my battle brothers while we fought for that ridge. I pictured a symbol of chill hatred, and I laid my hand on Frostfang's blade. The rune burned there in cold fire. I could feel the same rune burned across the heart of Lord Blackley. I could see the orcs approaching. Thousands of them in a green tide. In their midst was their warlord, the towering creature riding a tank festooned with gun turrets and blades. I could see its fangs bared as it grinned. I could see, through my sightless eye, the alien's joy at the prospect of slaughtering Space Wolf and Cadian alike. The sons of Fenris, the green skin, thinks we are defeated. He thinks we are weak, but all he has done is stoke in us the rage the whole galaxy has learned to fear. Ten orc heads are not enough for one imperial corpse. I will not take ten. I will not take a hundred nor a thousand. This rage will not be stoked until every greenskin on Alaric Prime is... Dead! I have seen the volcanoes that rise from the oceans of Fenris in the seas of the fire. I have witnessed storms that bring down mountains. But I have never witnessed such rage as burned inside Ragnar Blackmane then. And though I am a rune priest, I must always strive to keep my soul in check. I felt it too. Blackmane's rage is no mere anger, Wolf Beast. It is a force that floods into every Space Wolf. I wanted nothing more than to leap into the fray and kill every orc I could see. Forgive me. That anger burned in me. But what then, Uli? What of Blackmane? The Great Wolf Grimna was behind our lines leading the battle alongside the Imperial Commanders. I had access to the command box, and I heard his response. Black Maid, I have reports of an air attack on your position. What is your situation? The wounds have done no more than bloody our claws, Great Wolf. I am giving the order to charge. No. Black Maid, your orders are to hold that ridge. If the orcs break through the whole Imperial line could fall. The orcs have taken our lives for too long. The time has come to slaughter them. Ragnar, hold your position. Ragnar Blackmaid, in the name of Russ and the Allfather, your liege lord commands you to hold your position. I go now to extract the price of our dead in green skin flesh. Who is with me? Then charge! 
sons of Fenris, by fire and blade, by tooth and claw! Yeah! Even as the Cadians were pulling their wounded from the rubble, we abandoned their side and joined Ragnar's charge. Brother Einar's swift claws leapt into the saddles of their bikes and roared after him. The sky claws hurtled in his wake on their jump packs. Even the Grey Hunters and Longfangs, whose rage should have been tempered by the discipline of a veteran, ran from cover to join the fight. And of course, I was among them. It was the death of the Scorched Knight that spurred Blackmane's anger? So it seemed, but I am not certain. How so, Rune Priest? Whenever Lord Blackman was near, I could feel that rage inside him, under the surface. It was quiet while he kept it caged, but it was always there. I wonder now if it needed much reason to be unleashed. When the Scorched Knight fell, was it a terrible enough blow that it could only be answered with such anger? Or did the rage itself simply use Kamata's death as a trigger to take Dragna over? But what of the battle that followed? It was slaughter. What vermin are these that stand before me? I am Ragnar Blackmane. I am the young king of Fenris. What senseless animal thinks he can look upon me and live? Grinskins are without number, Lord Ragnar. I can see no end of them. Then cut them down until there are few enough to count. Stand by my side, Rune Priest. And should I die here, live on that the chapter might know of what I did. That one tasted sweet. But Frostfang is still thirsty! These aliens know our greatness, Uli Icecrow! See how they throw themselves on our blades! This one thinks he's clever. He's not so quick to charge in. He wants to find an opening. But Frostfang isn't my only weapon. These are the fangs and teeth! of a Fenrisian. The blade through the gut is too good for your green skin. A broken neck is all you get. Behind you, no drag now. They're pressing in on all sides. It's the war machine. The warlord is heading straight for us. Holy blood claws, keep them off me. This one's mine. The warlord was one of the biggest of its kind I have ever seen. Only the strongest and most vicious orcs ever get to lead a whole tribe to war. Lord Ragnar vaulted onto the tank and ran at it as if there was nothing else he wanted in this galaxy but to kill that green skin. It wielded a giant hammer. I was sure Ragnar would have to evade it or be crushed flat, but he caught the weapon on his chest and wrenched it out of the orc's hand. Then... Frostfang flashed. Those hands were sliced off. The warlord stared down at the stumps of its wrists. And that moment of shock was the opening Ragnar needed for the kill. Frostfang soared through the warlord's neck, and its head came free of its shoulders. Ragnar held the head up high so that all the tribe could see what had become of their leader. This is the one you followed across the stars to despoil this world? This is the Lord who made you cower? Look at it now, green skins, and know what you are. You are prey! So, Lord Ragnar had made good on his promise of revenge. Many orcs lay dead and their leader was among the slain. But then, I saw how much we had paid. Of Einar's swift claw pack, half lay dead, dragged down off their bikes and butchered on the ground. As I watched a grey hunter, cut off from his pack, was surrounded, beaten down, and torn apart. 
We had paid for this with Space Wolf lives. And there was worse to come. Ragnar, we are surrounded. The orcs have flooded in behind us and cut us off from the ridge. The Cadians could not hold our flank. We have pushed forwards too far. Then we fight on, Rune Priest. Even Ragnar Blackmane cannot kill them all. Then we die well. But what of the people of Alaric Prime? What of all the dead from defeats that would have been victories had we not died here? For revenge on this day, you have sacrificed our future. Half your great company stands here, surrounded by foes we cannot defeat. Was it worth throwing their lives away to brandish one orcish head? You spoke thus to him? I knew I had gone too far. It was my duty to follow my wolf lord into the jaws of hell, not curse him as a headstrong fool. But I could see nothing then save the bodies of my brother's space wolves trampled in the mud. What did Black Man say in reply? Nothing. He fixed me with a stare that could freeze an ocean. But then, the green skins found heart again. I felt their anger rise to a crescendo, and they charged. In the shadow of that war machine, I fought back to back with my space wolf brothers, and in moments my axe was heavy with gold. The orc bodies piled up into a rampart of the dead. But, though we might each kill ten of them, a hundred, eventually, they took one of ours. I saw Brother Halfrad, Gundar's Grey Hunter's pack, his head split open down to the collar by an orc's cleaver. The blood claws howled and countercharged whenever they opened up enough space, but each time they fell back with one of their number wounded or dead. I lost sight of Lord Ragnar, so dense was the press of orcs around us. Then, Above the gunfire and the cries of the wounded, I heard the sound of engines. Three Stormwolf gunships, wearing the livery of the Great Wolf Logan Grimnar, swooped down from the sky. And leaning from the ramp, I saw Grimnar himself, the Axe Morkai, in his hand. Black Maid, I see once more the Alpha Wolf must drag the headstrong whelp out of trouble. Much as I would love for you to learn your lesson. I cannot let my brothers die out here surrounded. My wolf guard will cut a path for you, back to our lives. I trust you can show enough sense, at least, to follow it. The great wolf brought with him three packs of wolf guard. Grimnar's own personal troops in Terminator armor. They were amongst the best warriors in our chapter. Our ranks cheered as they leapt down from their gunships. And did you cheer as well, Uli Iceclaw? Were you as relieved as your battle brothers? I do not know, Wolf Priest. True, where we had faced death, we now had a chance, but... With the certainty of death removed, my thoughts had leave to go elsewhere, and I saw how troubled I was. Ragnar was my wolf lord, the young king of Fenris. We idolized him. Already, my brothers and I had memorized his sagas and sought to emulate the skill and fury he showed in battle. But now I saw something else in Ragnar Blackmane. You speak of... Blackmane's rage. The rage that had cost so many lives and brought a whole great company so close to destruction. My brothers were dead. The Imperial line was compromised. All that could have been avoided. Had we held our ground, we could have weathered whatever storm the orcs threw at us. The cost would have been high, but we would have held. Imperial Command had a plan to shatter the army of orcs that faced us. Now, whatever that plan was, it was in tatters, for we had not played our part. 
Instead, we had followed a leader driven by headstrong anger, and many of us lay butchered in the mud because of it. This mighty Lord of Fenris, in whom I had seen the very exemplar of our chapter, now seemed to me no more than a berserker who would lead us all to a fruitless death. I have served as wolf priest for many years, Uli. Since before you were ever made a space wolf. And in that time my purpose has been to minister to the spiritual needs of my brethren. To watch for the sins of the mind that might lead them down a wayward path. And of those sins, one of the gravest is doubt. What you saw in Blackmane's conduct planted that doubt in you. That is what I must fight. Just as you fought the Greenskins. But how can I forget the sight of my battle brothers, torn apart by orcish hands? How can I ignore the despair I felt to, to know that we would die out there for nothing? Go on, Uli Iceclaw. Your tale does not end there. Grimnar and his wolf guard landed beside us. With the roar of assault cannon and storm bolters, they forced back the first ranks of the orcs. The storm wolves circled overhead, strafing the orcs or picking out their war machines with pinpoint fire. Then, Grimnar held the axe Morkai along so that all could see it. With me, sons of Fenris, we will cut a bloody canyon through this green skin flesh. Fight beside me, Uli! The rune you placed on my blade are still burns bright. It will take plenty more orc blood to douse that fire. And so I fought. I had lost count of the orcs I had killed, though they numbered a pittance compared to Blackmane's tally. We forged through the orc ranks, following the bloody wake of Grimnar and the wolf guard. Even as the green skins reeled, I saw one of the wolf guard fall. He was pulled down by a mass of orcs who used crude cutting torches to carve his armor apart. One of our finest lost to the chapter because Ragnar Blackmane had given in to his rage. We were within sight of the Imperial line. The Cadians had suffered badly and their fortifications were aflame, but they were still manned. The remains of the scorched night still burned. We were close. I let the hope kindle in my heart that we would survive this. But this battle was not over. A great shadow passed over us. I looked up to see an enormous war machine flying above us in a mockery of logic. From its hull hung hundreds of gibbets, each containing an Imperial Guard prisoner, stripped of his war gear, bleeding, and left there to die for the amusement of the orcs. Its gun turrets blazed and our storm wolves had to back away or be blasted from the sky. What you saw was called the Sky Gouger. It had led attacks on Imperial positions since the beginning of the war for Alaric Prime. Already it had gained a reputation like death itself, for wherever it went, it left just corpses. Imperial Command had tried to track it, but some Xenos technology made it invisible to our augurs. It was only seen when the Orcs wished to inflict punishment on Imperial forces, and they summoned it to punish the Space Wolves. The Sky Gouger. Hmm. So, that is what they called it. To us, it seemed a final insult. That orcs can even build something that flies is obscene enough. That it should intercept us just when our line was within sight. That seemed calculated to drain us of hope. Perhaps the timing was deliberate. Perhaps the orcs wanted us to know hope and then have it snatched away. So we would be weakened in the final moments by despair. But space marines do not know despair. No, Lord Priest. We do not. But the orcs were going to try their best 
to make us know it. Their assault forces launched from the Sky Gouger in their dozens. They were jump pack troops in black painted armor. Where most greenskins fought with wildness and savagery, these were disciplined and ruthless. They fell upon our grey hunters and blood claws, avoiding the guns and blades of Grimnar's wolf guard. Cannon on the Sky Gouger rained the fire, forcing our formation apart so the greenskin assault could isolate and butcher us. I saw the great wolf surrounded by seven or eight of them, keeping them at bay with great swings of the axe Morkai. The rest of the orcs took heart from the Sky Gouger's appearance, and they massed once more, ready to swarm and finish us off. No! Not now! Not when we are so close! It will not end this way, my brothers! You, Sky Claw! You are wounded! Can you fight? The young warrior did not respond. His right arm had been crushed, and though I knew that he would fight on with his teeth if needs be, the day's battle was over for me. Then give me your jump back! Lord Blackman, what are you doing? If I am to fall here, it will not be in the mud on my knees. It will be taking the fight to the enemy as a space wolf should. You will die! Not so, for I will not be alone. There lies another fallen brother. He will not fight anymore, but his war gear can still serve. Take his jump pack and follow me. The rune on my blade has grown dull, and I have need of a rune priest. Your wolf lord has spoken, Bully Ice Claw. I buckled on the jump pack. I knew what insanity this was, but my wolf lord had spoken. Was that the only reason you followed him? In truth, Wolf Priest, I cannot say. The Sky Gouger had drifted low to drop off its troops, low enough for a bound of the jump pack to reach it. Ragnar left before me. I barely made it onto the war machine. The hull of the Sky Gouger was crawling with orc drop troops, massing for the next wave. Ragnar dived into them, full of the fury that had caused him to abandon our lines. I felt, kindling in my heart again, that same fury. I had not thought it possible, for I had seen the cost of such recklessness, but I could not deny it. My mind was full of the battle brothers who had died that day, the blood claws and grey hunters slain as the orcs surrounded us, the wolf guard who had followed Grimnar's rescue mission, all butchered by green skin hands. And I wanted what Ragnar wanted. I wanted to kill them all. What alien eyes are worthy to look on a space wolf? Look well, for it is the last thing you will see. This is my rune axe, an extension of this psyche's mind. I hear your kind can fight on with a severed limb, but how can you fight when I sever your soul? That is the fate of all your kind, to be turned to red mist and ash. Well fought, rune priest. We must bring this metal beast down! Blackmane reached the prow of the Sky Gouger. He tore the canopy off the cockpit. The Orc pilot barely had time to show surprise before Frostfang took his head. I followed Lord Blackmane inside the hull. The stench was awful. Rotting meat and sweat. Gnawed bones and body parts were everywhere. The Sky Gouger had taken hundreds of Imperial Guard prisoners, and this was where they had died. Stunted versions of the Greenskin scurried away at our approach. Orcs tried to bar our way, but Blackmane was possessed with a rage. And so was I. It is an honor greater than your Xenos will deserve to die on Frostfang's blade. We should let one of you live to tell the other green filth of what happens when you make war on the Space Wolves. But not you! Press on, Wolf Priest! We need to find something this Hulk cannot fly without! But I did not see the shape in the shadows, looming up from the depths of the Sky Gouger's hole. It hit me before I could react. I saw an orc. One of their leaders by its size, perhaps even huger than the warlord Ragnar had slain. Around its neck hung a hundred dog tags torn from guardsmen's necks. It had taken their medals too, 
and wore them on its armored chest in a mockery of the brave men it had killed. On its head was a Cadian officer's cap, still stained with the blood of the man who had worn it. The orc's limbs were clad in black steel and each hand was a mechanical claw to tear and crash. The greenskin howled as if in mockery of the noble howls of our chapter and beckoned Ragnar forward. The wolf lord leapt. Black men and the orc commander clashed and they were matched in strength. In the confines of the Sky Gouger, there was only room to wrestle. In the open, Ragnar's swordsmanship might have cut the orc to pieces and left him open for the killing blow. But here, it was face to face. The claws seeking to grab and crash as the orc's bulk pinned Blackmane to the ground. My head swam and my body would not respond as I wished. I crawled closer. Fully, if this creature bests me, return to the chapter. Tell them how I died. But this time, I did not obey. I placed my hand on the side of Ragnar's breastplate. I willed there a room of defiance, of honor and fury, a symbol of the high kings of Fenris from an age remembered only by the stones. I dredged up every drop of will I had. My body was spent, but my mind was still a weapon. And as the claws crushed home, the rune flared bright. Fenrisian guile, beats Xenos and Space Wolf Steel beats everything! Frostfang pierced the Greenskin's heart. I saw the light go out in its eyes. I felt the rage-filled fires of its life extinguished as it fell to the deck. Ragnar paused to help me to my feet and rampaged on through the carrier. The Greenskins' resolve was shattered as they saw their commander fall, and they fled before us as Lord Blackmane tore engines and fuel lines apart. I felt the sky gouger lurch. Go, Rune Priest. It is time to leave. As we leapt from the carrier and our jump pack slowed our descent, I watched the sky gouger falling in flames. It crashed into the heart of the orcs. I saw a thousand of them die in that storm of flame and wreckage. The orcs fled from us. The great wolf led the way back to the Imperial lines with Lord Ragnar fighting by his side. When we reached our positions on the ridge, I saw the Cadians rejoicing that the Sky Gouger had fallen and the orcs had been so thoroughly beaten. But you did not rejoice, Uli Iceclaw. Though your battle brothers cheered the deaths of so many greenskins, I see no joy in your face. No, good priest. I thought only of my brothers who had fallen, and of how the rage of Ragnar Blackmane was scarcely less responsible for their death than the greenskins. But you do not have the perspective of a wolf priest. You saw Ragnar's rage bring the Space Wolves to the edge of defeat. But what did you see when Ragnar boarded the Sky Gouger? You felt that same rage then, and you saw what it did to the enemy. Do you think anyone else could have brought down the Sky Gouger? It was Ragnar's rage that made it possible. That anger cost us many lives, but it also brought us a victory where nothing else could have. Then it is no surprise for you to hear of what his rage can do. It is not. Long ago, we looked on the young Ragnar Blackman, promoted to the Wolf Guard directly from the Blood Claws, an unheard of feat. We knew what would happen if he ever rose to the position of Wolf Lord, of how many of our brothers would pay for his anger with their lives. But we also saw how many victories it would bring us, how many enemies would fall before it who would otherwise survive. 
and we decided the price of his recklessness was worth the victories it would bring us. I have but one question for you, Ulrich. If I may. Speak on, Rune Priest. You say the Wolf Priests made a decision on Ragnar's fitness to serve as a Wolf Lord. But if the cost becomes too high, if the chapter suffers too greatly from his rages, could that decision be reversed? The orcs are charging again. Look fast, Rune Priest. We need all Battle Brothers on the line. Sons of Fenrir! The orcs will not stop until this world is barren and despoiled. But when the smoke has cleared and the blood soaked into the earth, it is the space wolves who will be standing atop a mountain of orcish dead. Doomseeker by Nick Keim, read by Ramon Tickram and Toby Longworth. The first cut was a straight line. It drew blood and carried a sting that banished innovation as the wound reopened. Barak. Garrick. The second was at a slant. It brought savage pride and revulsion to his gorge that this hunt was not yet ended. Thorgard Magni. The third crossed the other two. It went deep, right to his hot, beating heart. It brought him to purpose, so he would not rest until the deed was done. Afka. Skog. Fenrir. The final cut was jagged. A sore toothed tear in his skin. Here then was wrath and retribution with clenched fist and bared teeth, as the face of his quarry came to mind. Hack me, hack me. It had been so long since he had spoken, since he had needed to speak, that his voice came out in a rasp. Seven names for warriors dead, committed forever to memory and now to flesh. One for a warrior lost, is reckoning at hand. Ice was already rhyming Skelm's exposed forearm, sealing the freshly cleaved wounds. A skirling wind was coming from the north, carrying thick snowdrifts that did little to impede his hunter's senses. Rising from his haunches, Skelm let the storm thrash him. He closed his eyes and listened, drinking in every scent sifting through the cold for something familiar, something he could track. Blue-gray power armor turned to white in seconds, clumps of snow sticking to the hoarfrost already crusting the battle plate. He would wait for hours if necessary. The space wolf had waited for six days already, delving deeper into Scorbad's ice wastes, trekking across swathes of tundra and vast frozen lakes that shimmered like panes of frosted glass, cracking underfoot with every step. At last, he detected a moat of something not born of the ice and cold. It was flesh and fur, the faintest redolence of a former brother turned feral by his genetic heritage. I am your wolf. Nearby, an axe blade stood up half buried in the ground. No mortal man could have put it there, or likewise retrieved it. Skelm clenched the leather-bound haft 
with hairy knuckled fingers and wrenched the weapon free with a single grunt of effort. I am Lone Wolf! He fought the wind and its growing ferocity, cowing it with his bared fangs. Reaching over his bare shoulder, he took a makeshift shield from his back. It was fashioned from the door of a broken drop pod, a section of it at least. The slab-sided capsule was the last sign of life Skell had seen for hours. It had no markings, just iron grey, like the streaks in his black beard. But it was smashed open, as if whatever it had once harboured had broken loose. Skelm cared not. He knew his prey and would seek it out or die in the attempt. Agnin! Doom has come! It has come for you, brother! Shrieking wind answered, and within it something not of Squalbad. This sound brought a feral smile to Skelm's lips. A howl carried on the breeze, one he had heard before. Throwing back his head, Skeln howled back. Challenge accepted. Then he ran, hard and fast into the wind and snow. Featureless white gave way to rugged grey rock and slabbed steps that rose up into a fearsome mountain crag. Here, then, is where you have made your lair, brother. He looked up as far as a dense bank of cloud obscuring the summit. The wind had died down but was louder, funneled through the peaks and caverns of the mountain. There was no pass or causeway, only a sheer-sided ice cliff that Skeln hoped would lead to a vantage where he could better gain his bearings. Standing at the foot of the cliff, First mentally mapping his route with the hand and footholds he could see, he secured his weapons to his armor and began to climb. Ice caked rock crunched under his powerful grip even without the strength of his gauntlets. Like his arm greave and van brace and one pauldron on his left side, he discarded his gauntlets to better embrace the fury of the elements. As a pup, he'd endured worse on Fenris. Whilst stalking the mountains of the Maelstrom for Fenrir, he was almost naked and carried a long Fenrisian blade on his back as protection. It was a false comfort, of course. No weapon could protect a warrior against a thunder wolf if the beast wanted you dead. He had defeated Fenrir through tenacity, strength, and eventually dominance. Shackling the beast but never fully taming it, he had won its respect and bent it to his will. Now Fenrir lay dead. A frozen corpse far behind him outside the ruins of Hellspire, where he had left the rest of his pack. A rot had set into this world, claiming the lives of his brothers and their mounts. They had come to destroy a plague, to burn it with a conflagration that even the ice of this frigid land could not resist. Blackened was the crater they had left behind. Seven graves attended it. Skelm would add an eighth. The fate of Hagnan's beast was unknown, but it was likely dead too, devoured by its former master. Skelm snarled at the thought of it as he clung to the cliff face, releasing a wet leopard growl to vocalize his displeasure. The hunt does not end until you or I are dead, brother. His breath ghosted the air with the heat of the threat. Above him, the cracked rock was thick with crevices, crags, and small fissures. It made for an easy climb, and as Skelm peered through the enveloping mist, he thought he discerned the edge of a plateau. Grinning, he was about to carry on when the scent of something strange and unfamiliar pricked his nostrils. For several days he had acclimatized to Scorbad, grown accustomed to its sounds and smells, like any wolf would familiarize itself with its territory. Any foreign sensation to that established geography would stand out like the reek of a corpse. But it wasn't putrefaction that made Skelm halt his ascent. It was an acerbic aroma, like acid bile on his tongue or ammonia making his eyes water. He licked his canines, snarling at the taste. 
and released his right hand so he could untether the axe on his back. Holding on one-handed, Skelm listened to the tone and cadence of the mountain. Lone Wolf! The wind answered his announcement, howling and shrieking through the mountains as before. As he thumbed the stud on the end of his axe's pommel to activate the weapon's power field, Skelm caught sight of something scaling down the cliff towards him on all fours. It was fast, and hard to see even with the Space Wolf's preternatural senses. A shadow darted through the fog, which had grown up and thickened around him as if the mountain itself was his enemy and this monster's willing ally. He whistled to taunt the beast. Come on, then. Skelm tracked the shadow creature's movements, urging it to attack as his mouth filled with hot, wet saliva. His grip on the mountain vice-like, he swung the axe around in his free hand, loosening his wrist. It hummed through the air, tiny droplets of mist fizzing sharply against the energized blade. I will cut you open, spill you into the air, red and warm as I murder make. And as Skeln eyed the approaching shadow, already crafting the attack he would use in his mind's eye, it vanished. One second the shadow was there, prowling towards him, a low growl on its lips, and then it was gone. A mocking silence fell, and in it Skelm roared. Coward! He smacked the flat of his blade against the cliff, spitting out sparks of electrical discharge and fragments of rock to vent his frustration. The warrior I knew would not bulk from a fight. Come on, you craven beast! Or are you, too? The shadow returned, flitting across Skelm's vision in a dagger slash of blackness, and like smoke, it was gone again, but left behind knifing pain in the space wolf's flank. Agony supplanted anger, and crying out, he clutched his wounded side. Four deep tracts had been carved through plate and flesh, oozing crimson. Skelm bit his lip, drawing blood. The taste of it filled his mouth, provoking his feral aspect. His incisors grew, a savage tattoo thrumming in his heart. His ears pricked up to listen for danger. Flared nostrils analyzed every smell, trying to pinpoint the one that would give his attacker away. Eyes narrowed. A snarl rumbled from deep within his belly as he looked around slowly for any sign of his assailant. No boast this time. No foolish attempts to goad his old warrior brother. Hagnin had his scent so Skill knew he was at a disadvantage. He turned, putting the cliff at his back and his solitary handhold at an awkward angle. The risk was worth it. Cold stone Skell knew would not betray him as the mist had. He whistled again, long and low, a reminder to his quarry that he was still the hunter. Something scurried above him, lightning fast, a smear of black against grey before it was gone craning his neck, acutely aware of the lactic acid building in his shoulder while it supported his entire weight, Skelm searched the grey. Nothing. Three turns of his axe brought a low power hum emanating off the blade. Impatience gnawed at his resolve. Ice was clinging to Skelm's body in a thick veneer, merging him with the mountain. Soon, he would become just another gnarled crag, jutting from the face encased by merciless cold. Uh, uh, waiting. When the second attack came, Skelm was ready. He smelled the creature before he saw it dank and the cervic lashing out with his axe a moment later. A shriek of pain rewarded his efforts as the blade bit, but only barely. In the same instant, Skelm was mauled, pain flaring bright and hungry in his shoulder and neck. The blow was so swift, he'd been unable to discern the nature of his attacker. More pressing concerns presented themselves. Blood was pumping redly from his neck, and he dropped the power axe as his fingers went numb from the shock, translated down his shoulder. Disarmed, he thought about his knife, but dismissed it as a last resort only. Strength fleeing his body with every drop of blood shed, Skelm realized he couldn't stay on the cliff. Surprise attack be damned, he had to climb. Hand over hand, claws digging deep into the rock, Skelm reached the rocky shelf as a third attack threw him up over the lip 
and onto the plateau itself. He sprawled, tumbling badly across jagged ground and came to a halt when his back and arm struck unyielding stone. The heavy impact sent a tremor up the mountainside that resonated all the way to the summit. Skelm had barely blinked the red flashes from his vision when a loud crack sounded from above. It grew in ferocity, loud as a battle cannon by the time he had pulled himself up onto one knee. Eyes wide, Skelm gazed into the moor of a white abyss, descending like a hammer from on high. Very Ice, rock and snow, the avalanche smashed into him. Darkness claimed his sight quickly, his last image that of a shadow staring at him through the fog. Hard to tell with all the noise, but Skelm could have sworn it was mocking him. Silence fell after that, silence and cold, as the space wolf's world was swallowed whole. A long hall stretched out before him, seemingly without end. Skeln was standing at its threshold, and he had no knowledge of how he got here or what was behind him. Tall, angular columns punctuated a broad processional of flagstones etched with runes along either edge. Cooking meat, the aroma of wheat and fermentation resolved on a shallow breeze that beckoned him forwards. Slow but steady, Skelm made his way along the path. As he walked, he saw statues between each of the columns set into giant, magnificent alcoves. They were warriors of the rout, but not armoured in ceramite or clasping bolters. Rather, they wore leather and scale, great cloaks of fur or hooded wolf pelts. In their marble fists, they clenched spears, swords and clubs. It was only then that Skelm realised his own attire had changed, that he too was dressed in more ancient garb that echoed the trappings of his statuesque forebears. What is this place? At the end of the processional, a brazier pan ignited into roaring flame and a massive wooden throne was revealed in the light. It is my hall. A king was sitting upon the throne, his arms banded in torques, his van braces polished bronze and a gilded crown upon his brow be nothing other than this hall's liege lord. I am Skelm, of the Space Wolves. Despite himself in the face of this ancient king, he did not sound certain. The king shifted forwards on his throne, smiling fairly, as if regarding a packmate. I know who you are. As he got closer, Skelm noticed how muscular the king was how broad his back and shoulders were, like the slabs of a mountain. A necklace of tooth and claw rested upon his huge chest, which rose and fell quickly, as if his metabolism was burning at an exponential rate. His wild hair was fair and unkempt, an immense wolf's head draped over one meaty shoulder. Standing only a few handspans away, Skeln realized the king was even larger and more powerful than him. You are no mere man. He wanted to reach out and see if this apparition was real, but became suddenly wary of extending a hand towards the Alpha Wolf. I am cast in my father's image, a warrior of the rout, a son of Fenris. Indeed you are. The king smiled again and nodded to the ground at Skelm's feet, where before there was rune-engraved stone, now a pool of ice shimmered in its stead. Look into the ice, Skelm. Tell me what you see. Unable to do anything except obey, Skelm looked. At first there was only ice, so pure and crisp, it was almost silver in color. A ripple from some unfelt breeze disturbed the surface. Impossibly the ice moved, and where before there was nothing, suddenly there was depth. And Skelm was peering into the fathoms of a vast lake. Down he went, down into the deeps, his senses clouding, his heart beating harder, his lungs fighting for breath. At the bottom of the lake something moved. It uncoiled like a black serpent, camouflaged by the inky resolution of the water. Leviathan, kill it, no wolf. Kill it, my son.
Skeln awoke. He was trembling. His entire body gripped with a fever that drenched his skin in sweat. Kept at bay by the cold, pain returned to his body as a nearby fire banished away numbness. Where is this? Skeln had no strength for further words as they died in his throat. Breathing was difficult, as if a land raider was balancing on his chest. He could barely move his limbs. Even the slightest twitch of his fingers brought searing agony, so he kept still instead and heeded his senses. There was darkness, but not so thick his eyes couldn't penetrate it. Stalactite speared down from a rocky ceiling. The ground beneath him was hard and cold. Beyond, the wind still howled and chilled the beading sweat upon his brow to make him shiver. I am in a cave. With revelation came remembrance of the avalanche that had crushed him. The compacted ice and rock smashing into his body, bones broke, blood welled up in his mouth. Nerve endings on fire. Agony. Someone or something had dragged him clear. A rescue or a search for food. Trying to rise was a mistake, but he caught the vague impression of a hunched silhouette regarding him from the shadows before he fell back down. Half delirious from pain, Skelm drifted off in a fevered slumber. His dreams were dark, laced with red and reeked of blood. Wake. Skelm blinked, unsure if he was still dreaming or if he was back amongst the living. Wake. The voice echoed in the cave, a low growl that lifted the hackles on the back of the space wolf's neck. An ache seized his entire body, as if he was tenderized meat only just off the butcher's block. But most of the pain had subsided. Inching up into a sitting position, he grimaced and reached for his knife when he saw the silhouette watching him from the darkness. It was broad, armored and carried a palpable threat that Skelm had reacted to instinctively. A warrior. Who are you? Amber-colored eyes with a black pupil and iris were revealed in the darkness as the warrior leaned forwards, framed by a hirsute face. You are Fenrisian? You have been sleeping for almost three days. He slipped back into the shadows. It is time you rejoin the hunt. Though still wary, Skelm released his grip on the knife. Who are you? Did you drag me from the ice? Rising from his haunches, the warrior turned. Come. Skelm bared his teeth, growling. You should not show your back to a wolf. His feral anger felt natural, as if a part of him buried deep underneath was pressing against the confines of his skin, stretching it clawing at it. Were his fangs longer? His nose more like a snout? What of the hair on the back of his neck, around his face and on his hands? The darkness made it hard to tell, but even that was being stripped away as his senses cut through it. As he walked away, the warrior called out. Wounded, you are of little concern to me, brother. The odor of wet fur and copper was left behind, and Skelm snorted at the stench. It was familiar. Unmistakable. Not possible! Skelm awoke for the second time, and realized he was still in the cave. It must have been another dream. Wolfen cannot speak, and this one just had. Yet he saw the fire that was made for him and the fresh paw prints leading off to a ragged circle of light a little way ahead. The entrance to the cave was blanketed with snow, ice clinging to its edges. A growl rose up from Skelm's gut, spilling out from his throat as a scowl curled his lip. Agnin! Staggering at first, but swiftly regaining his composure, Skelm ran out of the cave mouth. Knife clutched in his fist. He emerged from the darkness into a storm. Eddies of snow were swirling in every direction, creating a howling and impenetrable wall of white. It hit him like a sledgehammer. But the space wolf recovered quickly. Belatedly, Skelm became aware of the poultice gumming his armor where Hagnan had slashed him open, and an earthy daubing around his shoulder and neck. 
Why his brother had saved him and nursed him back to health was unclear. Perhaps he wanted to fight another Fenrisian on even terms. And Skelm could not fault the honor in that. That Hagnin had killed his own in a feral rage. True, the blood of the entire pack was not on his claws. But enough was. As he teetered on the edge on a sloping cliff which the cave crowned at its summit, a red haze fell over Skelm. But unlike the chilling veneer of arctic white swathing the mountains, this was the second skin of burning red that seared nerve endings and boiled in his heart. Heavy thunder filled his ears, and it took him a few moments to realize it was the sound of his own blood beating around his body. Wrath seized him, and he clenched his fists. He would rend Hagnin, tear him, rip off his limbs, feast on his flesh. Skelm gasped, appalled at the visceral images filling his mind as the flood of sensation almost overwhelmed him. Forcing his breath to slow, he studied his heart, and the crimson haze ebbed, but did not abate. An abyssal chasm lay below him, only a few steps away. In his haste, he had almost plunged headlong into it. A certain doom, even for a space wolf. <laughs> Skelm snarled. Hagnan must have descended. Though he left no easy spore to follow, there was no other way off the cliff. Dropping to his haunches, Skelm closed his eyes and breathed deeply through his nose. He then lapped the air with his tongue, tasting it, analyzing. Subconsciously, both his hands touched the ground, and in the feel of the earth and rock was the remnant of something passing. Satisfied he had found Hydnin's trail, Skelm gave a snort of pride before descending. Even surrounded by the storm, he could see there was a snow-shawled valley a little way from the nadir of the chasm its ugly peaks shouldering each other as they crowded around it. High up as he was, there were just shadows, but crouched down, Skelm could smell water and taste the stagnant depths of a frozen lake. No distance from me will ever be far enough, brother. He climbed, hurrying in Hagnin's wake. On the ground outside the cave was a knife, Skelm's knife, now discarded and forgotten. Reaching the bottom of the chasm took several hours, it was a deep trench, fraught with razor-edged splinters of rock and numerous dead drops. He saw no fauna, no creatures of any kind, and wondered if they were in hiding from the apex predator in their midst. Either way, by the time Skelm was on the ground again, he was cut in several places and in a foul mood. Hagdon! I will slit your bestial throat! He beat his chest in anger as the desire to rip his brother apart tried to return. Skelm suppressed the urge, reciting the names of his fallen kin to fortify him. Malik, Derek, Thorgard. A distant howl interrupted Skelm's reverie. It came from the direction of the lake. Ears pricked, he loped after the sound, ropes of spittle stringing from his mouth in anticipation of the kill. Breaching the craggy rocks at the edge of the lake, Skelm saw his prey at last. Sheltered by the lumpen peaks, the storm was less turbulent in the valley, and a strange sense of stillness pervaded the presaged violence to come. Hagnan was standing directly in the middle of the frozen lake, his long arms by his sides, his eyes flashing like tiny amber flames. Skelm jutted his chin at his old brother, now greatly changed by the Karnas helix. Wolf! Hagnin bowed his head, slow and with respect, but not obeisance. A shaft of moonlight pierced the roiling cloud above, bathing Hagnin in a lance of pearlescent silver. Thick fur shawling his immense, grotesquely muscled body turned from dark brown to grey in the transformative light. He was much altered from the space wolf he once was. A long snout replaced his mouth, and savage claws had taken over from nails and fingers. Fangs as broad and long as daggers jutted from his bestial mouth. Hagnin's back was arched too, as if it was difficult, even unnatural, to stand on two legs. Upright, he was over three meters tall. Hagnin snarled, revealing the yellow saliva-drenched bone of his canine teeth. Skell snapped 
You slew your own kin, monster! A low growl escaped Hagnin's lips in what might have been regret. Slowly, he began to remove the last vestiges of his broken armor, the few pieces of plate and scale that remained. Underneath, gross and overbulked muscle protruded. With every scrap of metal he shed, Hagnin appeared to grow. A snarl of pleasure ripped from his throat to be free of these human trappings as he crouched before Skelm, naked and hunched. Their eyes met, only a shimmering pane of ice between them. Skelm hawked and spat and readied himself to charge. You should not have dragged me from the ice, brother. Prepare to die! Then he ran at Hagnin, unleashing an ear-rending howl. Throwing back his lupine head, Hagnin echoed him and loped into a countercharge. Near the lake's edge, they clashed, the wolf and faster and more violent because of his metamorphosis. Skelm was punched off his feet and thrown back, skidding across the ice. Coughing up a goblet of blood over his beard, he tried to rise but stumbled. I am Lone Wolf! He raged, trying to fuel his body with enough anger to stand, and in so doing, he let in the beast that had been clawing at the inside of his skin, eager to get out. Skelm's head snapped up and he met Hagnin's gaze, who was just a few steps away. The wolfen was crouched on all four limbs, watching. Amber eyes, black pupils and iris, remembering the dream of the ancient king, Skelm looked down and in the perfect ice saw Hagnin's eyes with a mirror of his own. He noticed a slight pronunciation of his nose and mouth, a lengthening of his canine teeth, a thickening of the hair around his face. <coughs> the growling voice that spoke barely sounded like his anymore. Something else resolved through the ice, something awoken by their brief struggle. It was dark and uncoiled like a serpent drowned in fathoms of ink black. Skelm looked up again. Hagnin was staring at the shadow too. He could barely speak. Skelm saw murder in his brother's eyes. It had been meant for him, until the thing beneath the ice had stirred. Now he noticed something else too. Kinship. The hope of a pack remade. Hagnin sprang back as the ground beneath him exploded in a flurry of razor-edged shards. The dweller below was serpentine, an oily film coating its gelid flesh. It stank and made Skelm's eyes water as he backed away from the cracking ice. Sensing prey, it snapped at Hagnin with a beak-like mouth, but shrieked in pain as Skelm ripped. Thrashing, the creature tried to turn, but Hagnin had already sunk his fangs into its flesh, rending and tearing. A bleat of panic snorted through the gill pits in the side of its snake-like head as it realized its easy meal was anything but. Skelm saw the beast's weakness at once. Drag it from the water! Hagnin seized it in his claws as Skelm punched his smaller talons into the beast's opposite flank. Together, they pulled. Shrieking, mewling, spitting inky black blood from its savage wounds, the creature was dragged from its frozen refuge and up onto the ice. Slowly, as the wolves tore at it, the beast lost the will and strength to fight, and as the moonlight touched it, it began to shrivel into a wasted husk. When it was done, Hagnin threw back his head and howled in triumph, and after a few moments, Skelm joined him. He had meant to kill his former brother, thinking him a monster, a curse that walked. But as their amber eyes had met, he realized he had become that which he hunted. Already, he felt the grip of transformation upon him. And he realized then that he had not been dreaming in the cave. He had understood Hagnin because they were the same. It would not be long now. He should be ashamed to be cursed, to have succumbed to the wolf within. But he was glad. A lone wolf no longer. He had gone in search of prey and instead found a pack.
Even the thick storm cloaks and arctic body gloves could not keep out the cold entirely, and Rake shivered as he stood alongside his master. A heavy gale was blowing a snowstorm that turned blood to ice. Inquisitor Zan squatted by the broken hatch of the drop pod, a vox corder in his hand. Weathering and environmental scarring suggest the creature has been at large for several years. Even with advanced xenoevolutionary data, there is no way to accurately predict either its size or mutagenic cycle. Prognosis is dire, however. Threat extreme. Suggests possible death watch deployment. Grunting with the stiffness in his back and the whine of augmetics in his legs, Zand stood up. There's little more to gather from the crash site, Interrogator Rake. I suggest... But Rake wasn't listening. He was staring at the two gigantic wolves regarding them from a snowy ridgeline in the distance. He reached for his plasma carbine, but Zand put out his hand to stop him. He glanced at his master uncertainly. But the wolves... The Lord Inquisitor had spent some time with the sons of Fenris, and he knew their kind well. Those are no mere wolves. Zand slowly backed away, lowering his gaze but never losing sight of the two massive beasts. Follow me, Acolyte. Do as I do. Rake obeyed, but was still confused. What about the Tyranniform? The Shouldn't creature we... is dead. Trust me on that. They retreated, not daring to look away from the wolves until the snow reclaimed them and they were lost to the storm. A howling followed them. A fierce territorial sound that echoed with power and pride across the tundra. This realm is ours, it said. This place belongs to the wolves. Death Wolf, a Space Marine Battles audio drama by Andy Smiley. Performed by Sean Barrett, Rupert Degas, Chris Fairbank, Charlotte Page, and David Timpson. Produced by Heavy Entertainment for Black Library. into real space with a wet hiss. What the...? Komor thrust his ice-cold talons up into the human's abdomen. Komor drew substance from the human's terror, feeling the warm touch of his heart before it stopped beating. The runes covering the mandrake's inky skin shivered, invigorated by the kill. He emitted a warped, clicking noise, and two more of his kind slithered into the corporeal realm. The pair regarded Gomor, their mouths stretching in a low growl as he touched the orb they carried. The silver-skinned device shimmered, ancient Eldar rune script flaring into life under his touch. Gomor issued another tortured noise from his throat, as black flame seeped from unseen pores to wreathe the orb in obsidian fire. The other mandrakes nodded in acquiescence and let go of the device. Free of their grip, the smoldering orb rose up into the air, settling several meters above Luitin Hive's primary power hub. The device continued to burn. Within moments, its end source held innards bled into the atmosphere, its metallic shell flaying away until nothing remained. A fulgurant web of cold dark energy erupted in the air, its arcing tendrils cutting minute tears in the fabric of real space. 
Gomor smiled, a wicked, humorless expression, as he watched the bonds of the linear universe fray away like torn silk. The event was invisible to mortal sight, but the Mandrake was born of the other world. A child of darkness and implausible reality, Gomor's eyes were accustomed to seeing the unseen. It pleased him that the populace of Luetin would remain unaware of their impending doom. The humans would die as they had lived, ignorant and afraid. The frayed edges of the vortex crackled and receded as a pall of darkness spilled from the webway, forcing apart the rift until a swirling portal the size of the power hub it shadowed hung in the air. Gomor growled, low and soft in satisfaction. His task complete, the mandrake seeped back into the shadows. Strike before the prey is roused. Take his heart before the twins of anger and desperation can lend him strength. Luitin's defense force hadn't stood a chance. The hive was burning. The warriors of the Shattered Hand had emerged through the webway portal in a vengeful tide, bursting into real space in a flash of eldritch flame. Dozens of arrow-swift skimmers and barbed skycraft had soared unmolested across the slabbed expanse of Luitin's defense perimeter to deliver a punishing attack on the hive proper. Lithe warriors in battle armor and leering female gladiators had dismounted into the streets, stalking and killing with unrelenting malice and vigor. The Shattered Hand were consummate hunters, their every waking moment dedicated to perfecting their murderous art. The Imperial Guard of the 109th Luitin Rifles and the levied regiments of conscripted workers who had hastily put down their rock drills and picked up las guns were overwhelmed without pause. Archon Vranak sat immobile on her flesh throne as her personal transport glided towards the hive. Beneath the ghoulish curves of her polished helm, she smiled with both of her mouths. Gomor had done well. The Mandrake had disabled the laser towers and energy fields meant to serve as a first line of defense, and murdered several high-ranking officers, using their dismembered corpses to spread terror among the Luitin forces. In such a fragile state, the heaving necropolis was a tender target the hive's inerts exposed to the scything attentions of the Shattered Hand. Luitin's subterranean shafts were rich in dense mineral deposits and precious ores, every ounce of which would be mined from the earth and put to use in the dark Eldar's hellish weapon shops. But most precious of all the hive's assets, the thing that had drawn the hand to it like a dying man to faith, were the teeming millions of indentured miners and their adeptus administratum overseers. The Shattered Hand would take them as slaves and transport them to Komora, where the humans would learn the true meaning of despair. The lucky ones would be rendered down in flesh troughs to provide sustenance and genetic material for the vile experiments of the dark Eldar homunculi. Others would be tortured in one of the dark city's many pleasure palaces, their agonizing deaths drawn out to provide soul fuel for its denizens. Those that could not be captured would be put to the blade. One way or another, the Shattered Hand would hunt the populace of Luitin to extinction. Mind your surroundings. The distinction between prey and bait is a small one. 
through such carelessness have many hunters become hunted. Eric Morkai stared down at Luitin's narrow streets. Strong winds buffeted the Wolf Lord's gnarled face, pinning the plaits of his beard to his chest plate. Without the burden of his helm, Eric could smell the tang of ozone and hear the tortured cries of the populace below. He was a hunter, born of hunters, but gifted with the Canis Helix. The Wolf Lord could embrace the elements in a way his forefathers never had. Standing on the precipice of Lewitin Hive's parliament building, the grey-blue ceramite of his battle plate striking against the building's dull pallor, Eric watched his prey. The sleek Eldar vehicles sped below him, darting between the jutting columns and protruding spires of the cathedral-like buildings that made up the hive. Eric's enhanced eyes followed every change in their trajectory as they twisted at incredible speeds to avoid the sporadic fire coming from the lower concourses. Mark me well, brother. They shall sing glorious sagas of this day. Eric turned to Agmund. The wolf guard was crouched low, peering over the edge with a critical eye at the Eldar transports and slave ships that sped past underneath them. Agmund grunted in affirmation the long scar that ran from his temple to his neck, stretching as he grinned. Prepare yourselves! Eric sub-vocalized the command to the rest of his great company. He took a step back from the edge, unsheathed his plasma pistol, and flicked the activation stud on his chain axe. Beside him, Agmund and Ivar readied their weapons. The Wolf Lord rolled his shoulders, they felt light without the hulking bear pelt. The ancient trophy wasn't fit for what he was about to do. Vilka Fenrika! The vox feed in Eric's ear crackled with a chorus of responses as his entire great company echoed his call to battle. From the windows and balconies of Luitin's towering edifices, the space wolves leapt towards the dark elder front, <coughs> free falling in a hail of grey armor. Eric landed hard in the middle of an Eldar craft, the enhanced musculature of his legs absorbing the bone-breaking impact. He moved with the vehicle as it rocked under his weight, killing the prow gunner with a backhanded swipe of his axe. A dozen dark Eldar stared at the Wolf Lord in frozen confusion as the gunner's head fell amongst them. Eric growled in amusement, opening fire on the tightly pressed Xenos. His plasma pistol shone white hot as he fired, vaporizing the elder Kada. At the corner of his peripheral vision, Eric saw Agmund and Ivar. The pair were on an adjacent craft, their armor spattered with blood. A torrent of rounds stung the Wolf Lord's armor, forcing a curse from his lips. Alien Ansviti! An elder gunship was bearing down on him. He crouched low, taking cover behind a guardrail, and slapped a melter charge onto the skimmer's hull. One, two, three! Eric leapt from the skimmer. The melter charge detonated, engulfing the Elder transport in a halo of expanding fire. The shockwave threw Eric towards the oncoming gunship. He swung out with his chain axe, its teeth biting into the ship's hull. An instant later, the Wolf Lord was on the deck, his axe feasting on soft, elder innards. He slipped left as the last of the crew lunged at him, smashing his forehead into the alien's helm. The helmet buckled under the blow, folding back into the elder's skull. Weak links! Eric's neural implants fed him a slew of tactical data that scrolled over his enhanced eyes. A dozen of his brothers had died in the descent, their ident runes disappearing from his tactical display. Two dozen more had been injured. He growled, banishing the overlay with a thought, turning his attention to the swarm of single-man craft that were headed towards him. Thoroth, kill them! 
nestled among the forest of sensoria that grew up from Luitin Hive's highest echelons. Thorolf Icewalker received his Wolf Lord's order. For us, for the Old Father! Without igniting his jump pack, Thorolf leapt from the sensorium stack and plunged downwards. His thirty-strong sky claw pack followed suit, diving with him down through the kilometer-thick layer of smog that had masked their presence. A line of warnings flashed across Thorolf's helmet display as the hive's architecture rushed up to meet him. He fired his jump pack, gunning it in short bursts to alter his flight path. Gargoyle-encrusted balconies and protruding ventilation ducts flashed by centimeters from his face. A red rune shone over the space wolf's eye. He was falling at such speed that any impact would kill him. Thorolf ignored the warning, blinking it away. A slew of targeting reticules and situational data sprang up, filling his display as he cleared the smog. With a practiced ease born of decades of warfare, the Space Wolf sifted through the icons, zeroing in on Eric and the squadron of Eldar skimmers headed towards him. Thorolf ignited both boosters, keeping one eye fixed on the altitude counter as his jetpack accelerated him downwards. The Eldar were almost in firing range. His arms straining against the crushing force of the descent, Thorolf detached his bolt pistol and bolt gun from their maglocks. Thrusting his arms out towards the approaching skimmers, he looked every bit like the Valkyries he'd seen daubed in ancient caves on Fenris. Warriors of myth and legend, the Valkyries were often depicted in full battle armor, descending from the heavens with sword and spear. The comparison drew a smile across Thorolf's face. Range, the word flashed on Thorolf's display. He opened fire, his muscled forearms unmoving as the bolt weapons barked into life. Behind them, the sky claws opened up with their own weapons, sending a hail of explosive rounds into the Eldar craft. The skimmers were fast and incredibly nimble, but the space wolves had taken them by surprise, and the volume of fire pumping towards them was too vast to dodge. The sleek craft were shredded, breaking apart as bolt rounds punished them. Flames licked Thorolf's armor as he fell through the wreckage of the Eldar vehicles, blinding him for a moment as his helmet's optics reset. The skies are clear, Lord! Thorolf voxed his report to Eric, firing his boosters intermittently to hold his altitude. What would... A target swam onto Thorolf's display. It was moving too fast for his helmet to process, appearing as a solid line across his vision. Despair! The sky claws burst into motion at Thorolf's order, but it was too late. The speeding Eldar craft cut through them, leaving a cluster of aerial mines in its wake. The floating charges detonated, spewing flame and shrapnel in all directions. Thorolf's world went dark. Thorolf came to with a jolt. Pain flared up his spine, forcing a grimace. He hit the release clasp on his jump pack and rolled onto his front, dislodging a layer of rubble and glass. The pack had saved his life, diffusing the force of the impact as its boosters crumpled inwards. Thorolf's display stuttered, spitting distorted images and tactical data. He snarled, ripped off his damaged helmet and tossed it aside in frustration. His head was ringing from the explosion and his ribs ached. The space wolf sat up and examined his surroundings. He'd fallen into some sort of chapel. A cobbled floor lay cracked under his armored bulk, while stone saints stared down at him from plinths. He looked around for his weapons, cursing when he couldn't find them. Pushing himself up, he staggered to his feet and gazed up at the shattered skylights and domed spire that had broken his fall. He cracked his neck, twitching as his enhanced physiology pumped adrenaline around his system. Glory find you, Yorick! Thorolf muttered thanks to the Iron Priest for retarding his armor's pain suppressors. Pain focused the mind, made it easier to kill than think. Gritting his teeth, he stepped out of the chapel 
and let the sounds of battle guide him towards a ruined street. Thorolf paused for a moment while his enhanced eyes adjusted to the relative gloom. Daylight didn't reach the lower galleries of the necropolis, the sun's light blocked by the towering hive and its myriad of solar collectors. He sniffed the air, growling at the scent of Xenos. They were close, perhaps on the same level. He moved towards the Elder, stepping over the corpses of the preachers who'd been gutted by the war party and left to rot like diseased cattle. Tolov crouched low as heavy bolter fire resounded from up ahead. He listened for a moment, pinpointing the weapon's location. It was to his left, midway along the next avenue. The space wolf advanced, picking up the crack of las guns and the smooth snap of Eldar rifles as he moved to the administratum building, marking the intersection. He pushed his back against the wall and risked a glance around the corner. Three Imperial Guardsmen were holding a sandbag emplacement against five Eldar approaching from the northwest. The rest of the squad lay dead in the road, their bodies torn to ribbons by the aliens' barbed rounds. Thorolf heard the bolt round slip as it left the magazine. There was no mistaking the crunch of a jammed round. He dashed from cover and ran flat out towards the guardsmen as the heavy bolter fell silent. Keep firing! Keep firing! I can't! I'm trying! Where are you coming! Fire! Emperor, damn it! The sight's stuck! Come on, come on, let me see that! I'm coming! I'm coming! Ah. <laughs> Thorolf backhanded the screaming guardsman across the face, breaking his jaw and knocking him unconscious. The other two guardsmen stared up at him, their eyes wide with fear. Thorolf doubted they'd ever set eyes on a space marine before. Right now, he was more terrifying than the Eldar pirates that were striding towards them. Give... give me the weapon! The older looking of the two guardsmen opened his mouth to speak, but said nothing. Ross's teeth! Thorolf growled in irritation. He pushed past the trooper, reaching down and snapping the heavy bolter from its mount. The foul scent of Xenos flesh choked the space wolf's nostrils. The Eldar were almost upon them. Grunting with superhuman effort, Thorolf racked back the heavy bolter slide and opened fire. Back to the abyss! The advancing Xenos died in seconds, their frail forms exploding in clouds of red mist. The remainder broke for cover, but Thorolf gave them no respite. Blasting apart the piles of rubble and service vehicles they sought to cower behind. Once a long fang, the space wolf was as familiar with the subtleties of a heavy bolter as he was with the age lines of his own face. It took him less than twenty seconds to track and kill the Eldar Carter. Thorolf sniffed the air, checking for survivors. There were none. A pungent aroma drew a skull from the space wolf. He looked down at the cowering guardsmen, noticing the expanding wet patches on their trousers, and grinned. A shrapnel rain doused the lower reaches of Lewitin Hive as skimmers burned, falling from the sky in droplets of twisted metal. The initial ambush had gone well, with over half the Eldar force killed or routed. The Eldar's corpse came apart as Eric pulled his axe from its chest. The Wolf Lord examined the tactical overlay on his display. The attack was at a critical juncture. One mistake and the Space Wolves could lose the momentum. The Eldar still outnumbered them by dozens to one, and his forces were spread the length and breadth of the Hive. He could ill afford to let the Xenos seize the initiative. A series of concussive blasts drew Eric's attention to the southwest. A huge Eldar craft, larger than any they'd yet encountered, had entered the local airspace. Its arrowed prow scythed through the burning remains of lesser skimmers as it forged towards Ragnaval and his scouts. A battery of elongated energy weapons flashed from its sides. The Wolf Lord gritted his teeth in rage as Ragnaval's ident rune blinked dark. 
Rest devour them. We must take down that craft. Eric cursed as more ident runes faded from his display. It's wreathed in some sort of energy shield. We cannot board it directly, and we cannot get close enough to plant charges. We must find a way. We must... As if in answer to the Wolf Lord's demand, a hail of heavy bolter rounds roared up from the lower hive to hammer the shield. The translucent energy bubble flared and spat as the high-caliber shells found their mark. Now! For us! Now! Eric motioned towards the exposed skimmer with his axe, ordering the attack as the shield overloaded, shattering in a storm of disjointed noise. Eric leapt onto the Archon's transport. Agmund and Ivar landed beside him. The Archon's bodyguard attacked without pause, striking at the Space Wolves with crackling halberds. Eric blocked a strike meant to sever his head and shot one of the Eldar point-blank in the face. The plasma discharge vaporized the Xenos' skull and killed another that was moving in behind him. The Eldar were skilled combatants, but they fought as individuals, their selfish desire to kill leaving them open to counter. The Space Wolves fought as a pack, each thrust and cut of their blades working in unison with their brother's attacks to plug gaps in their defenses and overwhelm the foe. Ivar gestured with his blade. Your left! Agmund turned and raised his blade, parrying the Elder's blow before slashing down towards the shoulder. He growled as his chainsword rang off the Incubi's armor. The segmented battle plate worn by the Archon's bodyguard was heavier and more robust than that worn by the other Eldar. Coupled with the Incubi's skill and grace, it was hard to land a killing blow. Enough of this dance! Agmund ducked the Incubi's riposte, Mag locked his chainsword to his armor, and shouldered the Eldar backwards. He stepped in as the Incubi tried to recover, pinning the Eldar's arms and locking a gauntleted hand around its frail neck. Rust bring you luck, dodging the ground. With a grunt of effort, Agman tossed the struggling Eldar from the Skycraft. Ivar grinned, following the Wolf Guard's example and using his bulk to knock the last two of the Incubi to their doom. I think Ivar wants your place at the feasting table. Eric joked with Agmund and turned his gaze on the Archon. The sinister figure was still immobile on her throne. Her polished charcoal armor was in stark relief to the bleeding corpses that made up her nightmarish seat. I am Vranak. Remember that name, Monkey. Tell it to your corpse guard when you stand at his side. The Eldar shot from her throne in a stream of darkness to strike Eric in the chest with an outstretched fist. The blow flipped the Wolf Lord, spinning him backwards. Eric dropped his plasma pistol and caught hold of the aft guardrail. Dangling from the edge of the skimmer, the Wolf Lord fought to remain conscious, feeling as though a war mammoth had stepped on his chest. A fissure ran the length of his breastplate blood running from it. The Archon moved to finish him, but Agmund and Ivar blocked her path with their burring chain blades. Vranach ghosted between them, parrying their blows with deft turns of her sword. Agmund cried out as the Archon whipped her weapon round to slice the wolf guard's legs off at the knee, the crackling blade passing effortlessly through armor and bone. Ivar died a heartbeat later, Branagh pivoting to thrust her blade through the Space Wolf's primary heart, cleaving his secondary heart with the return stroke. Clumsy apes. Branagh spat the taunt as she kicked Agmund's twitching torso from the transport. Eric growled and pulled himself back onto the platform. Your death will bring them glory. The Wolf Lord gripped the haft of his axe with both hands, separating the twin weapons that made the whole. Twirling both axes once to remember their weight, he charged towards Vranach. Eric struck out with all his fury, with all of his skill, but the teeth of his weapons carved only air. In return, the Archon flowed around him, slashing at the Wolf Lord's thighs and cutting open his midriff. Eric roared with rage. Vranach was toying with him. As his mind raced for a way to triumph, 
Warning runes flared across the Wolf Lord's retinal display. He ignored them. His body would cope. There was no way to counter the Eldar's attacks. She moved too fast, even for Eric's enhanced eyes to see. But the Wolf Lord could smell her, could hear the beat of her devil heart. Franak sailed forwards, her blade aimed at the Wolf Lord's throat. Eric heard the excited rush of the Archon's breath as she prepared for the kill. He slipped left, swinging an axe low towards the Eldar's abdomen. The Archon darted backwards. Eric tracked her scent, throwing his other axe where his nose told him. The spinning weapon clipped the Archon, unbalancing her for the briefest of instants. Eric seized the chance, diving forwards, wrapping his vice-like arms around the Eldar and dragging her over the edge. The two armored figures fell to their doom. You kill us both! Rana grasped as her lungs struggled against the Wolf Lord's embrace. Eric smelled the Archon's fear. He listened with grim satisfaction as the Eldar's heart rate continued to speed. His own heart remained slow and steady as his chronometer counted down the seconds to impact. At the edge of his hearing, the Wolf Lord picked up the skimmer he had sensed was coming. He listened to the roar of its engines as it joined the battle, felt the displaced air on his skin as it cut a path towards them. When he had first glimpsed it, it was a tiny dot, a speck on the horizon. Now, meters below him, the sleek craft all but filled his vision. Moments before her death, the Archon realized the error of her assumption. The wolf and the Eldar slammed into the Eldar transport. Vranach let out a wheezing grunt as every bone in her body cracked under Eric's weight. <sighs> Wolf Lord got to his feet and glared at the carder of Eldar warriors surrounding him. Who's next? Small, single pilot skimmers sped past Thorolf as they fled the hive and the space wolves' wrath. Cowards! Thorolf swung round, bringing the heavy bolted bear on the retreating jet bikes. He opened fire, stitching a line of destruction through the towering hab blocks as the Eldar craft jinked left and right. Thorolf growled a curse and adjusted his aim, pumping a stream of explosive rounds into the buildings above and ahead of the skimmers. The Eldar pilots held their course, blindsided by the debris that tumbled onto them. The lead craft slammed straight into a chunk of falling rock crete, exploding in a ball of fire. The other two slowed sharply, diving in an attempt to avoid the worst of the rubble, just as Thorolf had expected. The space wolf grinned and gunned the trigger, shredding the pair in a barrage of sustained fire that tore through the skimmer's armor and ignited their fuel cells. He kept firing, holding the trigger down until the weapon stuttered and the ammo counter flashed zero. The space wolf dropped the weapon and fell to one knee. His wounds were catching up with him. He felt his muscles weaken as his body diverted blood and nutrients to repair the damage to his internal organs. Thorolf took a long, agonized breath and stopped. Something was wrong. He sniffed the air, analyzing every particle for the source of his discontent. He smelled nothing save his own scent, not the smoking shell casings scattered around him or the vapor trail left in the air by the Eldar skimmers. Thorolf's muscles bunched in anticipation as he realized that the world had turned silent. He could no longer hear the battle raging in the distance, neither the staccato of bolt of fire nor the thrum of the Eldar skimmers. Thorolf willed himself to stand and cast his gaze around the street. Darkness spread towards him, as one after another, the street's luminators blinked out. The air turned cold, a feeling of unease intensifying as a thin layer of frost rhymed the edges of his armor. Show yourselves, devils! 
Dorolf drew his knife and smiled, his long canines glistening under the light of a single flickering luminator as the mandrakes came for him. Not for the last time, the space wolf's world went dark. Vox Tenebris by Robbie McNiven. Performed by John Banks, Steve Conlin, and Toby Longworth. In the frozen darkness, the wolves waited. Three packs, their fangs out, breath frosting in the chill air. The musk of the tightly pressed brothers was a comfort, filling the low, wide tunnel with pack familiarity. Not like the Dark Angels. Their scent was alien, old, rotten vellum, burning tallow, bolter unguents, bitterness. The lenses of their helmet visors glowed red in the subterranean shadows, giving their dark green armor a faint, bloody sheen. Dren Redblade was forced to crouch near them. As a long fang, his pack of heavy weapon specialists was consigned to the rear of the Space Wolves' advance column, well placed to lay down fire support once the vanguard packs had engaged. But with the Dark Angels posted as the rearguard, the old wolf suddenly found himself with his back to the lion's sons. He growled into the Vox, addressing the young blood claws up ahead. When we go, we go fast. No hesitating. Don't stop to fire if you can help it. Claws and blades are the surest way to deal with weird spawn. He spoke the words to calm his own thoughts as much as those of the younger wolves. He was on battle edge, his senses sharpening everything around him. The hum of idling power armor, the click of inter-squad vox, the intense cold of the ice-packed tunnels. His left thigh itched, the legacy of a wound he'd received long ago. He turned to Obba, one of his long-fang packmates. Do you remember Melma? And that damnable Kraken mother? You rarely cease to remind us. You speak of it as though you alone brought it down, and I hadn't already cut its legs out from under it. <laughs> Redblade <laughs> laughed softly. The bitterness in his saliva spoke of combat readiness, the byproduct of a potent mix of adrenaline and stims pumping through his veins. He had experienced it all a thousand times in his centuries of service, but he had crested the mountain years earlier. It had stopped getting easier and started getting harder. Go! Go! The order was a whisper on the Voxnet, hard and urgent. The wolf scouts at the head of the column, Yari's quick pelts, rose silently and loped off into the darkness. They didn't look back and were soon gone from sight, as though they had never existed. Sferi, pack leader of the Blood Claws, growled. Remember, pups, keep your eyes on me. Stay together, move as one, and follow my damned orders this time. The young wolves were restless, muttering under their breath and shifting in their unfamiliar battleplate. Redblade spoke softly to Torburn. Keep tracking Yari with your optics. Of the five long fangs in the pack, the plasma cannon gunner alone still wore his helmet when on operation. He claimed its auto sensors were better than the separate targeting scopes the other heavy weapon specialists wore over their right eyes. Like many things the long fangs did, though, it was probably more due to personal habit than actual practicality. 
Red Blade had always hated his own helmet. Even as a young flame hunter, he'd fought without it, wearing his red hair in a wicked crest. That hair was now white and bound up in a topknot. The shade matched his thick, forked beard, the outline of the facial hair distorted by the old melter backflash burn on his left cheek. Where was the youth who had sent orcs tumbling from the skies on Theron, or slaughtered the gene-stealer cultists on Gosar Quintus? Oba muttered to himself. They smell the worst. Who? The weird filth. Of all the damnable foes we face down the centuries, I hate their stink the most. Rotten or bitter, sweet and honeyed, it's always changing. Makes my stomachs clench. They both spat, warding off evil. Redblade raised his voice to address the blood claws. He needed to help Sferi calm them. They were too agitated. You pups were still unborn when we fought the rot demons on Sarnis. The hives of that world were awash in a sea of filth. We waded through it, chest deep, out of ammunition, killing the diseased weird scum with our claws and blades. That's where your pack leader Sveri lost his eye. One of the young claws, Varan, turned to Sveri. You told us it was fighting Xenos raiders on Markoth. Old Red Blade doesn't know what he's talking about. His mind is too addled these days. He drinks too much Mjord. <laughs> One tankard is too much by your standards, Sveri. I'd wager you couldn't even outdrink the youngest pup in your pack. Sveri nodded towards the wide-eyed Varan. I'll take you up on that challenge, brother. If the pup survives. Silence descended once more. The packs waited. Ober hawked and spat again on the ice floor. These tunnels stink of corruption. They never used to be like this. He was right. The taint of the weird suffused the vaults beneath the ruins of Morkai's keep. That was why they were here, wolves and the lion sons both, hunting as one. Demons had fallen upon the Fenrisian system, infesting every planet bar the homeworld itself. The Dark Angels had arrived initially with persecution in mind, planning to confront the sons of Rus. Instead, they now found themselves battling alongside their old rivals against the hordes of the weird. The assault on Morkai's keep had been divided into two strike forces. The first would tear up through the lower tunnels before the second followed above ground through an internal breach blown through the las-melted bastions. Between them, the ancient Space Wolves' fortress would be reclaimed. The sooner we move, the better. Redblade realized his hand had dropped to the hilt of his combat knife, Fang. He had once striven to earn his deed name by forever drenching it in foe blood, hungry for the honor such an accolade would bring him. The title had now been earned many times over, and Fang's monomolecular edge was nicked in half a dozen places, but still the old wolf found himself clutching at it whenever combat neared. When the screaming started and the blood flowed, it paid to have good Fenrisian steel in his fist. Torburn gazed ahead, down the tunnel, over the crouching forms of Sferi's blood claws, darkness still reigned. They're gone! I can't even catch their scent anymore. How long? Sergeant Micker, the Dark Angel squad leader, sounded impatient. None of the wolves deigned to answer him. Seconds passed, ticking into minutes in the shivering air. Eventually, the Vox clicked. The tunnel is ours, brothers. The entrance to the lower vaults is secure. Yari and his scouts had done their work well. The way was open and the assault could begin. As one, the wolves rose and started their advance, the Dark Angels prowling behind them. And, as one, the darkness swallowed them whole. Initiating final rites. May the Lion and the Emperor watch over you. The machine voice of tech priest Primaris Krell rang in Zami and Gidriel's ears competing with the crash and crackle of the chained lightning darting between the three displacement orbs overhead. Around the Deathwing Terminator squad, the hexagrammatic wards burned bright as quicksilver, 
throbbing with the energy building within the teleportation chamber. The air was pregnant with static charge and thick with incense. Ghost light sparked and darted along the bone-white battle plate of the hulking warriors. Gidriel shouted to be heard. Is the machine stable, priest? Krell didn't look up, still bent over his initiation lectern. As stable as it ever is, a venerable space marine. That is hardly reassuring. Gidriel reviewed the tactical upload via his helmet visor one last time. Master Belial's briefing had been succinct. Teleport into the vaults of Morkai's keep ahead of the first of the two strike forces and secure a beachhead for them. Once they had linked up, the Terminators would spearhead the attack up into the keep proper, facilitating the access of the second strike force. It would be over in no more than an hour, Emperor Willie. Brethren, sound off. Malek here. His Terminators Love responded you. in turn, Samarius their ready. voices stone. Krell raised his ignition hammer, vice hands clamped around its adamantium haft. Gidriel prepared himself, sealing his helmet in place. In the name of the Omnisire, fury and blood. Krell struck the great activation room. Darkness. Cold. Teleportation was instantaneous, yet in the depths of the warp, such a concept did not exist. The bone bite of interstellar chill pierced him to his core. He felt something writhing over the ceramite of his left grieve, sticking and sucking. Inhuman laughter cackled in his ears, and his stomachs churned with plunging sensations. And then he was standing in a chamber of hard-packed ice, a demon's horned skull grasped in his power fist. Lion, preserve me. It was called mind displacement, and it was a rare and dangerous anomaly. Gidriel had heard Krell explain it once, when he'd still been a young 10th Company initiate. Sometimes, the mind lagged behind its body during teleportation, returning to full consciousness a split second after the rematerialization of the physical form. It was an unusual and potentially fatal event, typically indicative of a teleport miscarriage. Some fragment of Gidriel's consciousness, honed by over four centuries of war, had reacted instinctively in the brief moment when his mind had been elsewhere. He clenched his fist, activating its disruptor field with a thought impulse. The demon's skull disintegrated in a burst of ichor, and its corporeal form flickered from existence with a horrible wail. For a terrible moment, as the demon vanished, even the veteran Terminator hesitated. Of the brethren that should have flanked him, there was no sign. The combat sigil on his visor display was alone, a solitary green blip surrounded by flashing crimson. Squad, come in. What is your current location? Report. Nothing. He switched channels, trying to establish a link back to the flagship. Calling the Emperors first. This is Brother Sergeant Gidriel. Respond. Still nothing. He was alone. Around him, a sea of twisted faces reared up out of the darkness, screaming for his soul. The tunnel was not a tunnel at all, not anymore. Sections of the white ice undulated and shimmered, as though viewed through a heat haze. Weirdlings sprang from the disturbances, allowing their glamours to slip as they revealed themselves. The air was suddenly thick with their unnatural, pervasive stench. Weapons! Red Blade unclamped his multi-melter, Phobane, from its maglock harness and triggered its reaction core. His heavy backpack began to throb as the pyrum fuel compound within was forced into a submolecular state. The weapon's charge indicator flashed green. A crash behind him signaled the closing of the trap. He turned in time to see the tunnel back the way they'd come, collapsing. Tons of glacial ice slamming down without warning on the strike force's rear guard. Sergeant Mika and his Dark Angels simply disappeared without a sound, replaced by a tumbling wall of jagged white. Sferi shouted over the box. It's a trap! Into them, blood claws! Strike into them! The first weirdling's claws raked off Red Blade's pauldron, scarring his company livery. 
The things were materializing from the very walls of the tunnel, sliding through the buckled reality of the keep's depths with spiteful contempt. Redblade knew instinctively that they could not match them. Still, he fought, a battle cry on his lips. For the Grimbloods and the Old Father! The weird spawn was a she-monster, a thing of bared lilac flesh and crab-like talons. It moved like a dancer, flickering through the air with scant regard for natural rules. And when it struck Redblade, it did so with a force that belied its slender, shapely frame. Its claws tore the ceramite from Redblade's pauldron and punched all the way to his black carapace, splitting the crimson Fenrisian runestone set into his breastplate. The demonette hissed. Go back to your hell pit, weird scam! The thing was so damned fast, he was forced to keep it at bay using Fobane's bulk with one hand, slipping his other down to Fang's frayed Krakenhide grip. It was trying to get at his exposed face, to tear the flesh from the skull so it could bring him down quickly and begin to feast. That was its only mistake. In more than three centuries of combat, Dren Redblade had learned how to defend himself. Die, temptress! He kicked the weirdly. It said much of the thing's nightmarish abilities that it was almost able to dodge the sudden move. Almost. Redblade's bionic left knee crashed into its thigh. There was an audible crack, and the she-weird faltered. Fang took it in the throat, sending it hissing back into nothingness. Sweet-smelling pink blood coated the blade, running like syrup down the long fang's leg as he gripped Fobain once more. He clicked through the vox channels. Come on, this is Red Blade. The tunnels are a trap. Repeat, the tunnels are a trap. The secondary strike force must not proceed. There was no response. Rust, damn it! Around him, his brethren were dying. Svensson, saga hero of Morlach, was already gone. Two of the creatures pinning him against the ice wall, while a third slipped a needle-like dagger through each of his armor seals, working up into his guts. Wolf and Torburn still fought, heavy weapons discarded in favor of their blades. Ober was on his knees, blood gouting from where another weirdling had clamped its crab claws around his exposed throat. Oba! Redblade threw himself at his brother's attacker, a snarl of rage on his lips. The weirdling sensed his coming and darted back with preternatural gracefulness. Obber slumped forward, blood slicking the ice red as Redblade punched Fang towards the weirdling. It ducked and wove, claws flashing out to rake Redblade's plate and clang from Fobain's cowl. The heavy multi-melter protected much of his torso, but it also impeded him. The she-weird's claws drew blood, punching through his left elbow seal, finding the weakness behind the vambrace. Red Blade, get back! Torburn slammed into the thing, shoulder first, all pretense of poise gone. The creature tried to dodge, but found itself pressed into the melee and snagged by one of Torburn's outstretched arms. He slammed the creature into the ice with all his transhuman strength. There was a snap. The weirdling struggled, hissing. He slammed his body into it again, and it finally went limp and flickered into oblivion. Red Blade had unclamped Fobain again, hunting for clear targets. There were none. Come on! Come in! Come on! Respond! Rust, take you all! The tunnel was packed with writhing, stabbing, struggling figures. Sferi's claws had been set upon by a cohort of red-scaled swordlings. Their black hellblades parted the Space Wolf's battleplate as easily as razors slicing sun-parched vellum. The air was thick with bursts of blood and the steam of warm, opened innards. We can't stay here! Sferi's reply came from somewhere in the press of bodies. Can't go back! He was right. The collapse that had crushed the Dark Angels had also sealed them in, closing off their route to the surface. Redblade 
turned Fobane towards the wall nearest to him and activated the multi-melter's fire counter. I will open a path. He kept his finger on the trigger, letting the fusion reaction within build until the weapon was vibrating in his grasp. After a few seconds, it spat its charge. A focused beam of infernal temperature struck the ice wall. There was a roar before a flush of heat blasted down the tunnel, followed by a cloud of superheated steam. Redblade grunted and turned, shielding his face, feeling the outer layers of his power armor blistering. Through the hissing clouds, he picked out a hole bored through the ice, its edges pouring with meltwater. Beyond was darkness. Dorben! Wolf! He turned to see both warriors grappling with more weirdlings. There was a cracking sound, and a great chunk of ice fell from the ceiling, crunching down into the melee. More followed. Redblade spoke into the box. Ferry, we must go! There was no reply. Swordlings were butchering the last of the young blood claws, attacking them from all sides, skewering them with burning black steel. Torburn slammed his blade into a weirdling's throat. You go, Tren! Now! Redblade took half a step back towards his packmates, mouthing a curse. Before he could go further, there was a crash. The wall immediately above Wolf and Torburn collapsed, a sheet of solid ice plunging down on the warriors and forcing Redblade back. More of the tunnel started to come down. The remaining weirdlings clawed through the plummeting sheets, hissing at him. Redblade threw himself through the hole melted by Fobane. A moment later, and the remains of the tunnel collapsed with a sound like thunder, burying wolves and weirdlings alike. The Long Fang kept his feet, panting, eyes seeking to pierce the darkness of his new surroundings. The reticules of his head-mounted targeter blinked, but found nothing. The sudden silence seemed to amplify everything, leaving his heart pounding thunderously and his breath rasping in his throat. Brothers, come in. He cycled through Sferi's channel. Yaris, his packmates, all were empty. Brothers, anyone? He tried to switch to the command channel. No connection at all. All oh, father, take this damned place. He activated his suit lamp, and the focused beam picked out more glittering, hard-packed ice. He was in a second tunnel, lower and narrower than the first, barely large enough for an armored warrior to pass through. There was no sign of anything else in either direction. For a moment, he found himself unable to move. Ober and Svensson, Wolf and Torburn. They had all been grey hunters together, serving side by side for two centuries. Yari and the Quickpelts had been good scouts as well, and Sferi had been tipped for Grimblood's personal wolfguard. They all deserved better than a tomb of crushing ice. Eventually, he found he could unclench his fists, and his old instincts kicked in. He had to find a way back to the surface. The second assault could not be allowed to walk into the same trap the first had. He recalled Yari's words, that the entrance to the lower vaults had been secured. It had definitely been Yari's voice, and yet something in the message sat uneasily with him. Hackles raised, red blades set off. Gidriel killed as he had always done, with fury tempered by a deadly efficiency. He was alone, in a chamber of sealed ice, and the spawn of the Dark Gods surrounded him. He wielded his power fist in great destructive arcs, moving constantly so as not to be caught from behind. Clad in tactical dreadnought armor, there was little opportunity for subtlety, and no need for it with the demons throwing themselves upon him. His clenched gauntlet flared as he swept aside a brace of throbbing flesh spawn, the actinic lightning throwing strobing, nightmare shadows across the chamber. Claws and blades rained down on him. Some had already found their mark, but he fought on, bloodied and wounded, still trying to establish contact over the box. Squad, report. What is your location? Something had gone horribly wrong with the teleportation process. None of his warriors showed on the short-range or space. 
The visor overlay of the tunnels beneath Morkai's keep showed him nothing but enemy contacts. Emperor's first. This is Brother Sergeant Gidriel. Come in! Still nothing. He was going to die here, he realized. In the frozen darkness, alone. The thought itself held no fear for the Dark Angel, but it frustrated him. He had an objective to fulfill. A blade nicked the flesh of his hip, sliding up beneath his left tacit and breaking the joint seal above his thigh. The demon was obliterated a split second later by the strike of Gidriel's power fist. But even as its shriek was torn away, a hell sword jarred the battle plate along his lower back, almost cutting straight through into his spine. He spun, fist shattering the red swordling's weapon in a burst of light. For the lion! No pity! No remorse! And suddenly, the Dark Angel was no longer alone. Another signifier appeared on his display, flashing for his attention. It bore the snarling wolf's head crest of the Sons of Rus. The schematics put it in a tunnel directly below him, 30 yards away and closing. Gidriel acted on impulse, his reflexes long ago honed to perfection. Even as demonic warp steel and claws battered at his buckling armor, he dropped onto one knee and, disruptor field set to maximum, slammed his power fist down into the ice at his feet. The floor of the chamber split and cracked as Gidriel's gauntlet pounded through it, driven downwards with every ounce of strength in his fiber bundles and servos. He dragged his fist from the opening split and struck again and again. The ice beneath his mag boots started to give way. Emperor, give me strength! He smashed his fist down one last time and the floor collapsed beneath his weight. His stomachs twisted once more with a sense of dislocation. It lasted only a second before he slammed into the mound of broken ice in the tunnel below. The impact nearly drove the wind from his lungs and crushed a demon caught beneath him as they fell. He swung upwards blindly as he sought to regain his feet, pulverizing more of the demons that had tumbled through. Still more were already scrambling through the hole in the tunnel's roof. Gidriel pushed himself up, filling the corridor, servo straining, and brought his storm bolter to bear. They were still coming. Now, however, they couldn't get behind him. By the wolf's claws. Red Blade was 20 paces away from the collapsed section of the tunnel roof. It had come down in front of him entirely without warning, a cascade of broken ice. At first, he thought the weirdlings were trying to crush him again. Then he had seen the Terminator rise, like some primordial bone-white beast from the ocean's darkest, most frigid depths. It pulverized one of the creatures with its ignited power fist, then open fire into the rest, scrambling down through the hole after it. Brother, I am with you. The Terminator didn't respond. In the tunnel's confines, there was no way Red Blade could get past him or angle a shot to help. He wasn't even sure if the hulking Dark Angel was aware of him. He turned and crouched, scanning the tunnel back the way he'd come, lest more of the devious weird spawn should approach him under the thunderous cover of the Terminator's storm bolt. Eventually, the gunfire ceased, the last of its echoes rebounding sharply away down the tunnel. By then, Red Blade had caught the warrior's scent. It was buried beneath servo oil, purity seal wax, and the metallic tang of weapons discharge, but it was familiar all the same. The warrior turned, heavy pauldrons scraping the tunnel's sides. For a moment, he stood regarding Red Blade, his claw-scarred visor unreadable, the lamplight glittering in its bloody crimson lenses. Dren Redblade. Zamion Gidrea. It's been a long time. They had first met during the purging of Gosar Quintus centuries earlier. Both had been requisitioned within the Death Watch by Chaplain Orton Cassius of the Ultramarines. He had placed the Sons of the Wolf and the Lion in the vanguard of the operation against the Gene Stealer cult on the mining planet. Red Blade had been at the height of youthful brashness, hungry to slay, desperate to carve out a reputation. Gidriel, by contrast, was already an experienced battle brother. His temperament clashed immediately with that of the young wolf. He was stoic, thoughtful, and secretive. He'd been the perfect counterweight. 
Gosar Quintus had been a success. In the years that followed, Gidriel and Redblade continued to fight side by side. In the Death Watch, Redblade had slowly learned to curb and channel his youthful aggression. He and Gidriel had been true battle brothers, always hunting together at the fore. The last time Redblade had seen him had been on Ugluth, fighting the Sheltari, a vicious simian Xenos breed fallen under the thrall of the demonic entity known as the Whisper. The operation had been a failure. Three of the kill team's members, Clovis, Bray, and Carrick, had fallen. Gidriel had never admitted his mistakes. Infuriated, Redblade had challenged him to an honor duel, but Vorens, Redblade's first kill team leader, had intervened before it could take place. Even though centuries had passed, Redblade was not surprised to find that Gidriel still lived, or that he now wore the tactical dreadnought armor of his chapter's first company. You were with the first strike force? Aye, we were ambushed. Damned malefic car and witchery. And you alone survived? I did. Where are your own brothers? Lost. The Officium Solus has been distorted. I suspect Warpcraft. Our teleport miscarried and I've been able to raise no one on the Vox. Nothing but static and whispers. The Vox net is compromised. We were trapped too easily. I suspect the weirdlings have corrupted it somehow. We must warn the primary strike force before they begin their assault across the surface. I also recommend we take necessary precautions to stop the demon's Vox trickery. Agreed. The Keep's reserve Vox relay station is in the second sub-control level, 15 meters almost directly above us. There we can contact the strike force or scramble the equipment so they can't be misled, as we were. What if the Vox system has been damaged? These tunnels have been infested for weeks. The only other way to contact the strike force would be to go to them directly, and that would mean fighting our way to the surface and then to the breaching point, presumably going through every damn weirdling in this place along the way. I'm surprised that wasn't your first suggestion, Redblade. For a moment, the Space Wolf was silent. Then he smiled, a grim, fanged expression. <laughs> As I said, Gidriel, it has been a long time. Save your idle chatter. Follow. Red Blade let out a short, sharp bark of laughter. <laughs> oh, I missed you, Lion San. It wasn't long before they encountered resistance. Plague beast ahead. A festering Nurgle monstrosity had made its nest in the entrance to the vaults proper, the reinforced plasteel door rusting and coated with slime, the ice around it deformed with fleshy pustule growths that popped and filled in time with the creature's diseased heartbeat. Terminating. He hammered it with explosive bolts and pulverized its rancid remains with a single strike of his power fist, coating his white armor with a thick film of green mucus. A second blow parted the subterranean entrance to the keep's vaults. Redblade stepped forwards. Let me lead from here. My armor was designed for this manner of engagement. It makes more sense for me. I know more guys keep better than whatever schematics you're going by, Dark Angel. I spent five years with the garrison here after returning from the Death Watch. After Ugluth, he wanted to say. Gidriel was silent for a moment, the plague beast's remains dripping slowly from his armor. Then he nodded. Very well. Lead on. Redblade growled as he passed beyond the buckled doors. The lower corridors of the vaults showed the mark of the Immaterium's touch. Black blotches had spread over the plasteel walls, ceiling and floor like mold, connected by vein-like tendons of flesh that twitched as the wolf stamped down on them. This place stinks. Thus preserve me. He spat to ward off the evil that tainted the place. The air was humid and moist and filled with a faint, fly-like buzzing. Redblade felt a headache beginning to throb behind his eyes. Gidriel scanned the pulsating walls. It's like the megavores we purged on Cross. Knee-deep in Xenos filth, how could I forget? Fifty yards further, then we take the first lift. That was when the demon struck again. They dropped from above, phasing through the solid ceiling as though it were nothing more than a figment of Redblade's imagination. They shrieked as they came on leathery, tattered wings, claws outstretched. Furies, weirdling predators, every bit as instinctive and vicious as a pack of Fenrisian wolves. 
Red blade, above. Even as he shouted the warning, Gidriel swung his fist up to meet the fury coming at him. He screeched horribly. Flesh and adamantium collided, and the creature burst apart in a spray of blazing warp meat. Another landed behind the Terminator, its claws scraping impotently at his armor. He kept his fist raised so that he had enough room to half turn, angling his storm bolter awkwardly back down the corridor. Two more of the winged demons had come down in front of Red Blade, thumping as they hit the corridor floor. The Space Wolf fired his multi-melter without hesitation. There was a roar as the body mass of the demons was vaporized explosively, filling the air with a mist of viscera. Go back to hell! They're still above us. The final fury fell upon Red Blade directly, claws scrabbling for purchase on his heavy pack and pauldrons, snatching at his top knot. Gidriel lunged forwards with a grunt, grabbing onto one of its bat-like wings with his fist. He hauled at it, making Red Blade stagger. The wing came apart in his powered grip, but the thing held on. It squealed and dug its claws in, drawing blood from the wolf's scalp. The Dark Angel fired. The thing burst, splattering Red Blade with its bolt-blasted remains. The wolf regained his balance with a snarl. You could have just hit it. Wait. A scratching noise came over the Vox, a squeal of transmission code. They were getting back into range. The Vox speed was ticking again in Gidriel's ear, the signal now solid. Come in. Brother Sergeant, it's Malek. It's good to see you on my scope again. Well met, brother. What's your location and status? According to the schematics, Armory Corridor 5-5, but the whole place has been warped. I fear the demon sabotaged our teleportation strike. Agreed. Have you made contact with the rest of the squad? Negative, brother. We fight alone. Yet we shall prevail. Stand by. Gidriel looked down at Redblade. I have made contact with another member of my squad. Blood from the Fury's talon wounds had clotted across the Space Wolf's scalp and dried in long streaks down his face. His expression was grim. Are you sure of that? What do you mean? The ambush on our strike force came following some damned Maleficarum. I suspect weirdlings mimicked the Vox signal from our advanced scouts, right down to the transmission codes and ident tags. You believe they can do that? I know what I heard. One of my own brothers giving us the all clear right before we were trapped. It could not have been him. He would have warned us. Besides, even if your brother has survived, we are close to the lower Vox Relay. We should not deviate. Gidriel keyed his channel to include Redblade. I will have him link with us. Brother Malik. There was no response. Brother Malik, respond. This time, he got an answer. A shriek, as though torn from the mouths of a thousand suffering innocents, burning through every one of the Vox channels. Gidriel flinched and cut the link, his expression stony. Redblade shrugged. Vox Tenebris, then, from here onwards. We will know the truth of it. Very well. It was not long before Gidriel spotted Redblade's misstep as he faltered at a bend in the corridor. Focus. I am focused. It was a lie. Memories of his packmates' deaths, of their crushed, breathless screaming, flickered through his thoughts. He drove the loss from his mind. They would be avenged. We turn here, then on for another thirty yards. At the tunnel's end, they went right, through a set of blast doors and into the Vox Relay service corridor. The corruption here was worse. The lumen strips flickered and twitched rhythmically. The temperature had risen again, and the wall's metal surfaces were almost completely lost beneath a latticework of hideously pulsating veins. Red Blade suppressed a shudder of revulsion as his boots crushed the fleshy growths underfoot. The air stank of sour milk, and the vibrations had grown more intense. 
The Vox was starting to hiss with strange bursts of static, snapping in the wolf's ears like the jaws of some living creature. Halt! Gidriel's warning came too late. Distracted by the strange comms distortion, Redblade only noticed the floor shifting beneath them when it yawned open with a squeal of rending metal and the wet tearing of meat. His arms went out instinctively, the multi-melter dangling by its twin fusion coils, but his gauntlets grasped nothing but air. The floor swallowed them up, the flesh and metal of it all mixed together. The stench of the warp was overpowering. He was falling, falling farther than should have been possible, reality itself distending around him. He saw visions whipping past him, the frozen ice tunnels, Morkai shattered bastion walls, the barrack blocks he'd lived in so many decades before, a dark chamber filled with upright caskets. The warp was trying to rip them away from Morkai's keep, away into the depths of the weird realm. Desperately, Redblade lunged at the last of the spinning apparitions, his other hand going out to grasp Gidriel's paw. And everything came crashing down around him. He hit the ground with a brutal thud, rolling with the impact as best his bulky pack could allow. The servos in his armor gripped and clenched, arresting his slide, and Redblade's gauntlets found the ground. Ice, not flesh, thanks be to Russ. He stood, dragging Fobane up with him, tense and ready, just as Gidriel tumbled down onto the ice next to him. He was once again in freezing darkness. The air was colder here, untainted by the noisome, cloying humidity of the upper levels. They were back amidst the ice tunnels. The roof above was unblemished, and there was no sign of their entry through the physical form of it. It took a moment for Redblade's eyes to penetrate the shadows pressed to the edges of the chamber. The ice was not simply bare, he realized. It had been carved, the whole circumference of the room inscribed with swirling knotwork patterns. The air throbbed with power as well, thick, steaming pipes snaking their way through the hard-packed ice to the dozen upright, heavy-looking caskets that lined the patterned ice walls. The only entrances visible were two wolf-crest embossed blast doors, each at opposite ends of the chamber. Redblade had no memory of such a place from his time serving in the keep. He glanced over at Gidriel as the Terminator hauled himself awkwardly to his feet, servos protesting. He turned, Stormbolter raised. What is this place? Redblade scented the air. <laughs> I don't know, but there's no hint of the weirdlings down here. Not yet. Anyway, he approached one of the upright caskets. The light of the lumen strips filtering in from the collapsed tunnel above gleamed weakly from its metal surface. As he drew closer, the Space Marine picked out more intricate knotwork engravings, covering the whole object in the same looping saga patterns that decorated the walls. He reached up to touch the image of a Fenrisian wolf, bent double, surrounded by what looked like shattered plates of power armor. The metal throbbed at his touch, vibrating through the sensitive pads of his gauntlet. He snatched his hand away. He recognized what he was looking at. Gedriel loomed behind him. It's a stasis casket. I know. What does it contain? Red Blade said nothing. He knew what it contained. The knotwork spelled it out clearly enough. The saga of the lost, the heralds of Rus. Full talons beneath the wolf moon of Valdamani. They had stumbled upon, or been deliberately shown, one of the chambers housing the victims of the Space Wolves' genetic curse. Hidden even from their battle brothers, locked away until the coming of the wolf time, when the final clash between gods and men would tear the galaxy asunder. Gidriel disengaged his helmet seals, revealing his gaunt features. Can you open it? I could, if I wanted. I have not seen one yet. What? One of your mutant beasts. It's why we came to this system. To hunt them down, yet I still haven't seen one. Redblade bristled, rounding on the Dark Angel. What do you know of them? You know nothing! They are not beasts! But they are mutants. And judging by this chamber, your chapter has been harboring them for far longer than you would like to admit. We believe they had only just begun to manifest, but that isn't true, is it? Your chapter has always suffered from their genetic deviancy. Redblade turned away, and, unseen by the Dark Angel, 
unclamped his gauntlet seal. He drew Fang silently as Gidriel continued. I must inform my brethren of this fact. Your guilt has been multiplied. You cannot expect such creatures not to draw the retribution of the Imperium, whether us, the Inquisition, or another chapter. To permit such flagrant genetic deviancy would be to undermine... Redblade tensed. Then he slid his blade across the back of his forearm, a short, sharp nick. He allowed a bead of the blood that welled up from his scarred flesh to collect on the finger of his other gauntlet, then pressed it to the gene lock set into the side of the upright sarcophagus. The data panel blinked red, then green. There was a whirring noise from within the engraved metal, followed by the thud of clamps, the hiss of decompression, and the grating of aged auto hinges. The stasis field within was still active, a gently fizzing, static-washed layer of translucent white energy. Beyond it, frozen in time, was a stricken warrior of the Wolfen. It was even taller and broader than Redblade, the musculature beneath its archaic, stripped-down power armor clearly beset by rampant genhancement overgrowth. The exposed flesh of its forearms bristled with fur, while its lower limbs were hideously back-jointed and claw-toed, like some sort of grotesque human parody of a Fenrisian wolf. Worst of all was its face, locked into an eternal, distorted snarl, canines jutting from its jaw, nose splayed, hair wild and tangled, eyes staring with feral intensity. Even braced as he had been, the lupine yellow glare made Redblade take a pace backwards. He felt Gidriel tense behind him. So it's true. I will tell you what is true, Lion Son. The truth is that this warrior and others like him fought at the side of gods and defied demons when the Imperium was still newborn. The truth is that for 10,000 years, they have hunted the traitor, the mutant, and the weirdling without once pausing for respite, without ever counting the cost. Even here and now, they were fighting across the system to stem the tide of filth that's flooded it, before you ordered them away. I would rather have one of these brothers at my side than ten of your secretive, shadow-skulking kind. He hit the locking room allowing the heavy lid to grind and clamp back into place, plunging the stasis-locked Wolfen back into his freezing tomb. Then, the Vox crackled. Brother Sergeant Ezekiel, this is Deathwing Sergeant Gidriel. The assault point has been secured. We are ready to breach at your command. Gidriel stared at Redblade. Redblade stared back. That was your voice. I didn't speak. You were looking right at me. But it had clearly been his voice crackling over their Vox beads. A moment later, the voice of Sergeant Nazikiel answered the phantom message. Praise be to the Emperor and the Primarch, honored Sergeant. We will begin the surface assault. Nazikiel, out. Gidriel immediately hit his Vox bead. Nazikiel, this is Gidriel Actual. Come in, Nazikiel. There was no response. The Vox had gone dead. Gidriel turned on his heel, moving towards the right hand blast door. I am going to the surface, otherwise they will fall into the trap. Impossible! We don't even know where we are! They tried to drag us through a warp moor. I barely managed to get us here. There is Maleficarum at play. Gidriel paused, replacing his helmet, and called up the tactical schematics. This chamber was buried northwest of the relay, the opposite way from which we were approaching, almost a kilometer. The surface point to be attacked by the second strike force is closer. But we need to end those false transmissions. The Vox is useless to us now. It has been tainted. We cannot know that any messages we send won't be distorted. Even destroying the relay may not be enough. Our only hope is to try and reach the strike force before they're led into the trap. Going up and fighting every step of the way will take longer than the route to the relay. Our brothers will have been slaughtered by the time you get there. At least with the Vox, there's a chance to reach them directly. But Gidriel was moving again, following his new coordinates. Redblade snarled after him. You're only going because you want to report the existence of these Vulfen. You're a fool, Zamion. Gidriel didn't look back. And you've grown old, Dread. Even after all this time, the memory of Ugluth still made Gidriel angry. 
He had known all along that the pup's bloodthirsty arrogance would cost them someday. He told Cassius as much, repeatedly, but the Ultramarine had valued Red Blade's fearsome killing power too highly. He'd believed Gidriel would always be able to rein him in before he did something as destructive as it was foolish. On Ugluth, the Dark Angel had finally failed in that duty. Red Blade had claimed he'd been in a holding position when in reality he'd struck out into the Sheltari Praetors, killing with his usual mindless savagery. By the time they'd realized his true location, the kill team had been exposed. What was worse, the youth had refused to acknowledge his mistake afterwards. He'd even been arrogant enough to claim that the Dark Angel had been the one in the wrong. The warrior in Gidriel had yearned to take up the pup's boastful challenge, but he'd known his return to the rock would be soon. He'd ignored Red Blade's yapping, and Cassius had overlooked the matter. Gidriel spoke into the Vox. Do you remember Tyra Prime, Red Blade? There was no reply. He continued anyway. You nearly lost an arm, and I had to drag you by your ridiculous mane down that alleyway. Red Blade had clearly changed over the years. The young Skytlaw would have torn towards the surface with Gidriel, damning the odds and tallying off every demonic head to add to the kill rune etchings inscribed on his vambraces. Not anymore. Despite that, the anger and the pride were still there, as well as the sharp tongue. Or Triplex Fahl, when you and I tore apart that Haridan clipped by the flat cannons. I thought I was going to... The Dark Angel's words were interrupted by the sound of low, guttural chanting. A vile stench reached his enhanced olfactory glands, turning his stomachs. He rounded a corner in the fleshy corridors to find himself confronted by a tally band of stooped plague bearers. The demons turned as one to stare at him, their cyclopean, roomy eyes wide at the sudden disturbance of their counting. Contact! Gidriel charged. With one mighty blow after another, the Dark Angel smashed the demons apart their jagged, rusting blades jarring off his scarred plate. Even their unfeeling, necrotized flesh was no defense against his powerful skin. In a few moments, the warp spawn were no more, leaving him splattered in their unraveling remains. Gidriel forged upwards, through rotting stairwells thick with wobbling flesh and blinking eyes that glared at him as he passed. Terminator armor was not built for speed, but he pushed himself as hard as he was able, breaking into a lumbering run as he reached the upper corridors. The surface is close. You were wrong to leave me, Red Blade. Just as you were wrong on Ugloth. More demons came at Gidriel. He killed them all, snarling prayers to the Lion and the Emperor as he pulverized flesh and pounded bolts through flickering warp forms. They clawed at him, battering his arm, dragging their talons into the body beneath, bloodying the proud bone-white plate of the Deathwing. But the wounds were nothing. He pressed on, unfaltering, his thoughts bent towards his brethren in the second strike force. He had to reach them. A click in his ear arrested his implacable advance. His stride faltered as Red Blade's voice crackled over the Vox speed. Brother, wait. You were right. Gidriel stopped. He was at the foot of the final stair shaft before he reached the remains of the keep's inner courtyard. The Vox relay is deserted. And... And... Ugluth was a mistake. A terrible mistake. I was simply too young and too bold at the time to realize it. Gidriel growled. Your actions cost the lives of three battle brothers. And for that I crave forgiveness, brother. I am on my way back to the surface. That's the only way we can contact the strike force in time. If you wait, we can break through to them together. Gidriel cut the link. Vox Tenebris. The relay chamber was set out in two tiers a mesh grill deck bisecting the vox banks that lay at the walls of the room. The whole space was overrun with demons. Red Blade's Melter Blast vaporized the last of the weirdling spawn, packing the entrance to the fallen relay, filling the air with a mist of demonic gore. He kicked the molten remains of the blast door in. More monsters awaited him inside. The communications chamber was packed with gibbering, sightless, fleshy things that reached out with translucent claws and sucking more holes, changeling weird flame licking from their skin. 
Red Blade fired again, multi-melter vibrating with fusion power. The proximity of the heat flash singed his matted beard. He snarled and fired again. Hey, trickster filth! Part of the nearest wall ah. collapsed. The pale parasitic blubber that had latched itself to the plastier surface sloughing and burning off, the metal running and falling in on itself like melting wax. Something had infested the banks lining the upper tier of the communication system. It was a great, stinking, throbbing, boneless thing that had wormed its flesh into receiver nodes and horns, the static grills and electro sockets. It was amorphous, possessing no definable vital parts. The whole grotesque, pulsating creation fractionally shifted its grip on the Vox Bank as it felt Red Blade's attention. Nor was it alone. Another figure stood amidst the slaughtered weird flesh on the bottom floor. It was tall and gangly, a patchwork creature of sewn-together skin and scrawny, clawed limbs that bristled with blue feathers. Its eyes stared, a startling shade of pale purple. Its mouth was a yellow razor beak that clacked as Red Blade thrust through the last of its disintegrating spore. There was something else perching on its shoulder. An impish, blue-skinned creature with short, furled wings. Its little limbs were clamped onto the meat of the bird beast's neck. A silver rune glowed brightly upon its brow. As Red Blade stalked forwards, it shrank back against the feathers of its master's neck. Welcome, brother. Despite the beak, the larger demon somehow bore Obber's voice. Red Blade halted abruptly. What are you? I am Sergeant Gidriel of the Deathwing. The impish familiar took off, fluttering about its master's head and chittering madly. And I am Berkeley the Sferi. And I am you, Tren Red Blade, Long Fang, veteran of a hundred your lies end here, trickster! Red Blade fired. The air across the relay chamber flared. The avian demon went down with a shriek. Its back-jointed right leg atomized, even the demon's unnatural powers of protection not enough to fully shield it from the multi-melter's close-range, vaporizing wrath. The little imp familiar squawked in panic as its master dropped, writhing in the demonic viscera on the floor. Red Blade maglocked Fobane and unsheathed Fang. He took the corrupt stairs up to the higher tier of Voxbanks at a run, ignoring the skittering imp. He had to get to the monstrosity physically infesting the Vox systems. He had to purge it before it could conduct any more of the trickster's lies into the heads of his wolf brothers. He stabbed into the nearest growth of flesh, cutting a tentacle and ripping it from a socket in a spray of stinking black blood. The thing reacted. Its flesh stretched and flexed, lodging itself deeper into the systems. There was a squeal and grating of static in Red Blade's ears, and what sounded for all the world like screaming. Was he already too late? Was the second strike force already under attack? <laughs> Brethren, come in! This is Drenric! Ah! 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 Something struck him from behind. He stumbled, turned in time to take the second blow on his pauldron, body braced and servos clenched. The feathered creature had returned, its leg re-knitted by weird craft with pink new flesh and budding feathers. The blue imp was perched atop its shoulder once more, cackling. This time, it was the familiar that spoke. It dug its claws again onto its perch on the bigger demon's shoulder. The bird Weirdspawn spoke in Gidril's voice. You will greet them all in the eternal torment of the war, Dread Red Blade. The big demon wasn't the trickster. It was the imp driving its will and words into its pet's skull. The monster lunged at him with a shriek, stinking of blood and filth. The force of the blow slammed him back against the fleshy abomination of the box banks. He felt it squirm and slide behind him, wrapping around him, trying to pin him. The imp was cackling shrilly once more. Red Blade snarled and plowed Fang into the top of the big demon's feather-crested skull. It grappled against his breastplate with its avian talons. 
Red Blade stabbed again, a third time, and then a fourth, a howl building in his throat. Then Torburn's voice crackled over the Vox. Drain! Help us! Vox and I are buried! Please don't leave us here! The memory of his pack brothers, lying trapped and crushed beneath the ice, clawed at him. The blue imp giggled madly, pointing. No! You are not real! Red Blade ripped Fang down, through flesh and bone and cutting open the greater demon's beak. The voices on the other end of the Vox degenerated into wails and screams that rose to unnatural, inhuman pitches. Then something struck the monster and its little blue master. Energy flared and cracked. The imp wailed with sudden terror, a split second before their flesh disintegrated, blown in great, gory gobbets across the room. Red Blade stumbled, released from the sucking embrace of the thing infesting the Vox Banks. He knew there were few weapons in the galaxy that could have obliterated the hulking spawn and the blue weirdling with a single blow. And he knew the warrior wielding it. <clears throat> you took your time, lion son. Typically, Gidriel didn't reply. He plunged his power fist into the nearest fleshy growth, ripping clods of the shuddering meat and bursting black arteries from the choked machinery. Redblade pitched in with fangs, twisting and gouging, prizing the parasite away from its nest. He grunted as he stabbed at a tentacle lodged in a coolant valve. Why did you come back? Because you apologized. For Uglath. Red Blade stopped with Fang thrust deep and rounded on Gidriel. <laughs> I, I did no such thing. I know. Vox Tenebris. The technique we both learned from the Death Watch. Maintaining Vox transmissions at all times, but always testing who you speak with, probing their identity. You would never apologize. And it reminded me of Ogbath. The memories returned. In that moment, Red Blade felt fury kindle and flare inside him in a way he hadn't experienced for almost a century. Suddenly, he recalled what it had been like to be a young warrior, a feral killer, quick of limb and bright of eye. The faces of Clovis, Bray and Carrick were clear in his thoughts, bloody and still in death. Torben, Wolf, Svensson and Obba, and Yari and Sferi too. Gidriel was with him now, his face a familiar mask of grim, scarred determination, splattered and befouled by monstrous viscera. The screaming in Red Blade's ear, shrilling over the Voxnet, reached a painful pitch. Then, as the last squirming tentacle was hauled free, it cut off, like a channel that had been closed. The thing was scattered and smeared across the Vox relay, twitching and steaming as it faded from reality. The communication banks, dripping with slime, were free. Gidriel locked his storm bolter and hit the overlay spike. The machinery shuddered and grated, but the transmission lights on the rune banks winked green. The Dark Angel snatched a Vauxhall. This is Brother Sergeant Gidriel to all Imperial forces in the vicinity of Morkai's Keep. Halt immediately. You are advancing into a trap. Repeat, it's a trap. For a moment, there was only silence, not even the phantom haunting of static disrupting the awful stillness. Brother Sergeant Gidriel. Please confirm. The voice was that of Nazikiel. The demon spawn were in the Vox system, brother. The first strike force has been all but annihilated. It was an ambush. We must regroup. We are approaching the outer bastion now, Gidriel. There's no sign of any contact. If you proceed, you will all die. Halt while we attempt to break through to you. If you do not hear from us again, commend us to our Primarchs and the Emperor and consult with Master Belial. After a moment, Nazikiel's reply crackled back. Very well, honored sergeant. Standing by. Red Blade wiped the filth from his blade. You want to fight your way to the strike force from here? Through the layers of filth that infect this place? Isn't that what you'd do? 
You really have grown old, Wolf. And you were old when I met you, Lion Son. Given our state, how can we hope to see our brethren ever again? For once, Gidriel smiled. Redblade went on, his tone becoming grave. You didn't inform your brethren of the Wolfen. The Dark Angel hesitated, but only for a moment. They will discover them soon enough, I suspect. We will cleanse this place with fury and blood, and your stasis chamber will be unearthed. You will not tell them of it beforehand? I wear the honored plate of the Deathwing, Dren Redblade. I am adept at keeping secrets. Come, let us hunt together one more time. Back to the surface, the sons of the wolf and the lion side by side. Redblade nodded, unlocking Fobane and grinning. In the name of Russ, L. Johnson, and the Allfather. Just try to keep up, eh? <laughs> Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.